Tanto Audio, a division of recorded books, presents Marry in Haste by Anne Gracie. Narrated by Charlotte Anne Dorr. Prologue No, tis slander, whose edge is sharper than the sword. William Shakespeare, Cymbeline Berkshire, England, 1811 I'm sorry, my dear, but you really have no choice. Sir Humphrey Westwood's voice was quiet, sad. Somehow it made his words cut deeper, shaking her fragile composure more than if he'd shouted and threatened to beat her. She grasped his sleeve. Papa, who told you these things? These terrible lies, who? He shook off her hand, dismissing her with a flick of his arm. It's common knowledge. Irwin says everyone, the whole parish, even the vicar, the vicar, has known for weeks, but were too embarrassed to tell me. His face crumpled in weary anguish. They say the father is always the last to know. He picked up his hat. I'm going to church. No, my dear. You're not coming. You've made enough of a spectacle of yourself. I can barely hold up my head in public as it is. But, Papa, it isn't true, none of it. Shaking, sick with bewilderment and betrayal, she watched him shrug on his coat and wrap his scarf around his neck. She went to help him tuck it in, as she always did, but he shook her off as if he couldn't bear her to touch him. Don't try to cousin me, Emmeline. It won't work this time. Her hands dropped. She stepped back unbearably hurt. Despite everything, Irwin is willing to marry you. For my sake and yours, be grateful for that and do as you're told. The expression on his face near broke her heart. Her father was as hurt, as devastated by this thing as she was but she wouldn't, couldn't, would rather die than marry her father's friend, their neighbour, Mr. Irwin. Papa, I promise you I didn't do what they say I did. But her father's mind was blocked, blinded, shamed by the lies he had been told, and because of the mistake she had made once before. He shook his head in sorrow. To be so utterly without shame, I have failed you as a father. He opened the front door. I am going to church now, and will make arrangements with the vicar to have the bands called. Irwin has invited me to dinner afterward. When I return, you will agree to marry him, or I will wash my hands of you forever. The cold, implacability of his words scalded her to the bone. She said in a low voice, I won't agree, Papa. I wish to marry for love, like you and Mama. Don't speak to me of your mother. His voice shook. For the first time in my life, I'm glad, yes, glad she's not alive to hear what has become of her daughter. I'm sorry, Papa, she half whispered, her eyes filling with tears. But I have done nothing wrong, not this time, and I won't be forced to marry a man I don't care for. Her father said bleakly, Then you are no daughter of mine. And he closed the door. Chapter One We know what we are, but know not what we may be. William Shakespeare, Hamlet London, 1818 What did you call me? Major Calborn Rutherford stopped dead two steps into the Honourable Gil Radcliffe's discreet government office in the heart of Whitehall. Radcliffe's brows rose. You didn't know? Cal shook his head. Are you telling me something's happened to my brother Henry, and that I'm now Lord Ashenden? Cal's father had died a year ago, and his older brother Henry had inherited the title and estates. I assume that's why you'd return to London after what is it, 
Ten years? Radcliffe waved Cal to a seat and ordered his clerk to bring tea and biscuits. Damn. Cal sat down heavily. It wasn't grief he felt. He and Henry had never been close. Henry wasn't even forty. What happened? How did he die? Tried to ride his horse full pelt across a fast-running, rocky stream. The horse stumbled. Your brother fell and broke his neck. He was drunk at the time, of course. There was a short silence, then he added. The horse had to be put down. Damned shame. It was a fine beast. Cal snorted. What an irony. Henry had lived almost the whole of his life, leading a sybaritic life in the fleshpots of London, while Cal had been sent off to fight for his country at the tender age of seventeen. If anyone had been expected to die young... Radcliffe leaned back in his chair, his expression thoughtful. So, if you're not here to resign your commission, why did you come? Just then, the clerk came in with the tea and ginger biscuits. Cal waited until the man had left. Well, Radcliffe prompted. Cal sipped his tea, hot, strong, and sweet, just as he liked it. He took a biscuit and crunched through it, enjoying Radcliffe's tension. I'm pretty sure El Escorpion is English. The scorpion is English? Radcliffe stiffened. No, he can't be. Are you certain? Cal grimaced. Not certain, just a feeling I have. A feeling? Radcliffe snorted and sat back. Really? Cal wasn't annoyed by Radcliffe's skepticism. He'd be impatient, too, if one of his officers, after hunting a notorious assassin for two years without success, came to him with nothing more than a feeling in his bones. But vague and unsubstantial as it was, Cal felt that he was finally onto something. This last killing, as he raised his rifle to shoot, I saw him silhouetted against the night sky and... Ratcliffe leaned forward. You recognized him? No, he was too far away. But later when I was mulling it over, I realized that there was something familiar about his action. His action? Cal nodded. I fought alongside men of the Rifle Brigade a number of times during the war, and something about his stance and the way he brought his rifle up to shoot reminded me of one of those fellows. I know I've seen him before. I can't tell you his name, I probably wouldn't recognize his face, but I'm as sure as I can be that he's English and was a sharpshooter during the war. I think he's using a Baker rifle too. If he can shoot a man in the head from more than 200 yards away, well, not many weapons have that capability. Radcliffe nodded thoughtfully. It's possible, I suppose. And you think he's returned to England? Cal shook his head. I don't know. He's gone to ground as usual. Could be in any one of a dozen countries. But I thought I'd go to Rifle Brigade headquarters, get a list of sharpshooters who've left the regiment and see what they're up to now. It's not much to go on, but it's... More than we've had so far, Radcliffe said with satisfaction. He drew a pen and paper toward him. I'll draw up your leave papers. Cal blinked. Leave papers? But I'll be working. You have personal matters to sort out, a title and inheritance to deal with, papers to sign, matters to arrange, personal matters. There was no point pushing him. Radcliffe enjoyed being enigmatic. At school, it had been brilliant but devious, and even then he had a reputation for collecting information, all kinds of information, political and personal. It made him perfectly suited for his current position, sitting at the centre of a web of intrigue that stretched from London halfway around the world, directing things from behind a desk. Radcliffe completed the document with a flamboyant signature and dusted it with sand. He reached for his official seal, without which the papers would be invalid, 
pressed it into a blob of hot scarlet wax, then handed it to Cal. Cal glanced at it. Four weeks leave? I hope it won't take that long. Radcliffe gave a faint smile. I recommend you call on your lawyer first. Cal headed straight for the office of Phipps, Phipps and Yarwood, his late father's lawyers. The news that he was now Lord Ashenden had rocked him, but he was determined it would not make any significant difference to his life. Grand estates and great wealth brought responsibilities with them, and with the title came other duties of the kind Cal, as younger son, had never been prepared for, and absolutely didn't want. He'd always done his duty, been a good soldier, even though he'd hated the waste and destruction of war. Now, in peacetime, he had discovered that working through tangled European affairs on behalf of his country suited him. Napoleon's activities had erased borders and smashed alliances. A new Europe was forming and the intrigue was endless and fascinating. Cal went where he was ordered and did the jobs that Whitehall, in the guise of Gil Radcliffe, sent him to do. His current task was to track down and capture or kill the assassin known as the Scorpion. And after the Scorpion had killed Cal's friend Bentley, the hunt had become personal. He didn't need or want any distraction from that. What do you mean you don't have a copy of Henry's will? You're the family lawyer. You should have it on file. The lawyer, Phipps, shifted uncomfortably in his seat. Your brother parted company with this firm more than eight years ago, after a, a difference of opinion with your father. I see. Cal was well able to read between the lines. Henry had ever been the quarrelsome sort, and his father had had the same hasty, choleric temper. And both of them had a tendency to nurse a grudge. I suppose they never made it up. The lawyer inclined his head. That is my understanding, my lord, and from what little I can gather, your brother was not a worthy successor of your late father's position. The family affairs are in somewhat of a tangle. Until we find his will and apply for probate, nothing else can proceed. Cal swore under his breath. Trust Henry to leave things in a blasted mess. Of course you'll resign your commission, my lord. Cal shook his head. The whole thing was a wretched nuisance, but he was damned if he'd resign. I'll extend my leave if necessary, but once the business is done, I intend to return to Europe. I have responsibilities abroad. Phipps gave him a shocked look. But now you have responsibilities in England, my lord. His tone implied that no foreign responsibilities could compare with English ones. Cal shrugged. Agents can be appointed to see to the day-to-day -day running of the estate. Phipps pursed his lips. At the very least, my lord, you must make immediate arrangements for your dependents. Dependents? Cal frowned. I have no... Oh, you mean my half-sisters. Of course, he hadn't seen the girls for years, but he remembered them as sweet little things who used to follow him around like puppies. Where are they at the moment? Bath, my lord. Still in school, then. Some exclusive seminary for girls, as he recalled. No, my lord, they are currently in the care of Lady Dorothea Rutherford. They're in good hands, then, he said indifferently. Aunt Dotty would have taken the bereaved little girls under her wing, and after a suitable period of mourning, they could return to their school. Now, is there anything I need to sign? The lawyer's lips thinned. I feel obliged to remind you, my lord, that under your father's will, your half-sisters were left a substantial sum in trust for when they marry or turn five-and-twenty. 
They are considerable heiresses, in fact, and as such need to be protected from fortune hunters. He paused. Whether your aunt is up to that task, I could not say. His tone made it clear he had grave doubts, but discretion held him back. Cal said nothing. Phipps was clearly something of a fusspot. Your aunt is also your dependent. Unlike your sisters, your father made her no allowance. Yes, my lord, I also thought it quite irregular. His only unmarried sister, and with no fortune of her own. But against all my advice, he left her welfare to your brother's care. Good God, left to Henry's tender care. It's a wonder Aunt Dotty isn't starving in the streets. What possessed the old man? My sentiments exactly, my lord. Make her an immediate allowance out of my personal income, then, Cal said, a generous one. When probate comes through, we can make a more permanent arrangement through the estate. He had a soft spot for Aunt Dotty. She had knitted him endless pairs of warm red woolen socks ever since he'd gone off to war. Red because she thought they ought to match his scarlet regimentals. She'd kept sending them as fast as she could knit them, enough to supply Cal and half his friends. His friends, at first inclined to laugh at the colour, had accepted them gratefully during hard winters in the mountains. Aunt Dotty's scarlet socks had saved many a toe from frostbite. They'd also turned many a wash tub of white underclothes pink, but as neither the socks nor the underclothes were visible, nobody much minded. He didn't need them now, working in more civilised conditions and no longer wearing a uniform, but parcels of thick scarlet socks still followed him through Europe, even though he had told her several times he had no more need of them. Of course, my lord, Phipps made a note. And what of the girls? They should be safe enough in Bath with Aunt Dotty for the moment. I strongly advise you to visit them, my lord. Cal stood up. Is that all? Phipps's mouth tightened. Where will you be residing, my lord, should I need to contact you? I take it Ashenden House is closed. Indeed it is, and has been since your father died. Your brother preferred his own house. He paused diffidently, then added, He dismissed all your father's servants. Cal's brows drew together. Some of those servants had served his father for decades. I assume he pensioned the older ones off and gave the others character references. He read the answer on Phipps's face. Damn Henry for a selfish louse. To dismiss a servant without a character was to condemn them to future unemployment, a poor return for years of loyal service. Phipps cleared his throat diffidently. I, uh, took the liberty of penning character references for those few who came to see me. As for the others, I gather most of the upper servants found suitable positions quite quickly. Your late father was known among the ton to be an exacting employer, so people assumed quite rightly that any servant who'd worked for him and kept a position with him longer than six months would be well-trained and reliable. Cal nodded. Make inquiries of the remainder. Any of an age to retire arrange a suitable pension, depending on their length of service. The others discover their situation and let me know. I would not have my brother sully my father's reputation for fair dealing. Smiling, Phipps made a note. Do you intend to reopen Ashenden House, my lord? If you wish, I could make arrangements. No, leave it as it is. I'll stay at my club, the Apocalypse. Ashenden House was his father's London home, and too big and formal for Cal's taste. A waste to open it and employ a dozen or more servants for the handful of nights Cal intended to stay in London. And he didn't want to raise expectations. Your father was a member of White's. A hint, if ever Cal had heard one. 
The apocalypse suits me well enough. The Apocalypse Club had been started some years before for officers and former officers who'd been to war. It had a relaxed, slightly raffish ambience that perfectly suited Cal's mood. Besides, there might be men who'd served with the rifle brigade there who could help him in his quest for information. The Apocalypse Club provided just the haven Cal had hoped for. He'd run into a few old acquaintances on the first night and spent a convivial evening catching up on news and gossip before making an early night of it. The next morning, he'd made a hearty English breakfast, a nostalgic pleasure after the continental breakfasts he'd become used to, then set off to Rifle Brigade headquarters to inquire about men who'd been dismissed after the war. Rifle Brigade sharpshooters had proved so useful in the late war that the rifles hadn't been as drastically reduced in size as most of other regiments. Most of them were still in the army, which meant their every move was easily accounted for. It made the list of men he planned to investigate that much shorter. By the end of the day, Cal had compiled a very useful list of names, men who were reputed to be able to take out a man's eye from more than 200 yards away, but who were no longer in the army. It was too long a list, however, for one man to investigate. The men were scattered across southern England. Reluctantly, because he wanted to catch this bastard himself, he took the problem back to Gil Radcliffe. They divided the list into five geographical regions. Cal took southwestern England, which took in Bath, as well as Cal's family seat, Ashenden Court in Oxfordshire. He ought to at least check on the place, now that he was responsible for it. And while he was at it, he could call in on Aunt Dottie and the girls. Radcliffe assigned some of his best men to the other four regions. With Radcliffe's facilities at his disposal, Cal was quickly able to cross a number of names off the list. Four men had died by accident or disease. Another two had been killed in drunken brawls. Three of the men on the list had been transported for poaching. Cal shook his head at that. Teach a man to shoot straight, then punish him for hunting to feed his family. The world didn't make sense. That night, Radcliffe took him for a meal at his own club, White's, and Cal ran into more old acquaintances there, a few fellows he knew from the army and some from his long-distant school days. The first of the school fellows seemed remarkably pleased to see him and insisted Cal dine with him the following night. No need for formal dress, old fellow, just a casual affair en famille. Cal was a little taken aback at the man's delight in seeing him. It had very little to do with Frampton at school. Still, it wasn't as if he had any other engagement, so he accepted. To his surprise, within the next hour or two, he was invited to several more casual, intimate family dinners from men he barely remembered. Bemused, but seeing no reason why he should refuse, he accepted them all. He supposed it was their way of welcoming a returning soldier, even if the war was well in the past. They had no idea he was still on active service, and he had no intention of telling them. The next day he continued working through the list of names, starting with the ones in London. He found two more former sharpshooters, one of whom had been a hero of Badejos, but was now a drunk a skeletal wreck of a man whose hand shook so much he could barely hold the murky bottle he clutched to his chest like a baby. The other he found, after some trouble, begging in the street. He'd lost three fingers of his right hand and couldn't get a job. Former soldiers were everywhere, surplus to requirements. His wife and children had left him. They wouldn't stay with a man who couldn't feed them. Cal gave the man a guinea and walked away disturbed by what he'd found. England had not done well by her brave soldiers. That evening, Cal found himself seated closely between Frampton's two very friendly sisters. 
they gave him their undivided, enthusiastic, slightly competitive, and slightly unnerving attention. Frampton and his mother smiled benevolently. It had been years since Cal had sat down to a simple family meal, though there was nothing simple about this one. The table groaned with extravagant dishes. The sisters Frampton paid the food little attention. They lavished Cal with questions and compliments endlessly. His every utterance was treated as a gem of infinite wisdom or an example of exquisite wit, provoking gales of feminine laughter. It was very odd. Did all returned officers get this kind of welcome, while the common soldiers starved in the streets? It was only when the servants placed a veritable feast of mouth-watering cream-filled puddings and jellies on the table, and the young Mrs. Frampton didn't do much as lift at their avid gazes from Cal that he finally twigged. He thought about the other invitations he had received, each one of the exceptionally friendly and hospitable fellows he had met just happened to have unmarried sisters. The hair on his scalp lifted softly. It wasn't Major Cal Rutherford they'd invited to dine. It was the new Lord Ashenden, the rich, unmarried, damnably eligible Lord Ashenden. Cal was well used to the attentions of women, but every one of his Flirts and lovers had been women of the world, sophisticated and experienced, and uninterested in anything permanent. They wanted his body, not his name and fortune, and that suited him well. Innocent but eager young ladies on the hunt for a rich and titled husband were a totally new experience. He didn't have time for this sort of nonsense. He was here to do a job. The elder Miss Frampton ran her hand along his thigh. Cal jumped and almost spilled his claret. The younger Miss Frampton snuggled closer and stroked his arm. At the end of the dinner when the ladies retired, leaving the gentlemen to their port, Frampton said, Lovely girls, my sisters. Best sisters in the world. Wouldn't want them to marry just anyone, you know. Cal nodded and gulped his port. As Frampton continued to wax lyrical about his sisters and their many virtues and fine qualities, Cal made a decision. It was time to investigate the men on the rural part of his list. The minute the dinner was over, he returned to his club, called for a stiff brandy and penned a series of apologetic notes, cancelling all future engagements, claiming he had been called away on urgent family business. He sent a note to Radcliffe and also to Phipps, the lawyer, informing them of his intention to leave for Bath first thing in the morning. One of the men on his list lived near the village of Three Mile Cross, which was on the way, more or less. The lawyer was efficient. Cal had to give him that for as he was finishing his breakfast the next morning, a servant arrived to inform him his carriage awaited him. It was a travelling chaise, very smart, with the wheels picked out in yellow and the Ashenden coat of arms emblazoned on the gleaming black side panels. A team of four matched bays fretted and fidgeted impatiently. The driver grinned down at Cal and gave him a sketchy salute. Morning, Master Cal. My lord, I should say. Delighted to see you back in England, safe and sound. It was his father's old coachman. Cal nodded, trying desperately to recall the man's name. Hawkins, that was it. Hawkins' grin widened as Cal greeted him by name. Grand day for a run to Bath, my lord. Horses are mighty fresh. Needin' a good run, they are. Cal glanced at the horses. A fine-looking team. Hawkins nodded. Your brother's horses kept an eye on em, and when I got the message from your pa's lawyer, well, I knew where to get em. Cal frowned. 
Had Hawkins been kicking his heels all these months since his father's death? Hawkins laughed at Cal's question. Oh, bless you, no, my lord. I've been driving them London hackney carriages. He paused and spat. Rubbish they are. Very happy I was to hear you were home and needing a coachman again. You mean you quit your job to take me to Bath? Of course, Hawkins said indignantly, as if no other choice were possible. Served the Rutherford family all me life, I have. Cal climbed into the carriage. Hawkins's rash decision disturbed him. From the little he'd seen so far, jobs in London were in short supply. The forces of family and societal expectation were closing in around him. But Cal was determined to fight free of them. He wasn't one to shirk his duty, but he was determined, nevertheless, to live his life the way he chose to. He liked the adventure and uncertainty, even the danger of his current life. Elevation to the peerage was the last thing he wanted. But he'd do what he had to, once he'd caught the scorpion. He would get that bastard or die trying. He owed it to Bentley. Cal had met Bentley at school, Several years older than Bentley, Cal hadn't come across him until he'd turned a corner one day and found a scrawny young boy doing his best to fight off three larger boys. He obviously had no idea how to fight, but that didn't stop him from trying. His fists were flying but not connecting, and though he was being thrashed, he wouldn't give up. Admiring the lad's courage, if not his skills, Cal had waded in, sent the bullies packing, then turned to inspect the damage. Bentley was a sight, probably the most unprepossessing youngster Cal had ever seen, with a too big head balanced on a long skinny neck and ears that stuck out like bat's wings. Dripping blood, he had a black eye and a swollen nose and was covered in scrapes and bruises but he was grinning from ear to ear as he thanked Cal profusely for his help and asked would Cal give him boxing lessons. That kind of courage had to be rewarded. Cal and his friends had befriended and protected the boy, and there'd remained in sporadic contact ever since. Beneath the unpromising looks, Bentley turned out to have a brilliant mind. He'd taken a first at Oxford and joined the diplomatic corps. He had made his mark in the negotiations at the Congress of Vienna, and the last time Cal had seen him, he had just been given a responsible diplomatic position in Portugal. Bentley's widowed mother had also kept in touch. She had written to Cal when Bentley was first posted abroad and asked Cal to look out for her son. He had promised he would, and then the scorpion had shot Bentley down, right in front of Cal. Cal still had nightmares sometimes, seeing Bentley's head explode, seeing the lanky young body crumple like an old rag, his blood spilling out on the pale Portuguese tiles. That fine brain, the dauntless spirit snuffed out like a candle, all the lad's hopes and dreams and plans for the future shattered by a bullet. And Cal's promise to Mrs. Bentley broken. Bentley's death haunted him. Catching the murdering bastard was Cal's first priority. After that, who knew? He couldn't imagine living a settled domestic life in a quiet corner of England, having dull meetings with estate managers, going over account books, talking to tenants about repairs and leaking roofs and drainage and sheep, or the even duller duty of sitting in Parliament, listening to long and dreary speeches, and worse, having to make them. Cal shuddered. And then, because he owed it to the title to beget an heir, and the whole blasted world knew it, he would be hunted endlessly by the likes of the Misses Frampton and their mothers 
and brothers. And finally he would give in and make a dutiful marriage to some high-born lady. Even then it wouldn't stop. There would be the obligatory social rounds, the meaningless, endless politenesses, morning calls, balls, soirees, all max, ratafia. Conversation over breakfast. He shuddered again. He was only twenty-eight, damn it. He had years before he needed to provide the estate with an heir. He had neither the time nor the inclination for petty family matters. The carriage swept smoothly along, the hooves of the horses beating a rhythmic tattoo on the hard, even surface of the toll road. English roads were better than those on the continent. Cal watched the scenery slip by. England was so green, he had forgotten that. Green and peaceful and dull. He stretched out his legs, leaned back against the padded leather squabs and dozed. It was dark as they drove into Bath, the moon hidden behind a thick blanket of cloud. Three Mile Cross had proved to be a wild goose chase. Cal had found a former sharpshooter, but he wasn't the scorpion. This man was employed as gamekeeper on a local estate, and his movements over the last few years were fully accounted for. He hadn't left the village, let alone the country. Still, he shared some suggestions with Cal and brought him up to date on the whereabouts of some of the men on Cal's list. So the visit hadn't been a waste of time. And, at just after seven o'clock, Cal was knocking on his aunt's door. It was opened by an elderly, white-haired man with a familiar-looking face that Cal couldn't for a moment place. Then it struck him. Logan, isn't it? I didn't expect to find you here. How are you? Logan had been a groom at his father's estate when Cal was a boy. Unusual to find a groom acting as a butler, but hard physical work would be beyond the man now. He must be sixty-five or more. Aunt Dottie always did have a soft heart. Logan grinned. I'm very well, thank you, sir. My condolences on your loss. Losses. He took Cal's coat and hat. We were expecting you, of course. Only not quite so soon. He must have seen the surprise on Cal's face, for he added... Mr. Phipps and word you'd be coming, though he didn't say when. Miss Dotty was that thrilled when she got his letter this evening. You always were her favorite. It wasn't quite the thing for a butler to be so confiding, especially of his employer's feelings. Nor yet to refer to her familiarly as Miss Dotty. But Cal supposed an ancient retainer groom-turned-butler couldn't be expected to know the finer points of servant-mistress etiquette. You'll find her in the back parlor. That being the warmest room in the house, she does feel the cold these days. It's second on your right, down the hall, sir. My lord, I should say. He gave Cal a rueful grin. Hard to get used to it. Cal couldn't agree with him more. Lord Ashenden still sounded to his ears like his father. When Cal opened the parlor door, he felt a sudden pang. Aunt Dotty was as small and plump as ever, but her famed peaches and cream complexion was now like soft, crumpled silk and her hair, once a charming, unruly froth of amber curls, was now the purest silvery white. Aunt Dotty? She jumped up with a small squeak of excitement, sending balls of scarlet wool and knitting flying, and embraced him fervently. Dearest boy, let me look at you. So tall you've grown and so handsome. And will you look at those shoulders? 
She tilted her head critically, scanning him from head to foot, then gave a small decisive nod. By far the best looking of all the Rutherford men. I shall be the envy of every lady between the ages of fifteen and a hundred when you escort me to the pump room in the morning. Cal laughed and bent to collect her scattered needles and wool. A hundred, Aunt Dotty? She settled herself back in the armchair and said earnestly, Dear boy, some of them are even older than that. You have no idea. I feel like a spring chicken when I go there, such a delightful feeling. But even though some of them are ancient, positively antediluvian, I do assure you, they still ogle any possibly good-looking man without the least shred of shame. She gave him a mischievous smile. Quite heartening, really. Heartening? He finished winding up a stray ball of wool that had rolled under the settee and handed it to her. She nodded. To think that sort of thing lasts? Aging is so much less to be dreaded when you see that even ancient crones can still flirt and think about, you know, and possibly even do it as well. Cal blinked. You know, do it? No, he wouldn't ask. It wasn't the sort of conversation he expected or wanted from his elderly spinster aunt. In a blatant bid to change the subject, he asked, Where are the girls? There was a short silence. Seeming not to have heard his question, Aunt Dotty frowned over her knitting. The door opened and he looked up, half expecting his sisters, but it was only Logan carrying a tray. Ah, there you are, Logan, Aunt Dotty exclaimed in what almost sounded like relief. Food for my nephew, is it? Excellent. You must be famished, Cal, dear. Logan set the tray down on a small table close to Cal. The tray contained a plate of hearty-looking sandwiches, a wedge of pie and a tankard of ale. Eat up, eat up, dear boy, Aunt Dotty urged. Cal took a mouthful of ale and picked up a sandwich. Where are Rose and Lily, Aunt Dotty? Again there was a short silence. He took a bite from his sandwich, glanced up, and caught his aunt exchanging a silent, panicked glance with Logan. Something was up. Cal finished the sandwich and waited. They're asleep, Logan said after a moment. Yes, that's it, asleep, Aunt Dotty agreed, adding quickly. Upstairs in their bedchambers, fast asleep. We won't disturb them. You'll see them at breakfast in the morning. Thank you, Logan, dear. That will be all. Logan left. Cal looked at his aunt. Logan, dear, he queried. Aunt Dotty, you really shouldn't call your butler dear. Oh, Pooh, why not? Because he's your butler. Nonsense. Logan has been my friend since I was fifteen years old. My father is dead, and now your father is dead as well, so there is nobody left to make a fuss. You won't be stuffy about it, will you, Cal? Because if I want to call him dear, I will. Cal blinked. Aunt Dotty had always been an original. Now it seemed she was becoming a little eccentric. She sat there placidly knitting, a little smile on her face. Was his supposedly guileless little aunt trying to distract him from the issue at hand? So, he said, my sisters are fast asleep at, he glanced pointedly at the clock on the overmantel. Half past seven. Oh, bother, I've dropped a stitch. He waited while she fiddled with her knitting, her cheeks suddenly rosy. Well, he prompted after a minute. If we'd known you were going to arrive tonight, of course they would have waited up, Aunt Dotty said, avoiding his gaze. 
but the poor dears were yawning and barely able to stay awake, so of course I sent them off to bed immediately after we'd finished eating. They were so very tired. Poor Lily almost fell asleep in her soup. And yawning, oh my goodness, such yawning. She set aside her knitting. In fact, I'm feeling rather tired myself. She stretched artistically and gave an unconvincing yawn. Oh dear me, yes, I'm afraid I'm quite ready for my bed. In fact, I think if you don't mind, Cal dearest, I'll go up to bed myself because... She essayed another fake yawn. I'm suddenly very, very tired. Old age, you know. She had to be the worst liar he'd ever met. Cal set down his tankard of ale. Now, Aunt Dotty, why don't you tell me what's really going on? Where are my sisters? Chapter Two What Hath Night to Do with Sleep? John Milton, Comus With a guilty look, Aunt Dotty sat back in her chair and waited, her hands folded in her lap like a child expecting a scolding. I'm not precisely sure, she admitted. Any amusement he had felt at his aunt's antics drained away. What do you mean you're not sure? Are you telling me they've run away, or worse? His sisters were heiresses after all, minors. Swift thoughts of ransom, kidnapping, or worse ran through his mind. Oh, no, 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 his aunt said quickly. Nothing like that. As I said, they'll be down for breakfast in the morning. She gave him a reassuring smile. They always are. They always are? Cal's eyes narrowed. Are you telling me they often go missing? Aunt Dotty wrinkled her nose thoughtfully. I wouldn't say often. Good God, he stared down at his aunt. So they're out there somewhere alone and unchaperoned? Unprotected? Good God, they're only... He did a quick calculation and came up with a figure that surprised him. Eighteen and nineteen? Yes, dear, I know. How the hell could you let them go outside like that? Well, of course I don't let them, she said indignantly. How could you think such a thing? What? But... No, they do it all on their own. I have tried remonstrating with them, but... She gave a helpless shrug. They go anyway. Well, it is hard on them, you must admit, being so young and pretty and full of life and not being able to attend parties or balls. If we'd known you were coming, I'm sure they would have stayed in, but the letter arrived after they went to bed. Cal focused on the most relevant point. Why can't they go to parties and balls? She gave him a shocked look. Because they're in mourning, of course. She gestured to her own outfit of unrelieved black. Which is why they've taken it so hard, your brother dying just eleven months after your poor papa's sad passing. Cal frowned. I didn't know Henry and the girls were close. Oh, they weren't. Henry never came near them. I doubt he would even have recognized them if he bumped into them in the street, which is why the girls were so upset at his passing. Cal thought about it, then shook his head. I don't follow you. Aunt Dotty gave him the kind of look one might give to a simpleton. Another year of mourning, you see, and this time for someone they only cared for in a dutiful way, or not at all, if we are to be honest, she added meditatively. It wouldn't have been so bad if Henry had died soon after your papa, instead of just before their mourning period was up. She shook her head. But then 
He always was an inconsiderate boy. Cal ignored that little leap of logic. And another year of mourning means another year of no parties or balls for you and the girls. Aunt Dottie nodded. Henry was their half-brother and my nephew, and the head of our family after all. Not to honour him with full mourning would be scandalous. His brows rose. And letting two young girls roam the streets at night is not? She made a cross little sound. I keep telling you, Cal, I don't let them do anything. I have pointed out the error of their ways. I have remonstrated with them and explained possible consequences, all to no avail. You could lock them in at night, send them to bed with no supper, any one of a dozen things that would teach them to mind you. I will not act the jailer toward my beloved nieces, she exclaimed outraged, and then added, Besides, it doesn't work. I had Logan lock them in their bedchamber once, and they climbed out the window instead, which you must admit is far more dangerous than whatever it is they do when they're out. I still shudder to think of them lying smashed on the cobbles outside. She produced a lace handkerchief, which he took as an ominous warning of waterworks to come. And what if there was a fire? She finished distressfully. Would you have them burned in their beds? Aunt Dottie. Don't look at me like that. I don't know how they get out. Logan says by the kitchen door, so he leaves it unlocked for them to return. Well, we can hardly lock them out at night, can we? Anything could happen to them then. Besides, they always come down for breakfast perfectly well and happy. I just bet they do, Cal muttered. Good God, no wonder Phipps had urged him to come to Bath. His aunt obviously had no control over the girls whatsoever. There's no harm in them, she insisted. They're just young and lively and a little impatient. Cal disagreed. Lack of discipline was clearly the problem, but there was no point in arguing. It was obviously pointless to expect his soft-hearted little aunt to administer any kind of control over his sisters. As for enlightening an innocent maiden aunt of the kind of thing that could befall unprotected young girls, if she didn't realize it by now, Cal wasn't going to try. It would only distress her further, and to no purpose. Besides, after tonight the girl's misbehavior would come to an end. Cal would see to that, assuming they returned home unharmed. After his aunt had gone to bed, genuinely tired this time, Cal stationed himself at the kitchen table with a recent newspaper and a glass of cognac and settled down to await the return of his recalcitrant sisters. He tried to read but found that the news of England was distracting in the wrong sort of way. The country was in a mess with riots, poverty and crime. He didn't understand. The war hadn't reached England at all. How could everything have changed so much? He tossed the newspaper aside, got up and paced around the stone-flagged floor. Inaction didn't suit his mood at all, which was ridiculous. In his work abroad, he'd often had to wait patiently and quietly, for days, sometimes weeks at a time. But it was a different matter when he was waiting for his young half-sisters. Where were the little minxes, and what the devil were they up to? It didn't matter. Once they returned home, he wasn't even going to consider if. He damned well ensure they wouldn't go a-wandering again. Henry should never have left them in the hands of Aunt Dottie. It was clear she couldn't control a fly. The clock over the fireplace chimed midnight. Damn it, he was going to wring their necks. Forty minutes later, he heard a sound outside. 
He rose to his feet, folded his arms grimly, and waited. The kitchen door opened, framing two young women wearing hooded cloaks and black velvet masks. They entered, talking and giggling in low voices. Where the devil have you been? Cal snapped. They jumped and turned shocked faces toward him. The taller one recovered first and retorted, mimicking Cal's tone exactly. Who the devil are you, and what are you doing in my aunt's house? Not one of the men under Cal's command had ever had the temerity to answer him back in such a way. He narrowed his eyes. I asked you a question, young lady. She put up her chin. None of your business. In a cold voice that would have sent shivers down the spines of his soldiers, Cal said, it is very much my business, so out with it now, and take off those ridiculous masks. The smaller one glanced at her sister, then pushed back her hood and untied her mask. She hugged her cloak around her. Watching him with, Cal was glad to see, wide-eyed trepidation. She was a sweet-faced girl with a dimpled chin, wavy light brown hair, and big gray eyes his father's grey eyes. Cal's, too. The taller girl threw back the hood of her cloak, pulled off her mask and tossed it carelessly on the kitchen table. Obviously the ringleader of the pair. She was the image of his late stepmother, a beauty with perfect features, blue eyes framed with long dark lashes and rippling golden hair pulled up in a fashionable knot. She stood regarding him defiantly. I have no idea who you are, so why the devil should I explain anything to you? We answer to our aunt, not you. A small part of him, a very small part, registered disappointment that his sisters didn't immediately recognize him. On the other hand, would he have recognized them? He doubted it. It was ten years since they'd seen each other. Still, the fact that he was in their aunt's house should have been a clue. Even if they hadn't known he was back in England. Her attitude annoyed him, and instead of explaining who he was, Cal found himself echoing his old nurse. Young ladies who use that kind of language are asking to have their mouths washed out with soap and water. Only in his case it had been young gentlemen. She folded her arms and arched a mocking eyebrow. Who swore first? You placed the conversation in the gutter from your opening utterance. I merely followed you there. Cal opened his mouth to deliver a blistering reprimand when the shorter girl, Lily, said, Nurse used to say that all the time, and in just that tone. She placed a tentative hand on his sleeve. You're Cal, aren't you? Our big brother Cal, who went away to war and never came home again. Yes, I. Oof. He broke off as she hurled herself at him in an enthusiastic embrace that nearly knocked him off his feet. She hugged and kissed him excitedly, pelting him with questions he had no time to answer. When did you get here? Are you back for good? Which one am I? Lily, of course, don't you remember? You used to carry me around on your shoulders. I remember you being so tall. I should have recognized you sooner. You look a lot like Papa, doesn't he, Rose? But more like that portrait of Grandpapa Rutherford. Why didn't you tell us you were coming, Cal? Does Aunt Dotty know? Oh, but what a lovely surprise. Have you eaten? Cal was taken aback by the exuberant torrent of affection. Laughing, he did his best to answer her questions, but there was only one she seemed really to care about. No, I won't be staying. I'm only here to... to settle my affairs. Henry's death has complicated matters, but as soon as I've sorted things out, I'll be returning to Europe. Young girls didn't need to hear about assassins and murder. Oh, 
her excitement faded. Oh, well, it's still lovely to see you, even for just a short while, isn't it, Rose? Rose looked rather less thrilled to see him. She stepped forward, gave him a polite hug, and kissed his cheek lightly. Welcome home, brother. Lily slipped out of her cloak and slung it over a chair. Are you hungry? She glanced at his empty glass. Would you like me to get you another drink? Why are you sitting in the kitchen so late anyway? It's warmer here, Rose said quickly with a warning look at her sister. Lily missed it. Yes, but it's much more comfortable in the parlour. Why don't we take Cal in there and... I'm sitting in the kitchen after midnight, Cal said in a stern voice. Because my hoydenish little sisters sneaked out on their own at night, endangering their lives and their reputations and worrying their aunt sick. Rubbish, Rose interrupted. Aunt Dottie knows perfectly well, she broke off. Where you were? Cal finished. No, she flushed slightly, but continued with that air of cool defiance he was coming to know but she knows that we always come home safe and sound. She knows nothing of the sort. Cal slammed his fist on the table, making both girls and his glass jump. For all she knew, anything could have happened to you. You could have been robbed. People in London and other cities and don't think Bath is exempt from crime have been knocked unconscious, stripped of their clothing, fine clothing like you are wearing under your very fine cloaks, right down to your lace-trimmed fine lawn underwear. It would all fetch a pretty penny in the underworld, and like those other victims, you'd be left naked in the gutter. He paused to let his message sink in. You can imagine what might happen to a naked girl left unconscious in the gutter, can't you? Rose gave a little shrug. Nothing happened to us. Because you were lucky. Cal decided to be brutal. You might have been raped, yes, raped, or beaten, or kidnapped, and sold into slavery. White slavery. Do you know what that means? Sold into a Turkish harem or a brothel in the seamiest foreign cities and never seen again? Lily stared at him with wide, horrified eyes, Rose with flat, disbelieving insolence. Or you could have been murdered, but as far as I'm concerned, your worst sin is upsetting your aunt. She was in tears this evening. He lied telling me she had no idea where you were. Yes, your gentle, sweet, elderly aunt was in tears because she's been made responsible for the care and welfare of two inconsiderate, disobedient, headstrong, insubordinate, uncaring hoydens. If Aunt Dottie was in tears, it was because you were nasty and bossy and yelled at her, you upset her just like you're upsetting Lily, Rose said. She put her arm around her sister's shoulders and squeezed. See, you've made Lily cry. Under Cal's horrified gaze, Lily's wide grey eyes filled and fat tears slid slowly down her cheeks. She wept silently, making no sound, no sobs or wails or sniffles, just standing there, gazing at him through misery-drenched eyes. Cal hated to see women weep at any time, but this, somehow the very silence of it was more unnerving than ever. Lily, stop, I didn't mean... Cal put out a helpless hand. Both girls shrank away from him. Damn it. He'd meant to frighten them into obedience, not make them frightened of him. Now, now, no need to cry. I'm sure you're sorry. The main thing is, you're all right now. And tomorrow we'll sort out what to do. With a protective arm around Lily's woebegone figure, Rose gave him a look of deep reproach. I think you've done enough. I'm going to take Lily upstairs now. 
she turned her sister toward the door. She probably won't get any sleep tonight. Your threats and horrid stories will probably give her nightmares. She's very prone to nightmares. At the door, Rose added, You certainly know how to make a homecoming memorable, brother dear. Lily was so happy to see you, and now look at her. I hope you're proud of yourself. She shut the door quietly, leaving Cal alone with his guilt and his frustration. He hated it when females cried. Nothing made him feel so helpless. He felt like a complete brute, bringing Lily to tears. Lily was a little sweetheart, warm-hearted and innocent. She obviously wasn't the problem. Rose was. Rose hadn't turned a hair. By God, she was a tough little nut. She'd defied him all the way, cool as you please, making it quite clear that, brother or not, she had no intention of knuckling down under his control. She'd soon learn he wasn't going to put up with her disobedience or her insolence. Part of him was secretly almost proud of her refusal to be intimidated. If only she had been born a boy, what a soldier she would have made. He'd given the girls the kind of raking down he'd give a careless young officer under his command. But had she cared? Had she buckled? Not a whit. But Rose wasn't a boy. She was a damned nuisance. And for the moment at least, she was his damned nuisance and he still didn't know where they'd been or what they'd been doing. The moment the kitchen door closed, Rose released Lily from her comforting grip, and the two girls hurried up the stairs. They entered their shared bedroom and closed the door behind them. You can stop now, Rose said, tossing Lily a handkerchief. He won't come in here. It takes a moment, Lily said, carefully wiping her cheeks. I'm not a tap, you know. You're as good as one. Better. I so wish I could do it. It's such an excellent weapon. Not a weapon, a defense, Lily corrected her. Or a distraction. But I felt a bit mean tonight, doing it to Cal on his first night home. Pooh, he deserved it. He was being perfectly horrid, all that talk about white slavery and Turkish brothels and being stripped and left naked in the gutter. He was trying to make us feel bad, and so we, well, you, made him feel bad in return. It worked a treat, I must say. Did you see his face? Lily nodded. I still feel mean. Nonsense. It was excellent strategy. He doesn't care about us, Lily. He's just like Papa and Henry. He doesn't give the snap of his fingers about us or how we feel, as long as we're no trouble to him. He's not even staying in England. Perhaps, but... Ten years he's been gone, with barely a word. And what's the first thing he does when he comes home? Stays up late to trap us and yell at us. He didn't actually yell... Lily pointed out. He was scary, but very quiet. Rose grinned. Like your tears. I wish you hadn't told him I get nightmares. You do sometimes. Yes, but not often. Lily hung up her dress. A leaf green, hale spot muslin with dark pink piping. I remembered him as such a kind big brother, the few times we ever saw him. Yes, but that wasn't his fault. He was away at school most of the time, and then he went to war. And the war's been over for several years now, but did he come home? Did he show any interest in us? Or did he leave us here to... to stultify? Rose hung up her own dress, a cerulean blue polished cotton, and smoothed it with a longing hand. Last year's fashions, and I still love this dress. I am so sick of wearing black. 
I'll be more than twenty by the time we're out of our blacks next year, Lily. I want to start my life now, not next year. Lily sighed again and tucked her socks one inside the other. I know. She pulled her nightgown over her head. Do you think Aunt Dottie really did cry about us being out? If she did, it was his fault. She might not like us going out from time to time, but she doesn't fuss. Not since that time we climbed out the window, and she knows we can look after ourselves. She at least cares about us and doesn't see us as inconvenient nuisances. Lily nodded. Aunt Dottie is a darling. Rose glanced at her. You're a lot like her, you know. Lily sighed and pressed her hands over her rounded stomach. I know, I try not to eat so much, but I'm still fat. Silly, I mean that you're kind and loving and sweet-natured. And how often do I have to tell you, you're not fat, you're curvy. I'd rather be beautiful like you. Ha, huh. I'd rather be free to do what I want. The following morning, Cal sat down before breakfast to pen some letters, the most important of which was to Aunt Agatha in London. He should have paid a call on her when he first arrived in England. She was a high stickler for correct form, but it was too late for that. Aunt Dottie was famously soft-hearted. Her older sister was frankly feared. He couldn't see the girls getting the better of her. He also sent a note to Phipps, informing him he was in Bath for the next three or four days, and to forward any mail here. There were several more men on his list he could check on from Bath. He found some wax to seal the letters, signed the outside with an army free frank, and realized that he could frank them as Lord Ashenden now. He added a brief note to the outside of the lawyer's letter requesting he find the Ashenden seal and send it on to Cal. The clock in the hall chimed ten as he placed the letters on the hall table ready for the post. At that moment, his aunt and the two girls came down the stairs. It was like a parade of crows. Each of them was dressed in unrelieved black. Cal blinked. It hadn't occurred to him until now, but the girls had not been wearing black the previous night. Black quite suited Rose, setting off her bright colouring, but it sapped any colour from Lily's cheeks. Or perhaps her pallor was the result of nightmares, courtesy of her long-lost brother. He stifled the pang. Better a few nightmares than the kind of thing that could happen to young girls out at night alone. Good morning, Aunt Dottie, Rose, Lily. Beaming, Aunt Dottie turned to her nieces. See, girls, this is the delightful surprise I promised you. It's your brother Cal, returned at last from the wars. Clearly the girls hadn't told Aunt Dottie of the previous night's meeting. They didn't move. Aunt Dottie laughed and gave them a little shove. Don't be shy, girls. He's your brother. He's the same dear boy he always was, just taller and broader in the shoulders. Go and give him a welcome home kiss. Remember how much you missed him when he first went away? Good morning, Cal, Lily muttered, and came forward and planted a light, polite kiss on his cheek. It was a far cry from the warm and enthusiastic embrace of the previous night. Good morning, brother dearest, Rose said, kissing the air next to his cheek. A delightful surprise indeed. She bared her teeth at him in a parody of a smile. It was war then. Aunt Dottie didn't seem to notice the tension. Cal stood back to let the ladies precede him into the breakfast room. Aunt Dottie first, and Lily bringing up in the rear. How did you sleep, Lily? he murmured as they entered. She gave him an odd, almost guilty look. Very well, thank you. I'm glad, he said quietly. Breakfast was a fairly stilted affair, 
Aunt Dottie chatted happily, throwing questions at Cal and encouraging the girls to do likewise. They sat there like oysters. She seemed to think they were shy in his presence. Cal knew better. He wasn't forgiven yet. Not that he needed their forgiveness, he had done the right thing, he knew. Lily was reserved, not yet trusting the man who'd made her cry at their first meeting as adults. And Rose, well, Rose turned every opportunity for conversation into an indirect snipe at him. It was almost amusing. She was very sharp and quick-witted. And what are your plans for today, Aunt Dotty? he asked as he buttered a piece of toast. Well, of course, we always start the day with a visit to the pump room, don't we, girls? The girls gave an unenthusiastic murmur of agreement. Don't look like that, girls. The waters are nasty tasting, but they're very good for you. Lily's spots cleared right up, remember? Lily flushed and looked down. Her complexion was smooth and unmarked, as perfect as her sister's. Cal remembered the agony of his own spotty period. But Lily's complexion is perfect, he said. I can't believe she ever had a spot in her life, he grimaced. I, on the other hand, suffered with them terribly as a youth. She looked up and gave him a shy smile. Rose shot him a hard-eyed stare. Suspicious little cat she was. He winked at her, and she bridled. What are your plans today, Cal? Lily asked. He's coming with us to the pump room, of course, Aunt Dottie declared. At Cal's ill-concealed look of dismay, Lily giggled, and Rosa's scowl turned to a grin of pure pleasure. Won't that be delightful, brother dearest? She purred. Aunt Dottie continued. Well, you don't imagine I'm going to let Almeria Bracegirdle think she's the only one who can enter the room on the arm of a dashing young gentleman, do you? Her grandson, Albert, looks well enough on his own, but beside Cal, he will look like a... like a... Like a poodle, Rose said. A poodle, Aunt Dottie laughed. You have a wicked tongue, Rose, dear, but you're quite right. He is a poodle. Oh dear, I shan't be able to keep a straight face when I meet him now. A poodle. And how long does this pump room visit usually last, Aunt Dotty? He was hoping for a quick visit, make their entrance, eclipse the poodle, drink the nasty waters and leave. Half an hour? Forty minutes? It's just that I have some business to transact today. Forty minutes? Oh no, it will take much longer than that, Rose said with spiteful relish. We're usually there for hours. She was teasing, of course. He glanced at his aunt, who nodded complacently. Rose is quite right, an hour at the very least. But more usually, too, we have so many friends and acquaintances there, you see. It's quite the social occasion. It's our only social occasion, Rose muttered. Oh no, dear, you know that's not quite right, her aunt said reprovingly. She turned to Cal and explained. After the pump room, we usually visit some of the shops on Milsom Street and elsewhere. Bath has some delightfully modish shops, you know. For all that people say, it's not as fashionable a place as it used to be. And we go to the library. Rose said. Lily loves the library. Cal frowned. There was some undercurrent there he didn't understand. It's a very good library, Aunt Dottie agreed, and we frequently stop for a bun and a cup of tea at one of the tea rooms. There are several elegant establishments we like to patronize, don't we, girls? And we quite often attend a concert. What was the one we attended last month? The string quartet, Lily murmured. That was it, and a very superior performance it was too. 
and we can even go for a walk in the Sydney Gardens. That's quite acceptable for people in mourning, Rose said in a bright tone that was almost savage. Yes, on a sunny afternoon it's very pleasant, Aunt Dottie agreed placidly. But if you have business, Cal dear, this afternoon is quite free. I usually take a nap around three while the girls read and embroider. And there, in a nutshell, was the cause of his sister's restlessness. They were bored. Restricted from the livelier social events by their state of mourning and spending most of their time in the company of an old lady and her friends. And from the sounds of things with no friends of their own age. He'd likely be kicking over the traces, too, if he were forced into such a dull routine at that age. Anything would be better than that. Whereabouts is the school you girls attended? he asked. It's in Bath, I know, but what's the address? Why would you want to know that? flashed Rose. You never wrote to us when we were there, after all, so why now? Rose, dear, that's no way to talk to your brother, Aunt Dottie said gently. He's head of the family now and must be treated with respect. She gave him directions to the school, finishing with, But I confess I'm curious, too, as to why you'd want to know. Business, he said. Would you pass the marmalade, please, Rose? She passed it, watching him through slitted cat eyes. Chapter 3 One half of the world cannot understand the pleasures of the other. Jane Austen, Emma The pump room experience was as gruesome as Cal expected. Aunt Dottie paused outside the building, ran a critical eye over him, straightened the black armband she'd produced for him after breakfast, and then stood on tiptoe to smooth back his hair, as she had when he was a small boy. Then she placed her hand on his arm, took a deep breath and moved forward. Clearly, they were to make an entrance. All kinds of people patronised the pump room and came to drink the waters or bathe in them, people from all levels of society. But the worst invalids and poorest folk usually came and went first thing in the morning. This was the fashionable time, and the place was crowded with elegantly dressed ladies and gentlemen, mostly elderly or middle-aged, some in bath chairs or resting on sticks, most with an attendant, a servant, a poor relation, or a companion. Aunt Dottie stepped inside and paused, or perhaps the right word was posed her hand resting possessively on Cal's arm. They stood framed in the doorway while Aunt Dottie surveyed the room with all the triumph of a hunter returning to a starving village, having bagged a nice fat buck. The buck concerned swallowed, reminded himself of all those red woolen socks and allowed himself to be displayed. A snort from behind him indicated that one at least of his sisters found the spectacle vastly amusing. He didn't need to turn his head to know which sister. There was a short hush, then a buzz of speculation rose. See, they're all dying to know who my tall, handsome escort is, Aunt Dottie said gleefully from the side of her mouth. She then led him forward in a slow, triumphal circuit of the room, greeting everyone and introducing him as My nephew, the new Earl of Ashenden. The dear boy has been away at the wars for the last ten years, defeating the Corsican monster. Single-handedly, Rose interjected from time to time in a low voice that only she, Lily and Cal could hear. And the minute he arrived in England, he came straight here to see me and the girls, Aunt Dottie would conclude proudly. Cal tried not to squirm. What followed was invariably a brief polite exchange, 
touching a little on Cal's experience abroad before venturing delicately or otherwise toward the only subject most of the ladies there were interested in, whether Cal was married or betrothed. The moment he admitted he wasn't, the invitations came gushing forth. Unmarried and widowed daughters, nieces, granddaughters, great-nieces, and a few more distant relations were produced and introduced to Cal. No, to Lord Ashenden. Presented for his inspection, they blushed prettily, or otherwise, while their relations extolled their various virtues, skills, and aristocratic connections. In one case, a very blunt, grandmotherly type pointed out of an excellent pair of childbearing hips. The poor girl turned beet red and looked as though she would happily sink into the floor. But she rallied when Cal gave her a sympathetic smile and fluttered her eyelashes at him hopefully. They invited him to tea, dinner, picnics, intimate family parties and musical afternoons, all designed to further his acquaintance with the female of the moment. Cal did his best to parry the flood of invitations politely but firmly, claiming that he had no time for courting, that he wasn't at the moment looking for a wife, that this was a brief visit only, and that he would be returning abroad shortly on important government business. It didn't seem to matter to the ladies. Their girls were not so fussy or demanding as to need extensive courting. Would it not be better for Lord Ashenden to marry now and leave his wife to look after his estates, a wife who, even as she tearfully waved him goodbye, might be bearing his heir, thus securing the Ashenden succession? To think he had fled London because of the Frampton sisters. Out of the frying pan... He was very aware of his sister's amusement, and as he progressed through the room, his apologies became firmer and less regretful, and his government business more immediate and urgent. And damn it, it was! He was almost grateful to be presented with the Poodle, a ridiculous young dandy with elaborately curled, fluffed and pomaded yellow locks. He wore tight breeches in a shade he told Cal was called primrose. The latest mode, I do assure you. A lavender coat so nattily cut that it no doubt took all his valet's strength to squeeze him into it, and a profusion of fobs and chains that reminded Cal of the Christmas trees he had seen in Vienna the year before. But as the fellow had no unmarried sisters or cousins— offered Cal no invitations to tea, dinner, or any other social occasion, and showed no interest whatsoever in Cal's marital prospects. Cal decided the poodle was a fine fellow. After nearly two hours, Cal finally escaped, citing urgent and possibly dangerous, added Rose, business to attend to. He left Aunt Dottie and the girls to enjoy Aunt Dottie's triumph with her particular cronies over crumpets and sweet buns at their favourite tea room. Cal strode up the hill as fast as his dignity would allow him. Fleeing the battlefield was becoming a habit. Cal's aunt had given him a street name, but not a number. But when he saw a line of schoolgirls filing into an imposing building under the supervision of a tall female dressed in dark blue, he knew he had found the school. It was set on a corner, with an excellent view over the city of Bath and surrounds, and was enclosed on three sides by a high stone wall set with shards of broken glass along the top. He grinned. Nobody would be getting in or out of that place except by the front door. A discreetly lettered brass plate beside the entrance said, Miss Mallard's Seminary for the Daughters of Gentlemen. Cal rang the doorbell and waited. A grim-looking female in black opened it and peered at him suspiciously. Yes. I'd like to speak with Miss Mallard. She looked him up and down. Whom shall I say is calling? Major Cat, he broke off. I mean Lord Ashenden. 
she scrutinized him with hostile, pale blue pebble eyes. Please come in. I'll see if Miss Mallard is available. She let him into a spacious black and white tiled vestibule, to the right of which rose a handsome staircase. She indicated some chairs set in a line along the wall. Wait here, and then added grudgingly, Please. Amused at the woman's barely repressed hostility, did she think he had come here to ravage her precious girls? Cal sat down to wait. A wave of whispering and murmuring above him caused him to turn his head and look up. On the landing of the stairs, a huddle of young girls had gathered and were eyeing him with speculative interest. There was a burst of muffled exclamations of, Lavinia, no! Lavi, don't! And, You'll get into trouble, you know, you're not allowed to! And a pretty young girl of about fourteen or fifteen ran down the stairs and confidently plopped herself on the chair beside him. She turned to him with a coquettish smile. How do you do? Are you waiting for the duck? Because I'll keep you company if you like. My name's Lavinia. Miss Lavinia Fortescue Brown of the Surrey Fortescue Browns. You're new here, aren't you? Are you thinking of sending someone here? Your sister, perhaps? You're too young and handsome to have a daughter of school age, so go ahead, ask me anything. I've been here for years, but I'll be leaving soon and I can tell you anything you want to know about. Lavinia Fortescue Brown The voice came from above, calm, quiet, but somehow commanding. It cut off the torrent of words coming from Miss Lavinia Fortescue Brown of the Surrey Fortescue Browns in midstream. Cal looked up to see who had produced this minor miracle. A tallish female dressed in drab dark blue came gracefully down the stairs. It was the woman he'd seen earlier, ushering the column of girls into the school. She was handsome rather than pretty, with high cheekbones and a short, straight nose. Her hair seemed to be brown and curly, though most of it was pulled tightly back and hidden under an ugly spinster's cap. Lavinia jumped to her feet. Yes, Miss Westwood? Cal rose to his feet. The tall lady didn't so much as glance at him. Another man-hater, perhaps? What a waste! She wasn't a beauty, but she had a look of elegant distinction. Her complexion was good, her nose small and straight, her chin firm and her mouth. Soft, ripe raspberries in a dish of pure cream. You're supposed to be upstairs preparing your French poetry recital, Lavinia, not bothering strange gentlemen. The strange gentleman was busy looking at the lush, feminine mouth and wondering what it would take to break that smooth, nun-like composure. Oh, but, Miss Westwood, I wasn't bothering. Upstairs now. She said it in a pleasant, almost conversational tone of voice, but there was no denying the steel beneath. Lavinia cast a wistful look at Cal, but took a few reluctant steps toward the staircase. The tall lady turned her gaze on Cal. She had the most amazing eyes, an arresting grey-green, like sage or frosted grass framed with thick, dark lashes. She said crisply, You are being attended to, I presume, sir? Yes, but perhaps... A soft scream cut him off in mid-sentence, they turned to find Lavinia Fortescue Brown of the Surrey Fortescue Browns sprawled dramatically at the foot of the stairs. She gazed helplessly up at Cal, whimpering and fluttering her eyelashes. The tall lady frowned and bent over the girl. What have you done, Lavinia? The girl's gaze didn't shift from Cal, who stood beside the teacher. I tripped, Miss Westwood. I've twisted my ankle. It's frightfully painful. The teacher was a cool-headed one, no doubt about it. She seemed entirely unconcerned. She twitched the girl's hem aside and made a cursory examination of the ankle. Hmm, 
Can you stand? The girl made an attempt to get up, gave a loud moan and fell back helplessly. Oh, it hurts, it hurts. I can't walk at all. She gave Cal a piteous look. Perhaps the gentleman could carry me upstairs. Before Cal could offer to help, the teacher said, Oh, there's no need to bother the gentleman. He's much too busy to carry injured schoolgirls around. I don't mind, Cal began. She gave him a swift, quelling look. No, no, the school porter will carry Lavinia. Not Grimes, Lavinia exclaimed in disgust. Of course, Grimes, the teacher affirmed. You will recall from your lessons, Lavinia, that the word porter comes from the French to carry. Carrying things and people is Grimes's job. He will be delighted to carry you upstairs. There was a short silence, then the teacher said dryly, Or perhaps the pain is not so bad now, and you can manage by yourself. The girl sighed, and with a moan or two, much less dramatic now, managed to stand. Under her teacher's eye, she bid Cal goodbye and, clutching at the banister, began to hobble pathetically up the stairs, wincing at each painful step. Limping, he noticed, on the wrong foot. The teacher watched her go, then turned to Cal, her eyes dancing with humour. She's somewhat of a minx, our Lavinia. As Lavinia turned at the landing, cast Cal one last tragic glance and limped bravely out of sight, the teacher added, Grimes is in his sixties and has hair growing, quite vigorously, out of his nose and ears. Cal chuckled. He was impressed with her handling of the girl, firm but with humour and a light touch. She glanced past him. Ah, here is Teal. I'll leave you then. Thank you for your tolerance. She turned away and hurried back up the stairs in the wake of her pupil. The grim female in black gave Cal a gimlet look. Miss Mallard will see you now. Cal followed her, well pleased with what he'd learned. Miss Mallard's seminary for the daughters of gentlemen might be the very answer. There was discipline here, good discipline, and high walls topped with broken glass. All he needed, really. Emmeline Westwood followed her charge up the stairs, trying not to be aware of the hard grey gaze of the tall spare man standing below. Who was he? She'd noticed him in the street earlier. Her first impression, as he'd come striding up the hill, was of a hunter, lean, dark, and somehow predatory. The last place she'd imagined he would head for was Miss Mallard's seminary. Talk about fox in the hen house. Even if it was the chickens that were doing the hunting. Hurry along there, Lavinia she said. The girl was casting languishing glances back down the stairs. Oh, but... You're limping on the wrong foot, Em observed. Oh, Lavinia started to limp on the other foot, then realized. She cast Em a worried glance. I'm not in trouble, am I? I was only trying to help the gentleman. Most praiseworthy of you, M said dryly, he seeming so helpless and lost, and apparently in need of people to carry. Lavinia giggled. Wasn't he delicious, miss, so stern and handsome and tall, and those eyes? You, miss, are a minx, M told her. Now be off with you. Get on with your French poetry exercise, and I'll give you an extra poem to translate and learn as punishment for your mischief. Lavinia sighed, but she was getting off lightly, and she knew it. M paused, then added, Lavinia, before you go, I want you to think about this. Which young lady do you think a gentleman would find most interesting? 
the girl who thrusts herself eagerly into his company, unasked, or the young lady who remains ever so slightly aloof, a prize to be won. Lavinia looked perplexed. You think he thought me too eager? M fought a smile. The girl had been flirting outrageously in the way of the very young and innocent. I have no idea what that particular gentleman thought. All I ask is that you think about the impression you wish to give. But if I am too cool and aloof, gentlemen might not even approach me. There is no danger of that, M assured her. You're a very pretty girl with a lively and affectionate nature. You will have your pick of gentlemen, I'm sure. A little reserve will not frighten men away. It will only make you a prize more worth the winning. Lavinia gave her a doubtful look. M said lightly, Men, most people in fact, value the hard-won prize over that which comes to them easily, don't you think? I never thought of that. M smiled. I'm not suggesting you change your personality, just that you try to consider the impression your words and actions might give. A girl's reputation is a delicate thing, and it rests almost wholly in the hands of others. People who don't know you can misinterpret your actions and make false judgments about you. And once that's happened, there's very little you can do to change things. If only someone had told her that when she was Lavinia's age. Lavinia thought that over and nodded. I see. She took a few steps, then paused and turned back. You are so wise, Miss Westwood. Why did you never... She broke off, blushing. Sorry, she muttered and hurried away. M knew what she had been going to ask. Why had M never married? The girl speculated constantly about that. She knew. She'd never explained and never would. The girls had come up with a range of stories she knew, the most widely accepted being that she had been in love with a soldier who had been killed in the war. M never discussed it. The truth was uglier than anything the girls in their innocence could come up with. M still didn't quite understand how it had happened. Just that it had, and her life had been ruined. No, not ruined, she told herself firmly. She was happy here. She loved teaching. She really did, and the girls were wonderful. But it wasn't how she'd dreamed her life would be. She hurried to her room to prepare for her next class, geography. A frustrating subject. Not only had the borders of so many countries been changed by Napoleon's conquests, they kept changing after his defeat. It was almost impossible for a teacher to keep up. She set out the globes and tried not to think of the tall, hard-eyed man waiting below. What would bring such a man to Miss Mallard's seminary? The Rutherford girls? The elegant silver-haired headmistress stared at Cal in horror over her pince-nez. You want me to take Rose and Lily Rutherford back? No, and no, and no. Cal said soothingly, Not permanently, just for a few weeks or a month until I can... No. She removed the pince-nez, placed them in a case, and closed it with a snap. Business completed. Not for a week, not for a month, not even for a minute. Why not? Your half-sisters are too old for this establishment. Too old and too... Restless. They would lead the younger girls astray. What if I paid double the usual fees? She didn't respond. So he said, Triple. She thinned her lips. Did you not understand me when I said no, Lord Ashenden? He sighed and sat back in his chair. No, I'm just desperate. Can't you help me just a little, Miss Mallard? You had them here for five years, after all. She snorted. 
and between them they turned my hair white. I know Rose can be a handful, but Lily. She threw up her hands. Lily, that girl drove my poor teachers to distraction. Lily did. She is unteachable, quite unteachable. Cal frowned. Are we talking about the same Lily, sweet-natured and biddable? Oh, yes, she's very sweet-natured, but nobody can teach her. It's not that we haven't tried everything we can think of, but it's very bad for the reputation of my school to turn out a pupil who, after five long years, still cannot spell and can barely read. There was a short pause when Cal said, Are you telling me that Lily cannot read and write? She nodded. Didn't you know? He shook his head slowly. He didn't quite believe it. Lily didn't seem at all stupid to him. But damn it, there was no solution for him here after all. So nothing I can say or do will convince you to take them back. My advice to you is to get them married off as quickly as you can. They are of age. Rose is almost twenty and Lily is eighteen. Make them some other man's problem. She rose in implacable dismissal. Good day to you, Lord Ashenden, and good luck. Cal spent the rest of the afternoon visiting other seminaries for young ladies. Bath was full of them, but without success. Either the girls really were too old, or their reputations had travelled before them. He suspected the latter. Walking back to his aunt's house, he was surprised to see an old friend striding grimly along on the other side of the street, deep in a brown study. Ned Galbraith, a few years behind Cal at school, had gone to war at the same time. He had resigned his commission in 1814, rejoined for Waterloo, then sold out again. Cal hadn't seen him since Waterloo. Galbraith! he called. Galbraith glanced up and the frown cleared from his face. He crossed the street and the two men shook hands. Can't stay to chat, Galbraith said after the initial greetings were over. Got an engagement in. He pulled out a fob watch and consulted it. Quarter of an hour. I'm staying at York House. Join me for dinner. We can blow a cloud and catch up. Can't, I'm afraid, Cal said regretfully. I've only just arrived in Bath and I need to look after my young half-sisters. Galbraith's brows rose. Don't they have nursemaids for that sort of thing? Cal grimaced. They're not children. They don't require a nursemaid more like a watchdog. Like that is it? Well, if you change your mind, you know where I'm staying. I'm here for a week or two. Weeks? Not here for the waters, are you? Galbraith looked as fit and healthy as ever. Lord, no filthy stuff. If you haven't already tasted it, don't. Might as well drain water through your old socks and drink that. No, I'm... A peculiar expression crossed his face. I'm courting. Courting you? Good Lord. I always thought you were as marriage shy as me. I know I was, I am, but... He gave a wry grimace. Needs must when the devil drives. Your grandfather? Galbraith nodded. Got it in one. Since my father died, the old man hasn't stopped fretting. Says before the angels call him he wants me firmly buckled to a respectable level-headed gel and with a lusty squalling air in the nursery. Cal couldn't help but snort. The angels? From all accounts, Galbraith's grandfather, old Lord Galbraith, had been a notorious rake in his youth. Turn religious, Galbraith said, faintly amused. Respectable as a vicar now. Damn. Damn indeed, he added in a dry voice. He's even picked out the girl. 
Cal was shocked. What, you don't get a choice? Of course I do, but, he shrugged. The old man is failing, and I, I've given him nothing but trouble all my life. I've decided to marry quickly so he can die in peace, and since it makes no difference to me who I marry, no difference? You don't believe that, surely? Why not? Galbraith said indifferently. All cats are gray in the dark, and you know as well as I that with a title comes the obligation to procreate. He gave Cal a twisted smile. Marriage, it comes to us all in the end. Not me, Cal said emphatically, and then he remembered his own title and the need for an heir. At least not for a good long while yet. But who is this girl he's picked out for you? Tell you all about it when you come to dinner. Make it Thursday. Give you a couple of days to find a watchdog for the girls. Galbraith consulted his watch again. Must go. The blushing bride awaits. Cal continued on his way, a little disturbed by what he'd learned. Gossip at the Apocalypse Club had Galbraith down as a cold bastard, and since returning to England, he had apparently developed a reputation in the ton as cynical rake and a care for nobody. Whatever he was now, most agreed that Galbraith had been a damn good officer, a man to rely on. But Cal had known Ned Galbraith since school, and back then he had been quite a different boy. War changed men, some more than others. And now the rake was to be married. A convenient marriage to a level-headed female. Cal gave an inward shudder. He couldn't think of anything worse. Why did people always think marriage was the answer to everything? The headmistress's words came back to him. Get them married off as quickly as you can. Make them some other man's problem. A tempting prospect. But such things weren't so easily arranged. Not quickly, at any rate. Still, with any luck, Aunt Agatha would step in as he'd asked her to. She was his godmother, after all, as well as his aunt. Unlike Aunt Dottie, who was as soft and sweet as flummery, Aunt Agatha was not an aunt to be sneezed at. As a boy, he'd been terrified of her. As had his father and every other adult he knew. Except, strangely, Aunt Dotty. But then Aunt Dotty had always been a law unto herself. She saw the world differently than most people, and Cal was beginning to see just how differently. Aunt Agatha would soon sort the girls out. M lay in bed that night, mulling over the events of the day. In the forefront was the tall man she had met at the bottom of the stairs. She met so few men, young men, these days, apart from the attentions of a couple of elderly widowers who attended the same church as she did, men even older than her father and suffering from a variety of ailments. There was a reason they lived in Bath, after all. With the life she lived, there was very little chance of meeting anyone her own age let alone someone her own age who was so very attractive. Those cold-seeming grey eyes had lit with humour when he realised Lavinia's little ploy. A small exchange, a little humorous understanding. Oh, she was making too much of it. Wasn't he delicious, miss, so stern and handsome and tall, and those eyes? He was all that and more, but M would never have been brave enough to comment on a man's attractions, not allowed like that, and certainly not with such frank enjoyment. Was it her age, or a legacy of the way she'd left home? A girl's reputation is a delicate thing. M pressed a hand to her stomach. In a few years, she'd be thirty. 
Year after year, girls returned to the school proudly displaying their husbands, and, as often as not, with a babe in arms to show off and be cooed over. M did her share of cooing. She loved babies. But afterward... Oh, it was shameful to envy the girls their happiness, their babies. She'd lost all chance of that, and she had no one but herself to blame. On the other side of the thin wall, she could hear the low buzz of Miss Johnston and Miss Thwaites talking anxiously. Teal, Miss Mallard's assistant, had let slip accidentally on purpose that Miss Mallard was thinking about retiring causing a mild panic among the staff members. Would the school be closed or sold, and if so, what would happen to them? M refused to worry at this stage. It might be just a malicious rumor started by Teal. It wouldn't be the first time. The woman positively enjoyed upsetting people. If the rumor was true, M was fairly confident she could get another job. Miss Mallard would give her a good reference, she was sure. Bath was full of girls' schools, and Miss Mallard's was one of the more select. But Miss Thwaites and Miss Johnston were elderly, poor, and without family. They'd told M that if the school did close, they would pool their meagre savings and rent rooms in a cottage by the sea, there to live out the rest of their days, perhaps eking out their income by giving lessons in music, deportment, and French. It was a depressing prospect. Even more depressing was the thought that her own future would, in all probability, be much the same. She too was poor and wholly dependent on whatever she could earn. And she had no family to turn to. There had only ever been Papa, and now he was gone. As always, at the thought of her father, guilt and grief surged up within her. If only she had seen Papa spoken to him before he died, explained, apologized, made peace with him, told him how much she loved him. She had thought, hoped, he'd come after her, but instead, in a rage that must have lasted much longer than his usual fits of temper, he'd disowned her, changed his will, leaving her nothing, not a penny. And then he'd died. Of a broken heart, Mr. Irwin had told her. He'd bumped into her in the street just outside the pump room. He was in Bath on his honeymoon and had broken it to her right in front of everyone that her father was dead, had been dead in fact for almost a year. You caused your father's death, you broke his heart and killed him he had told her with spiteful relish. Why would anyone need to inform you? he had sneered in answer to her shocked, stammered questions. You disgraced yourself refusing his bidding and ran off never to be heard of again. Your father wrote you out of his will, left you nothing, not a penny. When he died, there was no reason for anyone to contact you. He had added gleefully, You've lost everything. You have no family, no home, no fortune. Serves you right for being such a stubborn little bitch. She'd always known Irwin would never forgive her for refusing him, but the vitriol in his voice and manner had shocked her. M thought of what she'd told Lavinia that morning. A girl's reputation is a delicate thing, and it rests almost wholly in the hands of others. She was the living embodiment of the truth of that. Chapter 4 It was his object to see as much as he could, with as little apparent observation. Jane Austen, Emma In the days that followed, Cal did his best to simultaneously watch over his sisters, get to know them, and keep them entertained. His efforts weren't appreciated. He decided to check whether the headmistress's comments about Lily were true, so he'd asked her to read, and that had ended in tears on Lily's part and fury on Rose's when she had learned what he'd done. For the next few days he was given the silent treatment, not by Lily, 
who simply avoided his gaze and whispered every response as if he'd whipped her, but from Rose. And from somebody delivering the silent treatment, she did it in the noisiest way possible, with long-suffering huffs and world-weary sighs. But Cal wasn't going to give in to that kind of nonsense. And when Aunt Dotty asked him what he'd done to upset the girls now, he snapped that he'd done nothing wrong, merely asked Lily in the most reasonable way possible to read a few lines of a letter to him. Aunt Dotty looked at him as if he'd just admitted to strangling a kitten. She's very sensitive about it, you know. I think I've worked that out, Aunt Dotty, he said, but she was oblivious to sarcasm. She patted his hand. They'll come around, you'll see. Keeping them entertained in the evening was also a trial. He'd suggested cards, which got Rose's hackles raised because apparently Lily got cards confused. Though how the hell he was supposed to know that, he couldn't imagine. Luckily, he hit on the idea of spillikins, which Lily enjoyed and was good at. The evening finished on a much more pleasant note. But as Rose said before, they retired for the night. You can't expect to keep us entertained with endless nursery games, you know. He cared about his sisters, he really did. But he was also chafing at the bit to be rid of these petty domestic problems and be back on the trail of an assassin. He hoped Aunt Agatha would get here soon. He was fed up with sitting up late every night, simply to make sure the girls weren't able to sneak out. And he was very fed up with having to watch what he said. Conversations with the girls were like picking his way through a treacherous swamp. You never knew where the dangers lurked. I don't know why you make such a fuss of having to wear black rose, Cal said after one particularly trying meal where Rose hadn't missed a single opportunity to snipe at him. Morning colors suit you perfectly. She sent him a suspicion-laden look. It's the combination of the black with your guinea gold hair, he said, and after a pause added, wasp colors. She laughed, tried to turn it into a cough, failed, and gave up. So his sharp-tongued little sister had a sense of humor after all. He liked her the better for it. We don't always have to be at dagger drawn, you know, he said quietly. Her smile died. Don't we? By the time Thursday evening arrived, Cal found himself looking forward to dinner with his friend Galbraith with a ridiculous degree of anticipation. York House was the finest hotel in Bath, and the food would be excellent. But even more than a good dinner with fine wines, Cal was looking forward to an evening of straightforward, uncomplicated, blessedly logical masculine company. I tell you, Ned, dealing with females is the very devil, Cal said after a fine meal washed down with some excellent wine. They were now settled in comfortable overstuffed armchairs in front of a cosy fire and on their second cognac, and both men were feeling delightfully mellow. Thought you liked women. I said females, not women. Galbraith considered that. Not sure I see your point. Females are women. No, that's where you're wrong. All women are females, but not all females are women. There was a short silence. You mean some of them are those, what do you call them, man milliners? No, of course not. I mean, there is an age when a young female is not yet a woman, and... Ned... At that age, they might look sweet and innocent, and as if butter wouldn't melt in their mouth, but take it from me, they're devils in disguise. A man cannot put a single foot right, one wrong move, and they snap it right off. His friend snorted. 
Too soft a heart with females, that's your trouble. Keep cool, stand firm, and never compromise. Always worked for me. Cal shook his head. All very well for you to say, you don't have sisters. Believe me, being responsible for young females of that age, particularly young female relatives, well, it's worse than... worse than... He tried to think of an example that Galbraith would appreciate. Remember that time when I was still wet behind the ears and was given that troop to command, most of them from the stews of London, and only in the army as an alternative to being locked up in prison for God knows how long. Lord, yes, thugs and villains to a man, scum of the earth. Cal nodded. Trying to control my young sisters is harder than that. Harder than commanding that riffraff? Galbraith gave a snort of amusement. Pull the other one, I've seen grown men, hard nuts they were too, shaking in their boots when called up before you for some infraction or other. Yes, but they knew I could have them flogged. Galbraith gave Cal a sideways glance. Don't remember when you ever resorted to flogging? I did once or twice, extreme circumstances. Cal stared into his brandy glass. But you can't flog girls or even threaten it. Suppose not. And soldiers don't burst into tears at a very mild reprimand, or flounce from the room or sulk or look at you with big wounded eyes, or ignore my very reasonable orders and go their own merry way. There was a muffled sound from the chair opposite. Cal narrowed his eyes. Are you laughing at me, Galbraith? Wouldn't dream of it. He met Cal's gaze for a pregnant pause, then burst into laughter. Lord, yes, I'm laughing. It's priceless. Major Calborn Rutherford, bested by a couple of schoolgirls. Not schoolgirls, Cal said gloomily. The school wouldn't take them back. Don't tell me. You asked the school to take them back. Cal nodded. Damned headmistress refused. There was another shout of laughter from his unsympathetic friend. So what are you going to do? I've written to Aunt Agatha. Galbraith's brows rose. You mean Lady Salter, that old tartar? Good move. She'll knock the nonsense out of them. Knocks the nonsense out of everyone, your Aunt Agatha. Cal swirled his cognac, gazing balefully into the firelight, reflected in its smooth golden depths. I don't know. Rose will give her a pretty good run for her money, I'll wager. And the other one? What's her name, Lucy? Lily, yes, she'll probably eat Lily alive. He frowned, imagining little Lily faced with Aunt Agatha. Then he shook his head. But I can't help that. I can't lock them in their bedchambers, and I can't and won't let them wander the streets at night. Good God, Ned, anything could happen to them. What about a governess? Galbraith suggested after a moment. Sort of governess, companion, chaperone type of female, with a bit of watchdog thrown in. You mean a wardress? Cal said gloomily. But it's too late. I've already sent for Aunt Agatha. Galbraith snorted. Same thing, isn't it? The two men sipped their brandy and stared into the flames. The fire crackled and hissed. Cal drained his glass and stood. It's late. I'd better get going. It was cold as Cal walked back to his aunt's house, the chill from the surrounding hills sliding down to pool and gather in the town. The scent of coal and wood fires thickened the faint mist. His footsteps echoed in the night silence. The streets were deserted. Galbraith's reaction had made Cal thoughtful. Had he been a little premature in sending for Aunt Agatha? 
She wasn't a monster, just strict and a little intimidating. It was mostly men who were terrified of her, particularly men related to her. Aunt Dottie, her younger sister, wasn't the least bit intimidated by her, and as far as he could tell from the letters that Aunt Dottie sent with the socks, Aunt Agatha led a very social life and had plenty of friends. It had always puzzled him. Aunt Dottie, sweet-natured, gentle and affectionate, had never married, and yet her sister, sharp-tongued and formidable, had married three times. To men who had died not long afterward, he reminded himself. Had he overreacted in writing to her? The last couple of days with the girls hadn't been too bad, if he didn't count Rose's occasional snipes. They hadn't sneaked out or misbehaved in any serious way. As he'd thought on first acquaintance, they just needed a firm hand. But he had no intention of hanging around indefinitely to provide it. He had a job to do that was a damn sight more important than playing watchdog to a pair of young hoydens. Maybe Aunt Agatha had mellowed. He turned the corner into Aunt Dottie's street and squinted against the darkness. Three cloaked female figures were approaching the house from the other direction. Two walked with arms around each other subdued and downcast. The third figure, a taller female, looked as though she was shepherding them along. A trickle of foreboding slid down his spine. He strode forward. A lamp outside his aunt's house gave faint illumination to the scene. What the devil are you two doing outside? I gave strict orders. He broke off, looking closer. What the hell happened to you? He said in quite a different voice. Rose had a burgeoning black eye, and Lily, the side of Lily's face was red and swelling. Even in the poor light, he could see it was going to be a nasty bruise. A cold rage filled him. Who did this to you? The tall female with them reached past him and rang the doorbell. It jangled in the dark house. There was some trouble at the talk. He swung around and saw it was that teacher, Miss Something or Other, with the mouth and the eyes. What talk? By members of the Female Reform Society. The Female Reform Society? Politics? Rose and Lily? He didn't believe it. You took them there, without so much as a... She didn't know we were there, Rose said swiftly. We went by ourselves. The door behind him opened, and Logan stood there, blinking. Golden light spilled out from inside, illuminating the girl's injuries more clearly. Rose's eye was swollen almost shut and darkening by the second, and her smooth, soft complexion was abraded in places. The side of Lily's face was dark and swelling, and her soft, vulnerable mouth had blood on it from a split lip. The girls flinched at Cal's expression. A man was bothering Lily, Rose began. Lily flushed. I tried to push him away, but he hit her, hit my little sister. Rose's voice was throbbing with rage. So Rose went for him, and then I tried to... Cal cut them off with a furious gesture. Political rallies were notorious for erupting in violence. The thought of his little sisters having to fight off some filthy thug filled him with horror. An ice-cold fury. Why the devil were you attending a political rally in the first place? No, don't bother. I don't want to know. The point is you were supposed to be safely in bed. How often have I warned you how dangerous it is to venture out on your own at night and... Rose burst out. You don't want us to have any fun. What's wrong with showing an interest? 
Rose, the teacher said quietly. Rose glanced at her. Sorry, Miss Westwood, and said not another word, not so much as a peep. Cal blinked. The teacher turned to Cal and said in a pleasant manner that barely disguised the acid beneath. Shall we continue to stand in the street hurling accusations and counter-accusations, or should the girls be taken in out of the cold and have their injuries tended to? Of course. Annoyed because she was right, damn it, and because he'd almost lost his temper and he never lost it. Cal gently pushed the girls inside and stood back to let their teacher enter before him. She gave him a brisk nod and turned to leave. Cal frowned. You're not coming in? Thank you, but no. Cal turned to the butler. See to the girls, Logan. Wake one of the maids to attend to them. A slice of steak will help Miss Rose's eye. Ungent and some ice for Miss Lily's bruises. But apply some leeches first if you have any. They'll stop the worst of the bruising. Uh, not leeches, Lily exclaimed. Cal ignored her. A hot bath for each of them, a cup of hot milk with honey and a little brandy, and then bed. He looked at the girls. I'll speak to you two tomorrow. Logan looked at him with a question in his eyes and Cal added, I will escort Miss Westwind home. West would, but there is no need, she began. He said tersely, Shall we stand in the street discussing it or... She gave him a look he couldn't read, then shrugged. If you insist, but there's really no... I insist, he offered his arm. To Cal's surprise, he didn't have to adjust his pace to hers as he did with most ladies. She walked with a long-limbed elegance, an easy, graceful stride. Their steps matched perfectly. She was tall for a lady. The top of her head was, under the ugly grey hat she wore, level with his eyes. Do you often attend political rallies? He asked her. She gave him a sidelong glance. When they interest me, she added after a pause. Why? Are you the kind of man who thinks that it's unfeminine for women, excuse me, ladies, to show an interest in politics? It was a challenge. Not at all, Cal said. I don't care what you're interested in. I was just making conversation. They walked in silence for the next few minutes. I want to thank you for bringing my sisters home. You're welcome. I was surprised that they thought a political talk worth sneaking out for. She glanced briefly at him. I suspect it was less the subject of the talk as the adventure of being out on their own at night. Her voice reminded him of a white wine he had drunk in Alsace once, crisp, dry, and a little astringent, but with unexpected depths and a fine, smooth aftertaste. They shouldn't be out at night at all, let alone unescorted, said Cal with feeling. I have utterly forbidden it. Which adds to the appeal of the adventure. Her calm acceptance of their misbehavior infuriated him. You shouldn't be out alone and unescorted at night either, he snapped, especially at a political rally. There were riots everywhere in England these days. People got hurt. Lord Ashenden, I am a spinster of six and twenty, and am quite my own mistress. I am not accountable to you or anyone else for my behavior. I know that, he growled, but your foolishness encourages others to imitate you. It was unfair and he knew it. 
and of course she wasn't the kind of female to let it pass. She snatched her hand off his arm. Do not try to put the blame on me. Your sisters had no idea I was planning to attend. I don't believe they had any plan to attend the rally either. They just saw the crowd and followed out of curiosity. She marched on a few steps in silence, but she was clearly building up a head of steam. Their adventurousness has nothing to do with me and everything to do with the way they've been, oh, cabined, cribbed, confined for the last year and for most of their lives. He might have known a teacher would resort to flinging Shakespeare around as if it were the clincher to every argument. She continued, And it's especially difficult for them to accept when they must dress entirely in black and are not allowed out because they're in mourning for their father and their brother. And yet you can go out carousing, wearing whatever you like, and... Carousing? He interrupted wrathfully. I'll give them carousing. I was dining quietly with a fellow officer, a friend I haven't seen in y- He broke off, noticing in the light of the lamp overhead a stain on her otherwise pale face. Stand still, he ordered, and when she glanced at him in surprise he caught her by the shoulders and turned her toward the light. A bruise was forming on her cheekbone, and dried blood made a dark crust around one of her nostrils. And now that he looked, drops of blood stained the front of her clothing. Damn it, you were injured too. Why didn't you say something? Flustered, she tried to move away. I'm perfectly all ra- Don't move, I said. He cupped her face gently in his hands, the better to examine her injuries or so he told himself. He'd left his gloves at Galbraith's hotel. His hands were bare but warm. Her skin was cool from the cold night air, silky and damp from the mist, pale and soft as moonlight. The darkening bruise on her cheekbone woke an anger in him that surprised him. He gently smoothed his thumb along her jawline. She stiffened. He cradled her face in the lightest of holds and studied her. She stood motionless, expressionless, a trapped doe braced to flee. She had only to pull away or say something and he would release her. He could feel the tension vibrating through her, but she said nothing. Her eyes watched wide and dark, twin pools of mystery, colorless in the night. She made not a sound. He could feel her breath, soft and warm. Her cool, silky skin was warming under his fingers. Her mouth. God help him, her mouth was dark and luscious and damp and enticing. Without thinking, he bent to taste it, a light, swift kiss that somehow lingered. She stiffened a moment then made a soft little sound and her mouth softened under his. She tasted of, oh Lord, rose petals and moonlight and innocence, and beneath it all lay heat, luscious womanly heat. Ravenous hunger went spiralling through him. He drew her closer to deepen the kiss, but she resisted, pushing back at him with a little sound of anger or distress. He released her instantly. She stumbled back a few unsteady paces. He put out a hand to support her, but she jerked away, one burning glance at him through wide, unreadable eyes, and she turned her back on him, taking deep, unsteady breaths that gradually calmed. He watched her, pulling her composure back together like a suit of armor. His own pulse was still pounding, his brain made no sense of what had just happened. He hadn't intended to kiss her. He barely knew her. She was a respectable woman, 
a teacher in a girl's school, practically a nun. Though that mouth didn't belong on any nun, and now the taste of her was in his blood. He should probably apologize, but he was damned if he would. He didn't regret a thing, only that it hadn't lasted nearly long enough, and that he'd been raised a gentleman. The uncivilized part of him wanted nothing less than to possess her, to plunder her sweetness, to ravish that lithe, slender body until they were both sated and... She turned back to face him, her expression smooth and calm as a pail of milk. Shall we move on? And, to shatter that damnable, ever-present composure, there was a passionate woman beneath it, he was sure. He had tasted it in her. His blood had leapt in recognition. But if that was how she wanted to play it, pretending the kiss had never happened, he would cooperate. He was, after all, a civilized man and dallying with innocence was playing with fire. He offered his arm and, after the faintest of hesitations, she took it. They walked on in silence. Around them the city slept. In the distance a vixen screamed. Overhead the clouds thickened and the darkness intensified. They passed a house where lights still burned, and she glanced in as they passed. A woman bent over a writing desk, writing busily. She's working late, he commented, seeking an innocent comment to break the tense silence. I shouldn't look, I know. It feels as if I'm invading their privacy, but if people don't draw their curtains. After a moment, she added, I'm always curious about how other people live as she would be, he reflected, seeing she had no home of her own, or so he assumed. Have you lived at the school long? It feels like most of my life, she said wryly. I was a pupil there as a girl. And you returned there to become a teacher? There was a story there, he was sure, and he wanted to hear it. But all she said was, Yes. They walked on. You should be proud of your sisters, you know, she began, and seeing he was about to snap her nose off for that piece of impertinence hurried on. Oh, not because they sneaked out without permission. Yes, they admitted that to me when I asked who was supposed to be escorting them, and that was very wrong of them. But the trouble wasn't really their fault. Political rallies are invariably violent, he growled. Not necessarily, but be that as it may, when Lily was in trouble, Rose flew to her sister's defense like a little wildcat, and then Lily tried to defend Rose. Of course, it's not the most ladylike. Ladylike, he exploded. No, it was not damned well ladylike. It was insane. What the devil kind of teacher are you anyway praising them for brawling in public? She withdrew her hand and gave him a long, cool look. The kind of teacher who thinks for herself and does not like to be cursed at. She said calmly and walked on. As for brawling in public... The girls were defending themselves, and each other. Would you prefer that one of your sisters abandon the other to preserve her own safety? She glanced at him and gave a little nod when she saw his expression. Of course not. Should they have simply fainted then, as society suggests is the proper ladylike response to upsets of various sorts? Again she glanced at his face. I agree. Had they been so foolish, they would have been trampled by the crowd milling around. But if they hadn't been so disobedient in the first place. Of course, but having done so, what were they to do when faced with trouble? They acted with courage and did their best with the limited skills and knowledge at their disposal. 
she finished crisply. Here we are at the school. No, no need to ring the bell. I have my own key. She took it from her reticule and let herself in. Thank you for your escort, Lord Ashenden. Good night. And before Cal could say a word, she shut the door gently in his face. He stared at the door a moment, cursing under his breath. Blasted woman had an answer for everything. Except a kiss. That she simply dismissed as if it had never happened. But he could still taste her. As he made his way back home through the deserted streets, rain started, a light patter of drops at first, but turning swiftly into a downpour. Cal broke into a run, but even so, by the time he reached Aunt Dottie's house, he was drenched. Of course, a perfect end to a perfect, dratted night. Chapter 5 Many women long for what eludes them, and like not what is offered them. Ovid Emmeline Westwood shut the door on Lord Ashenden, took three steps toward the staircase, sank onto the steps, and leaned against the carved wooden baluster. That kiss. She was still trembling inside from it, could still savour the dark, masculine taste of him, the heat that had streaked through her at the touch of his mouth like rich, liquid lightning. And oh, afterward, the effort of holding her composure, of making rational conversation in the wake of that. Somehow, thank goodness, she had. It was as if there were two Emmeline Westwoods. The rational, commonsensical M who was somehow able to walk and talk and sound perfectly composed, like a talking doll or one of those automatons she had seen at a scientific exhibition once. The other, the foolish, romantical, credulous M, was still reeling, dazed at her reaction to what she knew was just a simple kiss. The heat from it still echoed deep inside her. What had made him do it? For a few magical, entrancing moments, she had felt, well, imagined, but no. It was a ridiculously foolish Cinderella imagining, and she'd do well to put that nonsense right out of her mind. Rich, handsome earls didn't suddenly fall in love with plain spinster schoolteachers especially ones they'd met twice and knew nothing about. So why had he done it? Did he imagine she was open to such attentions? Was her respectability not obvious to him? Had she given him some kind of unwitting encouragement? Did he think, because she went out at night by herself attending political talks, getting involved in... The brawl. Was that it? Did he think because she had let herself get involved in such an unladylike contretemps that she was somehow fair game for casual masculine attentions of the improper sort? And if so, then what did that make his sisters? Was it one rule for daughters of the aristocracy and another for poor, unregarded schoolteachers? Of course it was. She ought to be insulted, ought to be angry. Instead, she had been entranced, and a small, a very small, rebellious, uncommonsensical, foolish part of her wanted to stay that way. She sat at the foot of the stairs for several minutes, hugging the smooth wood of the baluster, reliving and re-examining the kiss, asking herself questions she couldn't answer but answering them anyway. Eventually, the icy draughts coming from under the door cooled her heated thoughts and returned her to rationality. And the awareness that she had far more important things to worry about. If Miss Mallard was thinking about retiring, and it seemed as though the rumour was true after all, 
she'd probably hand the school over to her horrid nephew, who no doubt would sack them all and sell the school. That was something real to worry about. The other was just a kiss. Lord Ashenden probably hadn't given it another thought. M was overreacting, like an affection-deprived, over-imaginative spinster. Which was exactly what she was. She rose and walked quietly up the stairs, looked in on her students as she did each night to check that they were all in bed and sleeping soundly, and then climbed the last narrow flight of stairs to her own small room. If you didn't count the basement, Miss Mallard's seminary was arranged in order of ascending, austerity, she supposed was the nicest way to put it. The ground floor of the seminary set the tone of distinction Miss Mallard wanted the school to project. Her office, the parlour where prospective parents were wooed and given tea and biscuits and sometimes a glass of sherry and the spacious and elegant saloon used mainly for concerts and musical performances, were all on the ground floor and furnished in the first style of elegance. The higher you went, however, the classrooms on the next floor up, the boarders' bedchambers and sitting room above that, the plainer and more functional the surroundings until you reached, by increasingly narrow and steep stairs, the attic where M and the two other teachers who had the misfortune to be without any other income lodged along with the servants. M's room was the smallest. It was cramped, freezing in winter and hot in summer, but she considered herself blessed, partly because it was too small to share and she prized her privacy, but also because it was one of the only two attic rooms with a window. The window was small and square and got grimy very quickly with the smoke from the town below, but it looked out over her own private kingdom, the world beyond Bath. She loved that window, her own little eerie, loved looking across the rooftops of Bath to the green rolling hills beyond. Gazing out that small window never failed to lift her spirits, no matter what the weather. Right now there was no view, in the dark, with rain beating furiously down. She stripped off her gloves, watching the rain form silver rivulets across the glass and hearing it gurgle loudly down the drain pipes. Lord Ashenden would have walked home in that rain. Good, serve him right. No, she didn't mean that. It was good of him to walk her home. She folded her gloves one inside the other and remembered how he'd taken her hand and tucked it firmly into the crook of his arm. Men didn't usually notice her at all. Too old, too tall, too plain, too poor, practically invisible. And yet, those piercing, dark-rimmed, silvery eyes had noticed her, had scanned her face so intently, the breath had simply disappeared from her body. Warm, strong, bare hands had cupped her face as if she were some delicate creature. Her heart had started galloping in her chest. She told herself to be sensible, that it was nothing, simple good manners to show concern. They'd stood so close she could see the fine-grained pores of his skin, the shadow of masculine bristles that darkened his jaw and a pale, almost invisible scar along the bottom of his chin, a sabre cut or a bayonet injury from the war. And then... When he'd slowly lowered his mouth to hers, gently, so lightly at first, and then all thoughts had been driven from her brain. There was only his mouth, moving over hers, searching, tasting. Oh, for heaven's sake, stop dwelling on it, foolish woman. It was a whim, an impulse of the moment. He was probably a rake. She hung up her cloak 
laid out her nightgown across the bed and started to strip off her clothes, as fast as she could because the room was cold and getting colder. Rose and Lily used to talk about their uncle, the soldier hero, seeming both proud and fond of him. A shame they seemed so hostile to each other now. But then, people who had a family often took it for granted. She slipped into bed and breathed a thankful sigh as her frozen toes encountered a solid patch of warmth. One of the maids, probably Millie, had slipped a hot brick into her bed. Oh, blessed, blessed heat. Thank you, Millie. She pressed her feet against the cloth-wrapped brick and waited for them to defrost. She had had a little adventure, that was all. Something to recall with pleasure, without regret. She had lied when she had claimed she was her own mistress. Usually when M went anywhere in public, she was accompanied by the other teachers who lived in, Miss Thwaites and Miss Johnston, both of whom moved at a snail's pace. Neither of them had been interested in attending a talk by the Female Reform Society, so she'd slipped out alone, and not for the first time. Miss Thwaites and Miss Johnston had spent most of their adult lives at the Mallard Seminary. Sometimes, when M lay in her bed, hearing the murmur of the two older ladies talking, the thought that she was going to end up just like them made her almost desperate. But what else could she do? Tonight, she'd had a small adventure, she reminded herself. She had attended a political talk, gotten caught up in a fight, walked alone after midnight through the deserted streets of Bath on the arm of a tall, handsome gentleman, and been thoroughly, magically kissed. All of the delights of scandalous behaviour and none of the consequences. If anyone had seen her walking alone with Lord Ashenden at that hour, the repercussions would be unpleasant at the very least. Miss Mallard would be far from pleased. The teachers at Miss Mallard's seminary had to be like the wife of Caesar, beyond reproach, on pain of instant dismissal. But nobody had seen them. M grinned to herself as she snuggled down in the bedclothes and waited for the heat to spread. She was as rebellious at heart as Rose and Lily, just older and wiser and more discreet. Her sheets smelled faintly of lavender and roses. M collected the flowers in season, dried them, and filled little muslin bags of the mix to keep her linen smelling sweet. On chilly nights like tonight, it was a pleasant reminder of summer, and gave out echoes of her childhood. The smell of happiness. Pity she couldn't bag or bottle the smell of Lord Ashenden to remember him by. She closed her eyes remembering his cologne, sharp and spicy and a little exotic, and the faint scent of wood smoke and tobacco in his clothing and the underlying scent of man, dark and virile and enticing, not like any kind of man she was familiar with. Grimes, the school porter, the only man allowed in the building, smelled of coal dust and snuff and beer and unwashed old man. Miss Mallard's nephew reeked of sweat and cheap pomade. The vicar smelled of starch and soap and peppermint drops, and after church when he stood too close, there was usually a whiff of sweet dark communion wine. Lord Ashenden had smelled a little of brandy, not reeking or anything, just a hint on his breath and in his mouth. She wouldn't have recognised it, except that Papa had drunk brandy and the scent had called him to mind. Her eyes flew open. Brandy, of course! Lord Ashenden had been drinking. He'd been out with his friend. He'd said so. So he was drunk. Not so drunk you'd notice. He held his liquor well. But it explained everything.
He'd no doubt kissed her because he was drunk, and she was female, and there under his nose. And because he'd decided she was the kind of female who attended political events and got into brawls, and who thought nothing of walking alone after midnight. Mystery solved. M pulled the bedclothes tighter around her. But despite the warm brick, despite the blankets and her warm flannel nightgown, the cold crept through her. Miss Westwood! Miss Westwood! Someone was knocking on M's door. She blinked blearily awake. It seemed only a few minutes since she'd gone to bed, but it was light outside. Miss Westwood! Come in. The door opened and a maid entered, carrying a jug of warm water covered with a cloth. Oh, Millie, thank you for that hot brick last. Never mind that. I mean, you're very welcome, miss. But the du- Uh, Miss Mallard wants to see you right away. Before breakfast, she said. M flung back the bedclothes. Any idea why? No, miss, just that it was important. I brung you some hot water to wash in so hurry. Hot water, bless you, Millie. May you be swept off your feet by a rich and handsome man who will adore you and indulge your every wish. Which was Millie's dream. She had confided in M when she first came to Bath. She was certainly pretty enough. M washed and dressed with all haste. What could Miss Mallard want with her at this hour? It was most unusual. A thought struck her as she was fastening her garters. Had Miss Mallard or one of her cronies spotted M at the event last night? Or walking unchaperoned with Lord Ashenden? She checked her appearance in a small looking glass. There was a darkening patch on her left cheekbone. Her nose was a bit red and one side was very slightly swollen, but it wasn't very noticeable, she hoped. She dusted her face with a little rice powder. It was forbidden for the staff at Miss Mallard's to use cosmetic products of any sort, but Miss Mallard's eyesight was fading and M hoped she wouldn't notice. And if she did, well she would blame the wardrobe door. She hurried downstairs. Miss Teal, Miss Mallard's sour-faced assistant, met her at the foot of the stairs. She jerked her head at M. In the office. M knocked and was admitted. She sat, preserving an air of calm, and waited. Miss Mallard was in the process of writing what looked like a letter. She blotted it, set her pen aside, and said, Good morning, Miss Westwood. I'll come straight to the point. M braced herself. As you know, the headmistress continued, I am planning to retire at the end of the term. M nodded, her throat suddenly dry. It wasn't about her outing last night. From the expression on Miss Mallard's face, it was something much more serious. Miss Mallard admitted to sixty years on this earth, but most who knew her privately agreed she was closer to seventy. Her desire to retire was no secret. It had all of the staff worried. What if the school closed? Where would they go? M had nothing to fall back on, no home, no family, nothing. She folded her hands in her lap and waited for the axe to fall. I have given much thought to the future of this establishment. Miss Mallard removed her pince-nez and polished them meditatively with a soft cloth. I've given my life to the education of young girls, and I fancy I have achieved a wonderful record— Three duchesses, two marchionesses, five countesses, six viscountesses. M wanted to scream. She'd heard this litany before. All the staff and most of the pupils probably knew it by heart. M always wanted to end it with, and a partridge in a pear tree.
which is a record I think no other establishment for young ladies can better. No, indeed, M murmured, and so I am reluctant to let the school simply close. M held her breath, and although my nephew, Mr. Edgar Mallard, will inherit the school on my death, he could not, of course, run it. A gentleman running a seminary for young ladies, the very idea. She gave a girlish giggle. M forced a smile. When would she get to the point? Was she going to sell the school, and if so, to whom, and when? And what would happen to the staff? New brooms often want to sweep clean. They could all be out on the street in a matter of weeks. Miss Mallard replaced her glasses. I have given much thought to who would run it. Of the permanent staff, Miss Thwaites and Miss Johnston are too old. They will no doubt retire themselves shortly. Miss Clegg is too young and flighty, and besides, she leaned forward and said in a lowered voice, she is hoping to be married. Well, we can't have that sort of thing, can we? No, indeed. So the choice is obvious. You shall become the headmistress after me. M blinked. Me? She had expected to hear that some outsider was going to be appointed. You want me to become the new headmistress? Miss Mallard gave a brisk nod, clearly pleased by M's amazement. I cannot think of anyone better. You have the finest education any woman can have a mallard education. You have the girls under excellent control, and as the daughter of a baronet, you have the birth and background that will reassure our aristocratic parents that their daughters are in excellent hands. Miss Mallard, I don't know what to say. Excitement filled her. Oh, what she could make of this place. You don't need to say anything, I am writing to my nephew this morning to inform him. He has been pressing me for a decision for some time. She indicated the writing materials in front of her. Of course, he will continue to oversee the accounts and so on. But that kind of thing is best left to gentlemen anyway, I find. They have the head for such things while we ladies have our minds on more elegant matters. M smiled and nodded, her mind spinning with plans. First on the agenda, once she became headmistress, would be a battle with Edgar Mallard over expenditure. He was the most parsimonious creature and begrudged any expenditure that was not directly related to the needs of the pupils or impressing their parents. For a school that prided itself on its elegance and quality, it paid its staff disgracefully and pinched pennies appallingly. Edgar Mallard's motto seemed to be, if it wasn't visible to the parents or pupils, it didn't matter. M had battled with him before over such things as the servants' and teachers' quarters, the quality of the food, the provision of heating, wages, and other matters he considered unworthy of his attention or his money. When Miss Mallard retired, M vowed things would change, and her school would not be judged by whom her pupils married, but by what they learned, and what they did with their lives, marriage or not. Her girls would have choices. They'd be taught to think, not merely obey and be decorative. Oh yes, she had plans. The bell rang for breakfast, and Miss Mallard returned to her papers and waved vaguely toward the door, indicating that the interview was over. M. rose. Thank you, Miss Mallard. I'm very honoured by your trust in me. I promise you I will do my very best to ensure that Miss Mallard's seminary for the daughters of gentlemen will continue to flourish long into the future. She stepped into the hallway in a daze. Headmistress! But was brought back to reality by the thundering on the stairs as thirty-five hungry schoolgirls headed for breakfast. 
Girls, girls, walk, don't run. You are not a herd of elephants. All evidence to the contrary. Giggling, they moderated their speed and walked down the stairs as they were supposed to, two by two at a ladylike pace. M supervised, smiling. She loved these girls, so young and lively, full of hopes and dreams and with such a zest for life. She wanted to embrace them all. She had a future to look forward to now. Cal found the breakfast room deserted when he came down next morning. Logan brought his coffee in. The girls settle in all right last night? Indeed they did, my lord. We carried out your instructions, and the stake helped with Miss Rose's eye. There, uh, there were no leeches available for Miss Lily's bruises. Cal snorted. In other words, she begged you not to put those nasty, slimy creatures on her. Logan gave him a rueful smile. It's those big grey eyes of hers. I know. We males have no defence against them, do we? He took a sip of his coffee. It's a pity. Leeches might be disgusting, but there's nothing like them for limiting bruising. Still, too late now. Are the girls up yet? Logan shook his head. Still a bed, my lord. They were very tired. Hiding from him more like, Cal thought. I hope we didn't disturb Aunt Dottie last night with all the coming and goings. Not at all, my lord. She slept like a baby the whole night through. Sleeps very well, does Miss Dottie. Now how could you possibly know? But Logan had already left the room, leaving Cal to brood over his excellent coffee. The situation with the girls could not go on. Bad enough they kept sneaking out at night. But now they'd been injured, and it could have been much worse. Logan returned in a few minutes, bearing a covered silver dish, which he placed before Cal. Why didn't you stop them, Logan? I trusted you to keep an eye on them. Damn it, can I not even leave this house for a minute? Logan removed the lid, revealing an appetizing-looking plate of ham, fried eggs, and mushrooms. I am a servant in this house, Lord Ashenden, he said pointedly. It is my job to obey the wishes of the inhabitants, not control them even if I could. That, my lord, is your job. And he sailed from the room. He was right, damn him. Cal moodily addressed his breakfast. It was excellent, as was the coffee, but it didn't cheer him up any. Logan returned a few minutes later, bearing a silver salver. The post, my lord. Cal leafed through the letters and spotted one addressed in a sprawling, stylish hand. Aunt Agatha. He seized it eagerly and broke the seal. It was short and pithy. My dear Ashenden, I received your letter, and what a piece of impertinence it was. Do you imagine I have nothing better to do than to rush down to Bath, of all dreary and unfashionable places, to relieve you of your responsibilities. Do you think I have no life of my own? They are your half-sisters. Deal with them. I said no good would come of your father's second marriage. No fool like an old fool, and now see how right I was. Your loving aunt, Agatha, Lady Salter. His loving aunt, ha! Huh. He crushed the letter and hurled it into the fire. Damn, damn, and double damn. He had been counting on Aunt Agatha. What the hell was he going to do now? Aunt Dottie couldn't control a flea. He couldn't lock the girls up, much as he'd like to. And for some reason he couldn't understand, they seemed to have no fear of disobeying him. But he couldn't stay here indefinitely watching them. He had an assassin to track down, the bastard that killed eight people so far. 
that they knew of, including Bentley. The last time Cal had seen Bentley alive, he was full of idealistic notions about building a fairer, better world, so proud of being appointed to such a responsible position, determined to bring honour to his country. If only Cal had spotted the assassin on the roof earlier. One minute sooner, and he could have shouted a warning. After the funeral, he had written to Bentley's widowed mother, one of the hardest letters he had ever written. He had called for another pot of coffee and sipped it slowly. What had Galbraith suggested last night? A sort of governess companion chaperone type of female, with a bit of watchdog thrown in. Cal sat up. He knew one of that sort of female. He'd walked one home that very night. He'd kissed her. But that was an aberration. The brandy, after all that wine, had been a mistake. He didn't think he'd drunk that much, but obviously he had, and it had gone to his head. She had gone to his head. Those eyes, that mouth. Nonsense. He had been too long without female companionship, that was all. He had a better use for her than that. He remembered how, at the school, she had effortlessly quelled the gushings of that girl, lavender thingy watsit of the Somerset thingy watsits. More to the point, he recalled how last night, with one word, one word, She'd stopped Rose in mid-tirade. Rose! He was a fool not to have seen it at once. Miss Wind-whatever, she was the obvious solution. He could go off and do what he had to, leaving the girls with her knowing she could control their wilder starts, and that they liked her. She had some odd ideas, of course, but as her employer, he'd soon set her straight on those. As long as she kept her opinions to herself, she was welcome to think whatever she wanted. Best of all, he'd be off doing the job he was supposed to do, and he wouldn't be there to be tempted by her mouth. Not that he couldn't control himself. The brandy had been the problem last night, and he rarely overindulged. Who needed Aunt Agatha? The solution had been right under his very nose all this time. Miss Windrush! He rang the bell and called for his coat, hat, and gloves. He was going out. Chapter 6 If one scheme of happiness fails, human nature turns to another. If the first calculation is wrong, we make a second better. Jane Austen, Mansfield Park. I wish to speak to Miss Windrush, Cal told the Gorgon, who answered the door. There is no Miss Windrush here, she made to push the door shut. Cal stuck his boot in it. I might have mistaken her name. Tall, thin female, brown hair, about so high he indicated with his hand. One of your teachers. You mean Miss Westwood? That's the one. The Gorgon sniffed. Teachers are not allowed to have gentlemen callers. I'm not a gentleman caller, Cal snapped, shoving the remembrance of a certain kiss from his mind. I'm here on business, school business. The woman considered him a moment. Very well. I'll have to ask Miss Mallard. Wait here. She pointed to the chairs in the hallway. He told Miss Mallard when she condescended to see him that he merely wished to ask Miss Westwood for advice about his sisters. I noticed her on my last visit and liked the way she handled the girls in her charge, and my sisters speak well of her so I thought she might be able to offer me some advice on how to handle them. He lied. He wasn't going to admit he was going to try to poach one of her teachers. Miss Mallard gave her gracious assent, and the Gorgon headed upstairs to fetch Miss Westwood. 
she came down the stairs looking puzzled and a little wary. Lord Ashenden, is everything all right? A delicate flush suffused her creamy complexion, and he had an immediate rush of recollection of how she had felt in his arms, and how she had tasted. It wasn't important, he reminded himself. All that counted was that she could silence Rose with a single word. You can talk in there, the Gorgon told Cal, and pointed out an elegant sitting room. And leave the door open. I'll be out here. Ghastly woman, Cal muttered. He closed the door and pulled out a chair for Miss Westwood. She sat gracefully, her hands folded in her lap, her eyes meeting his steadily. He scanned her face for signs of injury. He could see a faint sign of the bruised cheekbone, but she'd covered it with some kind of cosmetic. Her nose was slightly swollen, but otherwise she looked as he had remembered. Elegant, composed, intriguing. Silence filled the room. Her flush deepened, and Cal realized he had been staring at her mouth. Again. You are recovered from your mishap? He realized she might take that to mean his kiss, so added hastily, the altercation at the political meeting, I mean. Quite recovered, thank you. She moistened her lips, and he found his gaze riveted to her damp, rosy mouth again. Damn. He rose, walked to the fireplace, cleared his throat, and addressed himself to her left eyebrow. Before I explain the purpose of my visit today, I must apologize for my behavior last night. It seems I had a little too much to drink, and my actions crossed the bounds of... of gentlemanly behavior. Her eyes met his for a long moment. They seemed to see into his very soul. She gave a little nod. I thought it must be that. Apology accepted. She glanced down and smoothed her skirt with long, slender fingers. The delicate rose flush faded. Cal stiffened. Was she implying he had been clumsy? It was an unusual circumstance, he began. Are the girls all right? she asked in a brisk, teacherly voice. Clearly the subject of the kiss was closed. He didn't know whether he was relieved or annoyed. Yes, yes, of course, at least I haven't seen them yet. They're still a bed, but they'll be all right. She frowned slightly. Still in bed at this hour? Avoiding me, Cal said putting off the moment where they'll have to face the music. You mean you're going to punish them? Tell me, I'm curious as to what you plan to do. Well, that's just it, he said, grateful for the opening. I don't know how the devil, excuse me, how the deuce, I can punish them. Nothing I say or do seems to have the slightest effect. Lily cries at the slightest criticism. Crocodile tears or the real thing. What? Lily has the ability to cry at will. If she's crying big crystal tears with no other sign of distress, they're crocodile tears. If she's weeping noisily, red-faced and gulping, her distress is real. So which is it? He looked at her in amazement. I knew you were the person to ask. What do they pay you here? She stiffened. I beg your pardon? What business is it of yours? Whatever it is, I'll double it if you'll come and work for me. Her brows, fine and elegantly winged, rose. Work for you as what, governess, companion, duena? He nodded, relieved she hadn't added mistress. All of those... My aunt is utterly unable to control the girls, and I need someone responsible to take charge. Not you, I presume. No, I have commitments elsewhere to which I must return. 
So what do you say? Will you take them on? No, thank you. She said it without the slightest hesitation, as if she didn't even need to think it over. What? But I offered you double your wage. It was a handsome offer. Yes, but you want me to give up a permanent position here in exchange for a short-term position. Moreover, from what you tell me, I'd need to watch over your sisters twenty-four hours a day, seven days a week, whereas now I get a half-day off a week and two evenings free to do whatever I want. He frowned. He couldn't afford to give her time off. Who knew what the girls would get up to if she was off somewhere having a free evening? I'd pay you extra not to take those free times. She appeared to consider it, then shook her head. Your sisters will marry in a year or two, and then where would I be? Out of a job and unemployed. She folded her hands. So thank you for the very generous offer, but I must decline it. Blast! He stood and took a few impatient strides around the room. I can't change your mind? No. She rose. Will that be all? Sit down. She stiffened and he said, Sorry, I forgot myself. I have the habit of barking out orders sometimes. I mean, stay a little while longer, please. I shan't change my mind. I understand I won't press you, I promise. She hesitated, then resumed her seat. He sat down opposite her, ran his fingers through his hair and thought about what to say. Look, you know my sisters better than I do. I truly want what's best for them, but I freely admit I've been a soldier most of my adult life and I'm out of my depth with young girls. I would welcome some advice from an expert. Her brows rose. There was a short silence. You've surprised me, Lord Ashenden. I don't know many men. No, make that any men who would seek advice from a woman. He shrugged. Ten years in the army teaches a man to take advantage of local expert knowledge no matter what the source. She gave him a long level look, then gave that brisk little nod he was coming to recognize. Very well. Your sisters are bright. They're young. And they're bored. I know that, but their behavior is... Look at the way they sneaked out last night, and it's not the first time. What did you expect? That they'd be happy to spend a year and now another year wearing unrelieved black with limited society, attending repetitious and dull social events with mostly elderly and infirm companionship? Oh yes, they told me all about how their lives had become since leaving the seminary, what sort of society is that for lively young ladies? From what I understand, a visit to the pump room, chatting with octogenarians, or a walk in the park is the highlight of their day. Is it any wonder they're rebelling? She rolled her eyes, those very fine, sage-green eyes. Her pale complexion was now a delicate pink. Indignation rather than... Embarrassment? Whatever it was, it suited her. You could change that if you accepted my offer of employment. I told you, it's out of the question. And please don't try to shift your responsibility onto me. She had claws, this teacher. So what do you advise? Give them something real to occupy them, something challenging and interesting. Something useful that's worthwhile doing. Something fun. He tried to imagine what that might be. My aunt knits. She made a scornful sound. Would you be happy to sit indoors and knit and sew all day and most evenings? 
No, of course not. But men are different. She curled her lip. They certainly are. They get to choose what they do. Not always, he said. Interesting. The passion with which she was arguing suggested he had hit a nerve. Most of the decisions that materially affected my life were made by my father without any consultation as to my preferences. I didn't choose to be sent away to school at the age of seven, and I was told at the age of about ten that I would be joining the army when I grew up. As a younger son, it was that or the church, and my father had no time for priests. She opened her mouth, and he added, and then I was sent abroad to fight at the age of seventeen. And if you think any soldier gets to choose anything, you've got rats in your attic. It also wasn't his choice to inherit the title and the responsibilities that went with it, but he doubted she'd have any sympathy for that. Most people expected him to be thrilled by the acquisition of a title and a fortune. Most people had no idea. I suppose you're right, she said after a moment, but it seems to me you must have enjoyed your army life. Is that not what you're so anxious to return to? Or am I mistaken? You're not mistaken, but it's not for my own pleasure. I have work to do. Important work. Government work. Yes, of course, she agreed with deceptive smoothness. And compared with important government work, what does the welfare and happiness of your sisters matter? Forgive me, I meant your half-sisters. The implication that they mattered less to him because they were only half-sisters was infuriating. Vixen. She had the ability to deliver the sharpest of insults in the subtlest of ways. It reminded him of... You taught my sister Rose quite a bit, didn't you? He put a slight emphasis on the word sister. She frowned at the abrupt change of subject, but responded coolly. I taught both your sisters. Did you indeed? Then why can't Lily read? You seem competent enough. It was deliberate provocation. He was interested to see how she responded. She met his gaze squarely. I don't know. Don't know or don't care. Her eyes flashed. Ah, that touched a nerve. Her mouth tightened. Lily is a dear, sweet girl who has tried harder to learn than any pupil I have ever known. I have tried every method of instruction I know, and some unorthodox methods as well. It is a mystery to me, and a tragedy, that she can still barely read or write. You're telling me my sister is stupid? She is not at all stupid, she said fiercely. But for some reason known only to God, she cannot learn to read or write. Can she count? There was that flash again. She can count, she said evenly. She cannot, however, do simple sums. Not on paper. Anything else she cannot do? She gets her left and right mixed up. Is that all? She glared at him. Isn't that enough for the poor child to deal with? He shrugged and got up to leave. It need not be a huge disadvantage in the long run. Most men don't look for brains in a wife, and as you say, Lily is very sweet-natured. Miss Westwood clenched her fists. Lord Ashenden. He waited, one brow raised. Lily is affectionate, intelligent, loyal, and hard-working. Only a bully punishes a person for what she cannot help. He gave her a flinty look. I don't bully my sisters, Miss Westwood. I'm trying to help them. 
She looked him straight in the eye. No, you're trying to get them off your hands with the least amount of trouble to yourself. It was just close enough to the bone to have Cal's own fists clenching. Damned impertinent schoolmistress. He gave her a curt nod. Good day to you, madam. Well, M sat for a moment after Lord Ashenden had left. Double her current wage. It was a very generous offer. Had Miss Mallard not decided this morning to offer her the headmistress position, she might have accepted his job. His job. When the message had come to her this morning that Lord Ashenden was downstairs asking to speak to her, all kinds of thoughts had rushed through her mind. Foolish thoughts, scandalous thoughts. And when he'd stood there at the beginning, staring at her mouth, her heart started thumping in her chest when she thought, wondered if he was going to ask her to become... But of course, she was foolish even thinking it. Luckily, she hadn't said a thing, because he'd apologized for the kiss. It was the brandy, after all, and made her a job offer. Governess, companion, duenna, to his sisters. Which was so much more reasonable and practical and respectable than anything M was thinking of. Really. She was as bad as the girls, reading more into any gentleman's attentions than existed. Thank goodness Miss Mallard had chosen this morning of all mornings to make her plans for the school clear, because if she hadn't, M might have accepted Lord Ashenden's job, and with all these foolish yearnings she was subject to lately, anything could have happened. If he was a rake, and if he thought to combine the role of governess chaperone with the extra position of mistress, well, if she was honest with herself, M might be tempted. And that would never do. Rose and Lily came downstairs shortly after noon, subdued but eyeing him warily. Rose's eye was badly swollen, a mere slit of red-rimmed silver blue in a sea of nasty-looking dark purple. Several other abrasions marked her face. The whole side of Lily's face was swollen and bruised, and her mouth was lopsided. She could barely talk. Cal was appalled. He had intended to read them the riot act, but at the sight of their poor battered faces, his little sister's, he was filled with a mix of helpless anger, belated protectiveness, and shame, because he was supposed to be looking after them. Aunt Dottie came with them, clucking distressfully and fussing over the girls. She gave Logan a dozen contradictory orders, sending for various remedies, demanding something be done, and ordering the girls' favorite dishes for luncheon, treating them like little heroines which they damn well weren't. They'd sneaked out against his specific orders, and now they'd reaped the rewards of their disobedience and recklessness. Maybe they'd learned their lesson at last. He ought to be pleased. But looking at the dreadful mess some unknown swine had made of his sister's face, Cal couldn't bring himself to be pleased at all. He wanted to murder the bastard who dared to lay hands on them. If you'd told me you wanted to go out last night, I would have... What? Taken us? Rose snorted. To a political meeting about working women? I might. You never mentioned you had any interest in politics. Rose shrugged. We don't. It was the first meeting we've been to, and it was boring, wasn't it, Lily? We were all ready to leave, but then things livened up. Rose tried for an airy grin, but winced in pain. But what happened? Aunt Dottie exclaimed. Tell me, how did this dreadful thing happen? This man tried to touch me, personally, 
and when I objected, he got nasty, Lily said, her words muffled because of her swollen mouth. Nasty? He hit Lily, gave her a backhander across the face, and did that to her. Rose indicated Lily's swollen face. So then I punched him. Rose, you punched someone? Aunt Dottie exclaimed in horror. Rose said in a hard little voice, He deserved it, Aunt Dottie. Nobody hurts my sister and gets away with it. She flexed her hand gingerly and added with satisfaction, I bet I'm not the only one with a black eye this morning, but I wish I'd broken his nose. Both girls had swollen, scraped, and badly bruised knuckles on their right hands. Cal rounded the table, picked up Rose's hand, and gently examined it. Rose watched him with an odd expression. You're lucky you didn't break your hand, he told her as he released it. Aunt Dottie moaned. Whatever has happened to my sweet young nieces, punching people, a vulgar public brawl? He examined Lily's hand next. Luckily, neither girl seemed to have broken any bones. You're lucky too. Lily? Do you mean, don't tell me you hit a perfect stranger too? Aunt Dottie said in failing accents. No, she punched Miss Westwood, Rose said, her good eye brimming with amusement. What? Cal stiffened. That was how the teacher had been hurt. Lily had punched her? Aunt Dottie's eyes almost popped. That nice young teacher? Lily, why on earth would you punch dear Miss Westwood? I thought you liked her. I do. It was an accident. Lily awkwardly removed her hand from Cal's light grip. I was trying to stop the man from hurting Rose. But Lily, a lady should never... Aunt Dottie shook her head, lost for words. The teacher's words came back to him. Should they have simply fainted then, as society suggests is the proper ladylike response? The teacher had never breathed a word of this last night, protecting Lily from his disapproval. Was he such an ogre? No one could blame Lily for resisting molestation. Of course, Rose would rush to her sister's defense. He'd seen how protective she was of her younger sister. And Rutherford's naturally fought back. Rose glared at Cal as if it were his fault don't look at me like that, Cal. Nobody hurts my sister and gets away with it. I'm glad I did it. I showed him. Rose, you cannot be boasting about this dreadful thing, surely, Aunt Dottie said, appalled. That's enough, Rose. You're upsetting your aunt, Cal said curtly. He resumed his seat. I think we've heard quite enough about this contretemps, girls. Now, drink your soup before it gets cold. They finished the meal in silence, more or less. Aunt Dottie began to expostulate once or twice, but Cal silenced her with a look. There is an excellent play starting at the theatre tomorrow night, Aunt Dottie began when they had finished their meal. Perhaps... No. Cal slammed his fist on the table, making them and the cutlery jump. They broke the rules and they must be punished for it. Oh, but... No, Aunt Dottie, they're not showing nearly enough regret or repentance for my liking. Rose is almost proud of her disgraceful behavior. The fact that he was also proud of her was beside the point. She had to learn. If I'd been a boy, you would have been proud of me for defending my sister, Rose muttered. But you aren't a boy, Cal snapped. You're not even a lady. Aunt Dottie gasped, but Cal went on. You girls know very well you were in the wrong. 
sneaking out at night against my express orders. You probably think you have been punished enough, but... Oh, Cal, I must insist, Aunt Dottie. They need to learn their lesson. For the next two weeks, they're not to attend any function, public or private. They're not to have any outings at all, not even a walk in the park. They shall remain inside the house and... He tried to think of what they should do. And ponder the wages of disobedience and reckless behavior. Rose snorted. What? Goaded, he turned on her. You mean we cannot even go to the pump room? She put her hands to her face in mock distress. Oh, dear, that will be a hardship. Rose, her aunt began. Well, as if we even want to go out anywhere looking like this, she said scornfully. You couldn't make me leave the house if you tried, brother dear. Come along, Lily. Let's read the next chapter of our book. Cal gritted his teeth. It was a miracle someone hadn't already strangled Rose. You shouldn't provoke him, Rose. Lily climbed up onto her bed. Rose made an impatient gesture. I can't help it. He rubs me up the wrong way. He hasn't been near us for years, didn't even write to us while he was away, and now he comes back throwing his weight around and ordering us about as if... as if we're soldiers in his horrid command. He is head of the family, Lily pointed out. Rose snorted. Henry never came near us either, and he wasn't away at war, being shot at all the time. Henry was a lazy, selfish pig. And Cal? He's selfish and mean and thoughtless. He was lovely when we were little, Lily said. I remember him taking us for piggyback rides on his back over and over as often as we wanted. Yes, well, he's changed then, hasn't he? There might be reasons for that, Lily said quietly. We cannot know what he endured. War is a terrible thing. Rose hunched a careless shoulder. He wasn't wounded. That we know of, not all wounds show. Rose turned on her. If it was so terrible for him over there, why is he so eager to go back? He doesn't care about us, Lily. He just wants to stick us in a safe place and get back to his life. He doesn't care how we feel or what we want. She paced to the window and gazed out into the grey afternoon. Two weeks stuck in here, Lil. I'm going to go mad. But you said... I know, but I won't give him the satisfaction. He's trying, Rose, Lily said quietly. He certainly is extremely trying. For the next week or so, while the girls were recovering from their injuries, and because there was no danger of them sneaking out and showing their bruised and battered faces in public, Cal took the opportunity to check another four names on his list. He travelled to Frome and Midsummer, down to Bruton, and then to the other side of Glastonbury, all to no avail. The longest any of the men had been absent from home in the last five years was a week, and that was to attend a fair. It was disappointing, but at least he was narrowing the field. He returned to Bath to find a letter from his lawyer that threatened to turn everything upside down. A disturbing rumour has come to my ears. I hesitate to repeat gossip, and would stress that I have not yet been able to verify it, but there is talk that your brother Henry left a child, a living child. Cal wasn't surprised. It would be a bastard, of course. Given Henry's proclivities, he wouldn't be surprised if there were more. But a bastard child was easily dealt with, settle an allowance on the mother, and make provision for the child's future, all very straightforward. 
nothing for a lawyer to get his drawers in a knot about. He turned the letter around to read the cross-writing. In the course of my inquiries, I met a fellow who, on finding I represented the new Lord Ashenden, spoke with some heat of Henry's son. George, who I gather is something of a wild child. According to this fellow, who I must say seems quite respectable, your brother begot this lad by an earlier marriage. I stress that I have no actual evidence of such a marriage and can only conclude that if it did take place, your brother for some reason kept it secret. Of course, I have set inquiries in motion, but if this fellow is correct and your brother Henry did leave a son, a legitimate son, well, you will perceive the implications for yourself. Cal did indeed. But why would Henry have made a secret marriage? There was no reason for it to be secret. Unless it was bigamous, that was a possibility. Henry had married Maria just over sixteen years ago when Cal was twelve and Henry was just two and twenty. Maria had died not quite two years ago and the babe with her. If this boy was being talked of as a wild child, he would have to be at least fourteen or fifteen. It didn't make sense. Cal returned to deciphering the letter. My informant is from Alderton, a village some fifteen miles north of Cheltenham, and I understand the child resides nearby at a place called Willowbank Farm. The legitimacy or otherwise of this boy needs to be established as quickly as possible. Rumours are dangerous things and estate affairs could be held up for months, if not for years, if there is a dispute. I hesitate to ask your lordship to go in person, but I am off to Canterbury. Finding your brother's will is of the first urgency, and the fewer who know about this boy the better. In the meantime, should you require a legal opinion when you get there, may I recommend an old acquaintance of my father's, Mr. Samuel Chiswick, a lawyer, semi-retired, who lives in Alderton. He is both reliable and discreet and should be able to advise you. Cal refolded the letter. Odds on the child would be a bastard. Phipps was going on hearsay and rumour, which was ridiculous for a man of the law. But if the boy did turn out to be legitimate, he would be the new Lord Ashenden, which would free Cal from the rest of the nonsense. He could make the necessary arrangements and get back to his life. Besides, he had another two names to check near Cheltenham, two birds with one stone. He sent for Hawkins and instructed him to have the carriage ready first thing in the morning. They were going to Alderton, a small village north of Cheltenham. He spoke to the girls before he left and extracted a promise from them that while he was away they wouldn't venture out at night unescorted. They weren't happy about it, but when he promised to take them out somewhere exciting when he returned, they reluctantly agreed. Word of a Rutherford Are you responsible for that hell-born brat? I beg your pardon? Cal said in freezing accents. He'd just stepped down from the carriage, which had pulled up in the main street of Alderton outside the lawyer's office, and this fellow had taken one look and rushed up to him. The man looked from Cal to the crest on the carriage and back again. You've got the look of a Rutherford all right, and that's the Ashenden crest. You're the new Lord Ashenden, ain't you? Cal gave him a cold stare. He had no intention of explaining himself to this mannerless oaf. Sorry, should have introduced myself, Gresham, the man said unfazed. Local squire, master of the hunt, for all the good it does me. His small blue eyes gleamed angrily in his meaty red face. He turned and beckoned to a tall fellow in baggy breeches and muddy top boots. The new Lord Ashenden, he told his friend, and jerked his chin toward the crest on the carriage. The tall man gave his friend a startled look, glanced at the crest and turned to Cal with a warm smile. 
Welcome to Gloucestershire, my lord. We are delighted to see you here at last, simply delighted. And before Cal knew it, the fellow was pumping his hand with enthusiasm. Planning to remove the little wretch from the district, I hope, the squire interrupted. Haven't had a proper hunt in years, much longer, and someone's going to shoot the brat. Cal stiffened. Not your fault, we know that, Muddy Boots said hastily. Blame your brother, never showed any interest in the child. Not young George's fault, not really. A child needs a firm hand on the bridle. The squire snorted. Firm hand needs a damned good thrashing, if you ask me. Interfering in the hunt? Damn it. It's not, not English. I will deal with the matter, Cal said crisply. In the meantime, I'm looking for the lawyer Chiswick. He indicated the doorway with the brass plate attached. Out, I'm afraid, Muddy Boots said. Saw him heading out of town an hour ago. I see. Could you direct me to Willowbank Farm? Muddy Boots gave him the directions. Cal glanced up at Hawkins, who nodded to indicate he'd heard them. Muddy Boots gave a satisfied nod. Can we count on you removing that, uh, removing young George from the district, Lord Ashenden? I'll make my decision when I've gathered all the relevant information. Good day, gentlemen. He climbed into the carriage and rapped on the roof, and in minutes the village was behind them. Henry had obviously acknowledged the boy, at least locally if not to his family. He sounded like a youth rather than a child, a wild and uncontrollable one at that. The army was the perfect place for wild, uncontrollable youths. A disciplined environment and a worthy job to do, a little responsibility and the wildest lad could be tamed. A cavalry regiment, perhaps, for young George. It was the obvious solution. Chapter 7 Seldom, very seldom, does complete truth belong to any human disclosure. Seldom can it happen that something is not a little disguised or a little mistaken. Jane Austen, Emma Willowbank Farm looked shabby and neglected. Weeds studded the rutted lane that led to the house, and the garden was overgrown and straggly. The paint on the frames surrounding the windows was peeling as was the front door. As they drove up, a large grey wolfhound loped toward them, barking. The front door opened and a lanky youth appeared. Finn, come here! The dog gave the carriage wheels a longing look, then trotted obediently back to his master. Dressed in worn buff riding breeches, a shabby green jacket, and high leather riding boots splattered with mud, the youth made no move to come and greet the visitor. One hand on the dog's collar, he eyed the carriage and its occupant with suspicion. He looked to be about sixteen or seventeen, with an angular face, pointed chin, and closely cropped curly dark hair. There was a faint, barely discernible resemblance to Henry. Cal leapt lightly down from the carriage. Would you be George? he asked, realizing he didn't know the boy's surname. The boy scowled and raised his chin. Who's asking? And there, suddenly, was the resemblance Cal had been looking for. The famous Rutherford scowl, evident in half of the ancestral portraits that graced the family portrait gallery at Ashenden. I'm your uncle Cal Rutherford. Cal held out his hand. The boy made no move to take it. He scanned Cal suspiciously for a good minute, his hand tight on the dog's collar. Then he released the dog with a muttered order to stay and moved reluctantly forward. George Rutherford. Cal watched the way the lad strode toward him. No, you're not, he said slowly. 
Georgina or Georgette may be, but not George. His niece's grey eyes flashed. I prefer George. I'm sure you do, but what does it say on the parish register? She met his question with a mulish expression and a chin lifted in silent challenge. There was a streak of dried mud across her forehead. He waited. After a moment, she said sulkily, Georgiana, but I don't answer to that. We'll discuss it later. In the meantime, I presume there is someone to help see to the horses. Usually a stable boy would have come out at the first sign of a coach arriving, but there was no sign of anyone. I'll see to them. Cal's brows rose. Thank you. I'll meet you in the house in, shall we say, ten minutes? You're very free with my home, she snapped. A habit of uncles, Cal answered with mock sympathy. He was pleased to have her distracted. It would give him a chance to get the lay of the land. He found the sitting room, a shabby but comfortable-looking room with overstuffed armchairs and lined with bookshelves. A small fire glowed sullenly in a large stone fireplace. Darker patches on the faded paint showed where paintings had once hung. Where were they now? Cal noticed a small pile of papers. Legal documents on a table next to the window. He picked up the top one. It was a letter from Chiswick, the lawyer in Alderton, advising Miss Georgiana to find her mother's marriage lines and other documentation so he could contest her father's will. Marriage lines. Then Miss Georgiana was no bastard after all. He glanced through the lawyer's letter again then read through the fair copy of Henry's will that lay beneath it. He felt a spurt of anger on the girl's behalf. The will made no mention of Georgiana. He'd left her nothing, not a penny. Damn it, she was his daughter. Henry had no business leaving her without any visible means of support. How did she live? Who was looking after her? There was no sign of any other adult in evidence. Cal sifted through the documents to see what else he could learn. A cold draft from the door alerted him to his niece's return. How dare you! Those papers are private! She stormed forward and snatched them out of his hand, her grey eyes sparking with anger. Eyes the exact same colour as Cal's. Who do you think you are, walking into my home and looking through my private? I told you I'm your uncle, Calborn Rutherford, Lord Ashenden since your father died and currently head of your family. She put her chin up. I've only got your word for it that you're my uncle. That and the evidence of your looking glass, if you use one, he added, noticing a fresh smear of mud on her cheek. Did she always greet her guests with a dirty face and smelling of the stables? She scowled and the family resemblance was even more pronounced. Oh Lord, everyone was going to take this touchy ragamuffin for his daughter. How old are you? She stiffened. None of your b- You look about sixteen. I'm eighteen. I turned eighteen last month. And who is looking after you? She snorted. I'm not a child. I don't need to be looked after. I can take care of myself. Let me rephrase the question. Whom do you live with? Finn, she put a hand on the dog's collar. And Martha. Where is this Martha? Her companion or chaperone, presumably. In the kitchen, where else? Be so good as to fetch her. Fetch her yourself. You can't just march in here and start throwing orders around. I think you'll find I can. I'm your closest relative, which until you're twenty-one makes me your guardian. You'll do as I tell you. I won't. If you've read and understood these documents, you know the law will support me. Now, run along and fetch this Martha, will you? 
As much as anyone could flounce in breeches and boots, his niece Georgiana flounced from the room, making her point by slamming the door resoundingly behind her. He stood, warming himself by the fire, contemplating his rash statement. But he could see no way around it. He had to take her under his control. This place was a disgrace, and as for her behavior, well, it seemed she was running true to form with Rutherford females. You wanted to speak to me, sir? An elderly woman stood in the doorway, smoothing her apron with anxious hands. Martha? Aye, sir, Martha Scarrett, a cook and housekeeper, and before that nursemaid when Miss George were a wee babe. Cook and housekeeper? He frowned. Is there anyone else to help you? Any other servants? She shook her head. No, sir, not since, well, not for a few years now. Mr. Henry stopped stending the money some years ago. But we manage. She hesitated, then said, You have a slight look of Mr. Henry, sir. Would you be a relative of Miss George's? I am her uncle, Lord Ashenden. Martha bobbed an awkward curtsy. Sorry, my lord. She said someone wanted to speak to me and stormed outside. Got a bit of her temper, Miss George has. But she's a good-hearted lass. Cal nodded. A good-hearted lass? An undisciplined brat, more like. You said you'd cared for Miss Georgiana since she was a babe. Where is her mother? Miss Mary... I mean, Mrs. Rutherford, died not long after giving birth to Miss George. Mr. Henry had left her by then. Fair shattered her heart, he did. My brother married her? You're sure of that? Oh, yes, sir, old Mr. Forster. Miss Mary's father made sure it was all legal-like. He wasn't going to have some London rake seduce his precious only daughter and not do right by her. They were married right and tight in the church here, the bands called and all, and he made Mr. Henry buy her this house and make her an allowance. Documents were signed, they were. The lawyer in the village, Mr. Chiswick, has copies. I see. Documented and legal, he had no doubt. So why hadn't Henry informed his family? The old woman added, Miss George and me have been on our own since her grandparents died. Jim, the stable boy, stayed for a while, but a body can't live without wages, so he left last summer. And what about your own wages? The old woman gave him an indignant look. I don't need paying to look after Miss George, sir. I love that child like my own. Were you wanting something to eat, sir? because I've some soup on the hop and a nice bit of bread and cheese if you'd like your dinner early. Hooves clattered on the cobbles outside, causing Cal to turn and look out the window. There was a blur of movement, and then all he could see was a lithe figure astride a black stallion disappearing into the distance, a grey wolfhound loping along beside it. Cal swore. Was that... Miss George, yes, she does that from time to time, goes off on her lonesome with nothing but her horse and that hound, high-spirited she is. But never you mind, sir. She'll be back in a day or so. A day or so? And where the hell did she stay while she was on these outings? The old woman nodded comfortably, not seeming to notice his outrage. Aye, never more than three days. But there's no need to worry, sir. She always comes back safe and sound. Now, will you be wanting... A brandy, if there is such a thing in this benighted house. No brandy, I'm afraid, sir. But there's some parsnip wine, if you fancy that. She smiled at him in a motherly fashion. Now, don't you fret about Miss George. It does no good, sir. No good at all. She goes her own ways, that lass always has and always will. And she shuffled off. Not if I have anything to do with it. 
Cal muttered as his niece disappeared over the horizon. Damn Henry for a neglectful parent. Why the hell hadn't he told Papa about the girl? Papa might have been a cold man, but he had a strong sense of family and duty and would gladly have taken a legitimate granddaughter in to raise with his own daughters. Instead, Henry had treated his only living child like a dirty little secret and left her to sink or swim on her own. Well, that would change. This was no way for a young woman of good birth to live in an isolated, run-down old farmhouse with no company but an old woman, a dog and a horse, and no income. And with half the hunting fraternity of the district apparently baying for her blood. He sighed. Georgiana was even more undisciplined than his sisters. Putting them together would be like trying to put a fire out by adding oil to it. But he had no choice. He swore under his breath. Dealing with two spirited young Rutherford females had nearly driven him to drink. What the hell was he going to do with three? He had to take Georgiana back to Bath with him and prepare her, somehow, to enter her proper milieu. Or rather, pay someone to prepare her. He thought of the long-legged teacher again. She'd know how to do it. He'd have to increase his offer, make it worth her while. He wrote a note to Aunt Dottie and told her to expect him back in a few days, along with a previously unknown niece. He wrote another letter to Phipps, explaining the situation and a note to the lawyer Chiswick, asking him to call at Willowbank Farm at his earliest convenience. He rang for Martha and Hawkins and gave them instructions to go into the village, post the letters, deliver the note and purchase whatever was needed for them all to be comfortable for the next few days. Food, household goods, stable supplies, whatever. He handed Martha a sum that made her eyes bulge. And of course, anything you might require for yourself, Mrs. Scarrett. I will be making arrangements to have your back wages paid to you, but in the meantime purchase whatever you want. As they turned to leave, he thought of something else. Mrs. Scarrett, am I to understand that the clothing my niece wore today is her usual attire? You mean breeches and boots? Yes, sir. I mean, my lord. Then be so good as to purchase her a couple of dresses and whatever else goes with and under them. He handed her an extra few banknotes. The old woman's eyes widened. Dresses, sir, but Miss George won't wear dresses. She won't wear nothing except breeches and boots. Cal gave her a steely smile. We'll see about that. Chiswick, the lawyer, came first thing the next morning. At first he was inclined to be stiff and formal and clearly prepared for battle. But once Cal had made it clear that he was disgusted by his brother's neglect of his daughter and wanted to do right by her and her servants, the silver-haired old gentleman rapidly unbent. I don't understand why Henry kept the marriage so secret. She wasn't of his station, Chiswick told him. Perfectly respectable family, good yeoman farmers, but not the right kind of wife for the heir of the Earl of Ashenden. Do you think she tried to entrap Henry into marriage? Chiswick shook his head. Nobody around here knew who he really was until long after the wedding. He came among us as plain Mr. Rutherford, rusticating, I believe the young bloods used to call it. Well, he took one look at pretty young Mary Foster and made a beeline for her, sought her out at every opportunity. He sighed regretfully. A lovely girl she was, just seventeen, pretty as a picture, sweet-tempered and innocent as a spring lamb. He shot Cal a glance from under grey beetling brows. Your brother seduced her, the blackguard. Cal nodded. 
but he must have cared for her enough to marry her. Chiswick snorted. No choice in the matter. Mary's father, George Foster, was a formidable fellow, for all that he was a farmer. Once he realized what had happened, he marched Henry up to the church, instructed the vicar to call the bands, and kept Henry locked in the cellar until his wedding day. He chuckled. Henry was beside himself with rage at first. I went along as legal counsel to draw up the settlements. But the moment Foster demanded to know who Henry's father was and threatened to go and fetch him, Henry quietened down and went through the service like a lamb. My father was also a formidable man, Cal said. He would have made Henry pay. If not for seducing an innocent, for getting caught. At the very least, he would have cut off Henry's very generous allowance. Henry would have hated that. We found out who he really was after Mary had died giving birth to young George. Chiswick set his cup down and sighed. I'd written to let him know, of course. He saw Cal's surprised look and added, Oh yes, he left her a few weeks after the wedding. Cal swore beneath his breath, a brother to be proud of indeed, abandoning his pregnant seventeen-year-old wife. I went up to London to notify him in person and to point out his duty to the babe. That's when I found out who he really was, that he was the heir of the Earl of Ashenden. The old man said in a level voice, The notice of his betrothal to Lady Maria Eglinton appeared in the morning post exactly one month later. There was a long silence broken only by the crackling of the fire and the wind outside in the trees. The old lawyer added, Young George doesn't take after her mother much. She's all Rutherford for the most part. But when she smiles... Ah, oh, when she smiles, you can see her mother in her then. Sweetest smile in the world. Cal was yet to see George smile. He was most familiar with her version of the Rutherford scowl. The family had no idea of any of this. Cal told the old gentleman. If my father had known, he would have taken the baby in and had her raised at Ashenden Court, as was her right. She wouldn't have been, he gestured, running wild. Chiswick gave a wry grin. And there would be a dashed sight for your foxes in the district. Has she really managed to disrupt the hunt? I met a few fellows in the village yesterday who expressed themselves in the strongest terms. Chiswick nodded. Have you seen her ride? I have, Cal said grimly. With that black stallion of hers and a bag of smoked herring heads, she's managed to bring the local hunt pretty much to its knees for the last three seasons. Got a soft spot for wild creatures, has young George. Well, the hunters can relax. I'll be removing her from the district. The old man shot him a searching look. To what purpose? I have two half-sisters the same age as she is. It will be easier to look after them all together. He saw the man's hesitation. What? You don't imagine I'd leave her here, running wild and trying to hold things together on her own, do you? It's not that, Chiswick said. Have you told George yet? I can't imagine she'll agree. She's very attached to her home, she is. Georgiana is eighteen, Cal reminded him. It's time she was thinking about marriage. I'll launch all three of them together in London next season. As he uttered the words, he realized it was the very solution. Get the married off as quickly as you can. Make them some other man's problem. Won't she be in mourning for her father? Chiswick asked. And your sisters for their uncle? Damn, that was right. They were supposed to spend a year in mourning because of Henry, 
another year of mourning for his sisters. People took these conventions so seriously. Why make such a display of death? As if draping yourself in black made any difference to how much you grieved or didn't. During the war, Cal had lived with death all around him. An everyday occurrence, a constant presence. He had lost friends, good friends, and comrades. He still missed some of them. But he'd learned not to wallow in the pain or dwell on the loss. Not that there was any time for wallowing in wartime. He thought of the outbreak of public mourning for the death of Princess Charlotte the previous year. It wasn't just about grieving, though the nation did sincerely grieve her loss. It was also a show of respect. But as far as Cal was concerned, death was a reminder to mankind to get on with the business of living. His preferred response to death was to celebrate life, not shroud yourself in black and retreat from it. A year in mourning for Henry. Henry didn't deserve it, and neither did the girls. No, Cal would launch all three girls together in London this coming season. And then he remembered. He'd be on the continent in a couple of weeks, God willing. Well, someone would launch the girls. His aunt or someone. He'd work out who later. Georgiana stayed away for another two nights and two days. Cal used the time to check on the men on his list, without success. He would have wagered she'd have stayed longer had the weather not turned nasty with a bitter wind and driving sleet coming down in sheets. As it was, she simply appeared shortly before dinner on the third day, soaking wet, her boots and breeches covered in mud, but otherwise as cool and unconcerned as if she'd just stepped out for a moment. And without a word of acknowledgement or apology for her outrageous disappearance, don't fuss, Martha, dear. I'm perfectly all right. It's just a bit of mud and water. Is there any hot water? I'll take a bath if there is. And so you should, Miss George. Catch your death one day out like a savage in this weather. You mark my words. Now get along upstairs. I'll fetch the hot water to you at once. And when you've had your bath... Cal said as the girl turned to go. You will change into one of the two new dresses you'll find in your bedchamber. Dresses? I'm not wearing any dresses. Suit yourself, but no dress, no dinner, Cal said indifferently. I'll see you before dinner in the sitting room. She gave him a mulish look. From the kitchen wafted the scent of roasting beef and Yorkshire pudding, apple pie and clotted cream to follow. He'd wager she was ravenous. From the look of her, she had been living rough, sleeping in some old shed or haystack. There was straw in her hair. He wanted to throttle the stubborn little wretch for her foolishness. The thought occurred to him, not for the first time, that she would have made a superb soldier. He squashed it. She'd learn... Georgiana entered the sitting room half an hour later, wearing one of the dresses. Her skin looked fresh and clean, her short, dark hair still damp, curled attractively around her face. A little attention to grooming and deportment, and she'd be a beauty. I hope you're satisfied. I look ridiculous, she snapped as soon as she saw him. Cal stood as she entered. He shook his head. You don't, you know. You look very pretty. You look better as a girl than as a boy. It was true. As a boy, she looked skinny and lanky. But somehow the dress transformed that into a slender, deceptively delicate femininity. She scowled horribly at him and flung herself into one of the overstuffed chairs in front of the fireplace.
She went to cross her legs as she usually did in her breeches and discovered that dresses didn't allow for such freedom of movement. She swore. Cal was hard put not to laugh out loud. He controlled the impulse. Treating her with the dignity of a grown-up lady was the only way to reconcile her to her new state. Would you care for a sherry? he asked. She didn't answer, so he poured her one anyway. When he turned to give it to her, he found her standing behind him, still scowling. She took it, tossed it down in one gulp, then coughed. It's meant to be sipped, Cal told her, and refilled the little glass. It's horrid, she said. I notice you're not drinking it. No, but ladies don't drink cognac. You wouldn't like it either. She gave him a filthy look, drank her sherry down again in one gulp, coughed, put the glass down and prowled around the room. She noticed that the documents on the window table had been rearranged and whirled around. Snooping again, were you? Familiarizing myself with my ward's situation, yes, he said and writing letters. She picked up the ink pot. Oops! She didn't sound the least bit upset, quite the reverse. Oh dear, what a calamity, and my new dress too! He looked up. She had spilled an entire pot of black ink down the front of her new gown. It was ruined. He gritted his teeth. You mustn't have stopped the ink pot properly, she said, innocent as a kitten. I'll just go up and change, shall I? No, wear this shawl over it, he told her. It will cover the stain. He tossed her an old woolen shawl that had been draped across one of the chairs. He had no doubt that if he allowed her to change, the second dress would go the way of the first. That's Martha's shawl, he shrugged. I'm sure she won't mind. Now, shall we go in to dinner, or is there something else you need to destroy first? He offered her his arm. They ate Martha's magnificent dinner in silence. I'll see you in the other dress for breakfast, he told Georgiana at the end of the meal. From the look of her, she had sleep like a log all night. And if anything untoward happens to the other dress, you will get no breakfast. She gave an indifferent shrug. But he could tell by her expression that the fate of the second dress would not now be delayed until after breakfast. Which exactly suited his plans. Chapter 8 what are young women made of? Ribbons and laces and sweet pretty faces. Nursery rhyme. Georgiana came down to breakfast wearing a black scowl and a blue-flowered dress. His threat had worked. Thank God for young women with healthy appetites. Her footsteps on the wooden floor suggested that beneath the dress she was wearing her boy's riding boots but Cal was prepared to accept that in the spirit of compromise. Having spent up big in the village, Martha served a slap-up breakfast, eggs, ham, fresh-baked sweet rolls, hot chocolate for Georgiana, coffee for Cal. It was something in the way of a last supper, though his niece didn't know that. She was too busy resenting Cal to notice Martha's uncharacteristic silence. He had made his plans during his niece's three-day absence. He had made arrangements with Chiswick and sworn Martha and Hawkins to secrecy. As they finished off the last of the magnificent breakfast, he heard Hawkins bringing the carriage around. Georgiana looked up. Are you going somewhere? Yes, I'm leaving for Bath this morning. Excellent, she grinned at him then and though it was a grin of triumph not to say glee, he glimpsed a trace of the sweetness Chiswick had mentioned. 
Have you finished your breakfast? Yes. Then say goodbye to Martha. Oh, my precious girl, Martha burst into tears and hugged her. What's going on? Why are you upset? Georgiana hugged her back, glaring at Cal over Martha's shoulder. Are you sending Martha away? Because if you are... No, no, my darling girl, Martha sobbed, smoothing Georgiana's hair back from her face. Don't worry about me. His lordship's been everything that's kind and generous. He's even sent for my sister and her boys to come and live here. It's just... I'll miss you. Miss me? But why, if you're staying here? She broke off, whirled around, and faced Cal with a belligerent expression. What are you up to? I'm not going anywhere. You're going to bath with me. Cal bent and tossed her over his shoulder. Goodbye, Martha, he said, quite as if he didn't have an infuriated niece kicking and wriggling and spitting fury like a wildcat. I'll keep you up to date with arrangements. Thank you for your assistance. The struggling stopped for a moment. Martha, did you know about this? The betrayal in her voice was heartbreaking. Cal hardened his heart against it. If he'd simply told her, there would be more drama and argument, and no doubt she'd gallop away on her black stallion for another three days or more. He didn't have that much time to waste. Martha sobbed. I'm that sorry, lovey. Truly I am, but it's for the best. I can't be living in the city, you know that. You're upset now, but in the long run, you'll know it was the right thing. I won't. I'll never forgive you. No, not you, Martha. Him. She pummeled his back with hard little fists. I know who's to blame for this, this kidnapping. He's even worse than my pig of a father. Cal strode toward the front door. His ribs were regretting the riding boots now. He should have made her change into the soft little slippers ladies usually wore. Hawkins waited outside with the carriage door open. All secure? Cal asked him. Yes, my lord. Cal deposited his niece in the carriage and climbed in after her. Hawkins shut the door after him and climbed swiftly up to take up the reins. Inside the carriage, Georgiana made a dive for the opposite door. She struggled with the handle for a moment, then turned to glare at Cal. It's locked, he told her. There's no point in fighting. You're outnumbered. He rapped on the roof of the carriage, and with a lurch, it moved off. She stuck two fingers in her mouth and let out a long, shrill whistle. He sighed and continued. If you've quite finished deafening me. I'm taking Finn, she let out another ear-splitting whistle. No, the dog stays here he said, firmly shutting his mind against the memory of his own desolation at having to leave his own dog behind when he was sent off to school. He's far too big and ungainly for my aunt's townhouse. And he would be miserable shut up in her small backyard. More to the point, Cal had no intention of travelling in a closed carriage with a damp, muddy, smelly beast the size of a pony. So I am to have nobody and nothing of my own then? She'd tried for toughness, but there was an underlying pathos to her words. I know it's all very strange and unsettling, Georgiana, but bear with me. I cannot descend on Aunt Dotty with a collection of large animals and an old retainer, as well as a great niece she knew nothing about. A house isn't big enough for a start. Then leave me here. At times we all have to do things we don't want to do. Your grandfather was the Earl of Ashenden. His life was laid out for him because of who he was. Your late father was, for the last year of his life, also the Earl of Ashenden, as I am now. None of us had any choice in it. We were simply born to that position and fate did the rest. And the same goes for you. 
She gave him a startled look. Me? He nodded. Your father was an earl, so you are now Lady Georgiana Rutherford. Has nobody ever told you that? She shook her head. Well, you are, and it is not fitting for Lady Georgiana Rutherford to continue living the life you've been living here. But I'm happy here. You can be happy anywhere if you put your mind to it. Now don't worry. Martha is perfectly content with the arrangement. As soon as it's convenient, I'll send for the dog. And yes, the horse as well. It's obvious you love to ride, and he's a fine animal. She sniffed. How do I know you'll keep your promise? I am not in the habit of breaking my word, he said stiffly. She rolled her eyes. Heard that before. Apparently my father was fond of saying, my word is my bond, and we all knew what that meant. I am nothing like your father. She shrugged. Who will take care of Sultan? He can be difficult. He hates strangers. Chiswick said he thought Jem Stubbins, your former stable boy, would be willing. He is currently working for a butcher, a job that is not to his taste. I trust you approve? She scrunched herself into the corner seat farthest away from Cal. Thought of everything, haven't you? It wasn't a compliment. After about ten minutes on the main road, the carriage slowed. Hawkins opened the communication hatch. What is it, Hawkins? It's Miss George's dog, my lord. It's following us. Georgiana's face lit up. See, Finn goes everywhere with me. He always has. Let him in. Oh, please, let him in. Keep going, Hawkins. The dog will give up soon and return home. I hate you, Georgiana curled up in her corner, a hostile ball of misery. The carriage picked up speed again. Fifteen minutes later, Hawkins slowed again. It's still following, my lord. Georgiana leaned forward and put a hand on Cal's knee. Tears glimmered on her long lashes. Please. Finn won't give up. He'll follow us until he drops. His paws will be bleeding. Cal sighed. Let the blasted animal in. The carriage came to a halt and he opened the door. Georgiana whistled again and a moment later the dog clambered awkwardly into the carriage, his ribs heaving with exhaustion, a panting red tongue lolling halfway down his chest. Georgiana gave the great beast a rapturous welcome, cooing over him as if he were a lap dog. Finn, oh Finn, darling, what a good clever dog you are. Yes, you are. Cal watched gloomily. The dog was huge. He was wet, he was muddy, he had probably never been bathed in his life. Now that he was reunited with his mistress, his long scraggy tail lashed ecstatically back and forth, sending joyous splatters of mud and filth in all directions, mainly over Cal's pristine coat and breeches. And the smell. Dear God. Georgiana gave him an apologetic glance. He must have found a dead bird to roll in. He's very fond of rolling in dead things. Of course he was. Cal tried not to breathe. The roads were clear, the weather good, the ostlers at the coach houses fast and efficient, and they made good time to bath. Hawkins secured the horses and let down the carriage steps. Cal, his hand gripping the dog's collar, waited to let his niece descend first. Bring our luggage in, then see to the horses, he told Hawkins. Our luggage? I don't have any luggage, Georgiana said. Martha packed you a bag. It too, Martha, she muttered so she'd had some sort of education after all.
Cal eased himself past the enormous hound, descended the steps, and before the dog could push past him and jump down, he quickly closed the door, shutting the dog inside the carriage. But Finn, Georgiana began, will go with Hawkins, who will have him thoroughly washed and dried before springing the beast on Aunt Dottie. You're the beast, she muttered. How am I going to wash a dog that size? Hawkins grumbled. More to the point, where am I going to do it? Cal flipped him a guinea piece. How you manage it is your business. This is Bath. There will be somewhere. I want him back clean and fresh and free of fleas. And then you will clean the carriage from top to bottom. And particularly the inside, which now has a distinct stench of odor dog. Hawkins peered in at the dog, who immediately woofed at him, a big, deep sound. He won't bite me, will he, Miss George? Not if he likes you. Then she laughed. No, he doesn't usually bite people, although he's never had a bath before. Perhaps I'd better go with... Cal caught her by the sleeve. You're coming inside with me. Hawkins will manage. You need to meet great Aunt Dottie and your aunts. Welcome, dear girl. Welcome to the family. I'm your aunt. Oh, that would be great, aunt, but just call me Aunt Dottie like the others do. She embraced Georgiana with all the affection and enthusiasm in her soul, as if the girl were a child she'd loved all her life and had dearly missed. And in a way, she was, Cal thought. Aunt Dottie was such a dear. Georgiana stood awkwardly in her embrace, uncertain of how to respond. Rose and Lily, whom he was pleased to find at home, stood quietly by watching curiously. Oh my, but you're a Rutherford through and through, aren't you? Aunt Dottie exclaimed. It was wicked of Henry not to tell us about you, positively wicked. Not that you look a lot like your father. Henry took after his mother more. But Cal, now. All eyes turned to Cal. You're the living image of Cal before he was sent away to be a soldier. Oh, now, now, don't pull that face, my dear. I don't mean you're not pretty. Of course you are. Very pretty indeed. Just as Cal was at sixteen, he was such a pretty boy back then, quite ravishing, I do assure you. Cal rolled his eyes. Oh, heavens, where are my manners? You haven't even met your aunts yet, have you, Georgiana? And here I am babbling on like the veriest brook. This is your aunt Rose and her younger sister Lily. Rose and Lily, come and greet your new niece, Georgiana. George! Aunt Dottie blinked. Her gaze dropped to the girl's neckline, where there was faint but undeniable evidence of femininity. I beg your pardon? My name, I prefer to be called George. Really? I've been called George for as long as I remember. She shot a defiant glance at Cal. He's the only one who calls me Georgiana. I don't answer to it. You'll learn to, Cal growled. Of course, my dear, if you wish to be called George, Aunt Dottie began. No, Cal said. It's not appropriate. Especially given her predilection for wearing boots and breeches, he didn't want his niece getting a name for eccentricity, deserved or not. Not before he had her off his hands at any rate. Nonsense, said Aunt Dottie briskly. If that's what the child prefers, it's not fitting. Why not? Rose interjected. You prefer being called Cal instead of Calborn. Her new niece gave her a cautious smile. Yes, but Cal is not a girl's name. George is... Rose slipped her arm through Georgiana's. What about Calpurnia, the wife of Julius Caesar? I bet Caesar called her Cal for short. Cal gritted his teeth. Her proper name is Georgiana. 
You call her that then, dear, Aunt Dotty said happily. We'll stick to George. A perfect compromise. I think George, especially for such a pretty girl, is rather charming. It would be different if she were plain and mannish, of course, but she's not. In fact, I think the name will underline her femininity delightfully. Besides, she'll be called Lady George by most people, which has a certain cachet, don't you think? Now, shall we all go in to supper? Cal, dear, your arm. Cal gave up. He took his aunt in to supper. The girls seemed to be getting on well, he observed gloomily. Of course they were. Divide and conquer, no such luck. At the end of supper, Lily said, Let us take George up to our bedchamber. She'll be sharing with Rosa and me. Logan moved another bed in yesterday. We'll help her unpack. I don't have much to unpack, Georgiana said, looking at Cal. But what about my d- Cal cut her off. When Hawkins has completed the task I set him, then we shall see. Go along upstairs. I will prepare Aunt Dottie for what is to come. He narrowed his eyes at her in a silent order. She eyed him doubtfully, gave a half-hearted shrug, and allowed herself to be led away. That sounds exciting, Aunt Dottie said. What is- to come, Cal sighed. Let us go into the sitting room and I'll explain. George's newfound aunts led her to a large, elegant bedchamber with a wide bay window that overlooked the street. It was as large as the big sitting room at home and even with three beds in the room, it still didn't feel cramped. The walls were covered with pale green paper in an elegant Chinese design, and two of the bed coverings had obviously been made to match. A shabby valise was sitting on the third bed. Shall we send for a maid to unpack that for you? Rose asked. No, she moderated her tone. I mean, no thank you. I prefer to do it myself. Logan found that for you to use. Lily pointed to a small chest of drawers beside the bed. I hope there's enough room for all your things. You can share our wardrobe, of course. Rose and Lily sat on their own beds and waited expectantly. George swallowed. Everything here was so fancy and fine. She was embarrassed to open her case and expose the paucity of her possessions. What had Martha packed for her? She opened it and, as expected, on the top lay her new petticoats and chemises and other female bits and pieces separated from whatever lay beneath by a layer of paper. They were plain and the fabric was a bit coarse. Alderton Village didn't run to fancy clothing. She shoved them quickly into the drawers, feeling angry with herself. She didn't care about clothes anyway. It was just... She wanted her new relatives to think well of her. She reached for the layer of paper, dreading what she might find underneath. The hideous pink ink-stained dress? More dresses from the village? She lifted the paper and blinked. As she quickly flipped through the neatly packed layers, her grin grew. She did a little dance. Thank you, Martha. What is it? Rose and Lily leaned forward curiously. I thought I'd never see these again. She lifted up a pair of her breeches. Martha had packed all three pairs of breeches, several coats, four good shirts, and two waistcoats, as well as her two best pairs of boots. Breeches? Rose exclaimed. Men's breeches? These are mine, George said gleefully. Until your brother started interfering in my life, that's all I ever wore. She plucked distastefully at her blue dress. He forced me to wear this thing. How dare he, Rose said indignantly. That fashion is years out of date and the fabric is cheap and a bit garish. 
she bit her lip. Sorry, I hope I didn't offend you. George laughed. Not at all, I hate it too. It's all so too loose, Lily observed sympathetically. Or have you lost weight recently? No, he made Martha buy it for me in the village while my back was turned. I expect there wasn't much choice, but I couldn't care less about fashion. I don't want to wear dresses at all. They're not at all comfortable, and they're so, so flimsy and fragile. I feel naked wearing them. The two sisters exchanged glances. Naked? I've never noticed that, Lily said. Well, you probably haven't worn breeches. When I put this dress on this morning, only because he threatened to starve me, I felt so exposed. Rose nodded. The neckline. Yes, but mainly around the legs. There are drafts, she said darkly. But your legs are completely covered, Lily said, puzzled. George grinned. They are now. She pulled up her skirts and revealed the breeches and boots she wore underneath. Rose and Lily exclaimed. They were clearly a bit shocked but they begged George to put her boy's clothes on so they could see how she looked. George was happy to oblige, and when she was fully dressed, they made her walk up and down in front of them. You really do look like a boy, Lily said in wonder. George shrugged. I don't care about that. I don't mind being a girl, but breeches are warmer and more comfortable and much better for riding. Why should we freeze in flimsy bits of nothing while men are warm and comfortable? Can I try them on? Rose asked. We're about the same size. George handed her a pair of breeches. Rose stripped off her dress and in minutes was standing in front of the looking glass, staring at her reflection. Then she swaggered around the room in the boots. George grinned. More comfortable, aren't they? Rose grimaced. I'm not sure. They feel a little strange. You get used to them. Lily, why don't you try them on? Her sister suggested. They won't fit me, Lily said. I'm too fat. No, you're not, George and Rose said at the same time. You're curvy and feminine, George added and Rose gave her a little nod of approval. Here, try these ones on. George handed her the loosest pair of breeches, and Lily squeezed into them. What do you think? They suit you, George told her. How do you feel? Comfortable, aren't they? A bit tight, but otherwise... Lily pranced and wriggled, and pulled some he-man poses that made them all laugh. They feel delightfully naughty, Rose frowned. Yes, but nobody would ever mistake you for a boy. George turned to her in surprise. What does that matter? Rose smiled. It doesn't. Now we'd better get changed back into our dresses. If Cal discovers your breeches, he'll probably confiscate them. They slipped back into their dresses. Why are you both wearing black? George asked. Your aunt, too. We're in mourning for our father, Aunt Dotty's brother, Lily explained. And after that, we'll be in mourning for our Uncle Henry. Another whole year, Rose said savagely. She paused. But Uncle Henry was your father, wasn't he? So why aren't you wearing black? I wouldn't wear mourning for him if you paid me, George declared. He was a lazy, selfish pig who broke my mother's heart. He left me to rot, didn't tell a soul about me, pretended I didn't exist and never came near me, not ever in my life that I remember. He didn't care if I lived or died, so why should I wear mourning for him? The two girls exchanged glances. 
We didn't like him either, Rose said. But you have to wear black for such a close relative, Lily said. Society expects it. People think you're heartless and disrespectful if you don't. George shrugged. I don't care. It would be hypocritical of me to wear black for a man I despise, and I'm not doing it. What do I care about society anyway? I never asked to come here. He forced me. Your brother, I mean. Besides, I look terrible in black, like a crow. Rose and Lily looked at each other. Do you think we look like crows? Lily asked. George gave them each a thoughtful glance. Not her. She jerked her chin at Rose. Black is a good foil for her coloring, that golden hair and that peaches and cream complexion and those blue, blue eyes. But you and me, Lily, with our dark hair and pale skin and gray eyes, we need a bit of color to liven us up. I know, Lily gave a dejected sigh. I'm so fed up with looking like a crow. I don't even like crows. They're so, so mournful, Rose supplied, and they all laughed. George went to the door, opened it, and looked out. Why do you keep doing that? Rose asked. It's the third time you've looked out into the hallway. Are you expecting something? The rest of your luggage, perhaps? I don't have any more, George told her absently. No, I'm waiting for my dog. Your dog? You have a dog? What sort is it? Where is it? Does Aunt Dotty know? His name is Finn. He's an Irish wolfhound and a complete darling. Your brother refused to let me bring him, but Finn followed me for miles and miles until he, your brother, had to give in and let him into the coach. As to whether Aunt Dotty knows, I think he was going to tell her about Finn after we went upstairs. Does she like dogs? I don't know, Rose said. As far as we know, she's never had one. If I can't have Finn, George said, I'm not staying here. Don't worry, Rose told her. Aunt Dotty is an absolute love. I'm sure she'll let you keep your dog. Where is he, George? Hawkins, your brother's coachman, took him somewhere, I don't know where, to be given a bath. He's to bring him to me when he's clean and dry. But that was hours ago, and I'm getting worried. She looked out into the corridor again. But Hawkins won't bring him up here, Rose said. A coachman doesn't come upstairs. He'll have put your dog in the backyard or the... But George was gone running down the stairs. The others followed. Through the kitchen, Rose said. This way. They burst into the kitchen and came to a dead stop. Is this here your animal, miss? Cook demanded. She gestured angrily. Finn sat over near a big square table in the center of the room, looking ridiculously clean and unbelievably innocent. I don't old with beasts in my kitchen. Nobody told me we was getting a dog. What am I supposed to do with it? Look at him, the miserable great lummox. I'm so sorry, George began. I didn't know that Hawkins... Rose took her arm and squeezed it meaningfully. Don't say a word, she murmured. Are you sure it's even a dog? Cook continued. Looks more like a ruddy great horse to me. And who's going to feed it, I ask you? A great big thing like that? Well, it'll eat us out of house and home, I reckon. Finn laid his muzzle on the table and heaved a huge, tragic sigh. Well, Will you look at that, Cook exclaimed crossly. He's sitting down and his head is higher than the table. And will you just look at them eyes? They all looked at his eyes. Have you ever seen such a miserable looking creature? Cook stormed. He might smell like a nosegay, but why anyone would want to bring a great whiskery clumsy creature? He's not clumsy, George began indignantly. Shh, 
Rose and Lily hissed from either side of her. Like that, into a decent, God-fearing gentlewoman's house, I don't know, Cook continued. And as for who's going to feed him, I know full well who that's going to fall on, oh yes, I do. I'll feed, oh, I know you young ladies are always full of good intentions, but it's poor old Cook who has to make sure everyone is fed, and this poor creature is half-starved, I'll be bound. He's not, he's... I've already given him the gravy beef that was for tomorrow's pie, and a marrow bone that was to go for soup. And he's eaten all the leftover sausage rolls, and just look at him. George looked. Finn looked disgustingly well satisfied to her. He turned his mournful, never-been-fed orphan look back on Cook. All right, then, just one little piece of the venison we're having on Friday. But that's the last you're getting from me. Cook bustled off to cut a slice of venison from the haunch hanging in the larder. George turned an amazed look on the other two, who were convulsed with muffled giggles. She likes him? They nodded. Whenever Cook starts scolding like that, it means she cares and is trying to hide it, Lily whispered. Rose nodded. She was exactly like that with the butcher, and they got married last year. That's why she doesn't live in any more. She lives with the butcher just down the street. A butcher? She lives with a butcher? George couldn't believe her luck. Lily nodded. There'll be no shortage of meat and bones for Finn, that's for certain. They waited until Finn had devoured the venison and been scolded for his manners. Two gulps? What do you call that, my lad, disgraceful? Cook told him. Now be off with you and don't you come begging around my kitchen any more. I'll bring you a nice meaty bone for breakfast. They took Finn upstairs. George couldn't believe how clean he looked. His rough grey coat even looked soft, though of course it wasn't. Remembering Cook's nosegay comment, she bent down and sniffed him, then burst out laughing. He smells of lavender. Oh, dear God! Good thing we're in the city, eh, Finn? Those country dogs would make such fun of you. Now come and meet the girls. Finn, like the gentleman he was, sat and shook their hands politely. Then, formalities over, he heaved a satisfied sigh and sprawled bonelessly out in front of the fire. Chapter 9 Gather ye rosebuds while ye may, all time is still a-flying, and this same flower that smiles today, tomorrow will be dying. Robert Herrick to the Virgins to make much of time. The next morning when the girls came down to breakfast, Aunt Dottie looked at Georgiana's blue dress and pursed her lips. Is that all you have to wear, my dear? She nodded. More or less. Then first thing after breakfast, the girls and I will take you shopping. Not only is that dress sadly outmoded, it's far too bright a colour given your state of mourning. I won't wear black, Georgiana declared. Not for a man who... Eat your egg, niece, Cal snapped. But... He shot her a hard, silencing look and turned to his aunt. Georgiana is correct, Aunt Dottie. She won't be wearing black for Henry. What? All three girls gasped. But she must, Aunt Dottie exclaimed. It would be quite outrageous of her to wear colours with her father so recently dead. Henry's will makes it quite clear that nobody should mourn him. Georgiana looked at him sharply but said nothing. Henry's will? Aunt Dottie said. The will makes it quite clear that nobody should wear black for Henry. And as his brother and his heir, and as head of the Rutherford family, I must insist that you respect it, difficult though you may find it to put off your blacks before time. 
Cal buttered a piece of toast while the news sank in. Aunt Dottie might not like it, but she would respect the orders of the head of the family. She always had, and she'd make it clear to everyone in society that their lack of mourning was by Henry's will and Cal's orders. Nobody would blame Aunt Dottie or the girls. They would blame the autocratic Earl of Ashenden, who, with any luck, would be somewhere on the continent. Cal was very aware of Georgiana's intense gaze boring silently into him, but he ignored her. She'd read Henry's will. She knew there was nothing in it about not wearing black. But there was nothing at all in the will about her, either. And that was what had decided Cal. He hadn't said that Henry's will had forbidden them to wear mourning. He'd said nobody should mourn him. A small but vital difference. If his niece questioned it, he would mention a later will. But judging by her silence, she wasn't going to question him at all. And why would she? She got what she wanted. Does that mean we get to put off our blacks too? Lily asked, her eyes sparkling. Cal nodded. In a week. It will be a year since Papa died, and after that, yes, you may return to dressing as you used to, in white and colours and whatever. The two sisters exchanged glances. And go to parties? Rose asked. Of course. And balls? Yes, yes, whatever is suitable. You shall make your come out next season. There was a short, shocked silence. You mean this spring? The season that starts in three months' time? Rose almost whispered it. Cal nodded. Yes. Pass the marmalade, if you please. Which one of us will come out first? Lily asked worriedly. As the youngest, she would expect to go last. All of you together, Cal said. At that, there was a babble of exclamations and excited speculation. Shopping would have to be done, morning dresses, walking dresses, ball dresses ordered, and from a London modiste. Nobody in Bath was sufficiently fashionable, and pelises, slippers, hats, gloves, fans. The lists grew. Cal ate his toast and drank his coffee well pleased with the result. The prospect of a London season would distract the girls from further mischief for the foreseeable future. Now all he had to do was find someone to launch them. Aunt Dottie would come, of course, but she'd be the first to admit she wasn't up to the rigours of a London season. Aunt Agatha might not be willing to come to Bath to help him, but introducing three pretty nieces to the ton in their first London season was exactly the kind of thing she'd enjoy, though she'd be sure to extract her pound of flesh from Cal. It would be worth it. Between Aunt Agatha and Aunt Dotty, they would manage as long as Cal provided them with a suitable chaperone who would keep the girls in check and escort them to the more everyday events. And he knew exactly who that would be. And once he had all that organised, he could leave. We will still need to purchase suitable clothing for George while we are here in Bath, and until the mourning period of your father, her grandfather is up. Aunt Dotty pointed out when the first excitement had died down. Do I have to? Cal cut his niece off. Purchase a wardrobe of black gowns for only a bare week's wear? Aunt Dotty hated waste. Aunt Dotty pondered that. I suppose she could wear some of Rose's dresses. They're much the same height. A perfect compromise, Cal said quickly, with a hard look at Georgiana to shut her up. Quite unexceptional to wear black for the next week or so as a mark of respect for her grandfather. And perhaps you could buy something in half mourning, shades of lilac and lavender. You always looked lovely in purple. It's very irregular. Aunt Dottie still wasn't happy about it. 
Of course, you will explain that it's on my instructions as head of the family out of respect for Henry. Lack of respect. She gave him a thoughtful look, then nodded. Respect for Henry, yes. That would be acceptable. Well, then come along, girls. Fetch your coats and hats. And Rose, dear, find George something more suitable to wear. We're going shopping. A mound of correspondence had accumulated in the short time Cal had been away. He took it into the library and sorted it into a state business, a towering heap, and personal, a single scrawled hand-delivered note. Nothing from Radcliffe, damn it, but a letter from Phipps had confirmed he had obtained Henry's will and found it substantially unchanged from the copy Cal had already seen. There was no mention of Georgiana. Cal had just broken the seal on the note when a soft knock on the door made him look up. It was Georgiana, a slender waif dressed all in black, with a black hat and black gloves. What is it? he asked warily. That wasn't in my father's will. About no mourning. He shrugged. Different will. Your copy was an old one. I have a copy of the latest one here. The fewer people who knew the truth, the better. She studied his face unconvinced, but before she could ask him anything else, like had her wretched father remembered her in any way at all, poor child, Rose poked her head in the door. Come on, George, we're going shopping for colors. Bye, Cal. Shopping. George grimaced good-naturedly, then gave Cal a smile and a friendly nod of goodbye. It was the first time they'd been in any kind of accord, and he found himself smiling as he returned to his correspondence. The note was from his friend Galbraith, inviting Cal, actually begging Cal, to join him at York House that night for dinner and commiseration. He didn't say what the commiseration concerned, but Cal could join the dots. He penned a swift acceptance and rang for Logan to deliver it to Galbraith at York House. Then he turned to the documents concerning the Ashenden estate and grimly began to work his way through the pile, making notes as he went. His mood grew blacker. There was a huge backlog of estate matters to be attended to. Their father had been meticulous, a hard taskmaster, who'd left a huge and complicated estate in apple pie order. Henry had simply let things grind to a halt. But it would be no hardship to go to Ashenden and see to things personally. Three names on his list were from Oxfordshire. Sometime in the afternoon, he heard the girls and Aunt Dottie return home. From the sounds of laughter and excited girlish conversation, he gathered they'd had a good day. Cal kept working. An hour later, Rose entered, carrying a tray containing a pot of coffee and a plate of sandwiches. Cook thought you'd be hungry, but Logan said you wouldn't want to be disturbed, so I said I'd bring it in. Cal thanked her, picked up a sandwich in his left hand, and kept working. She loitered, twirling a golden curl around her finger. Thanks, Cal, for telling Aunt Dottie to get us something in lilac. Even though it's still a morning color, lilac suits all of us, you know. Me, Lily, and George. We've ordered the prettiest dresses and bought some divine hats. I'm glad. He had no idea about colors and what would suit whom, but he was pleased the girls were happy for a change. He picked up the next document. Cal? she said in a soft, coaxing voice. You said we weren't to go out in the evening without an escort. He gave her a narrow look. Yes. And we haven't, don't worry. We've been ever so good, I promise. But there's a night fair down on the common tonight. Could we? I mean, would you take us? There are jugglers and fire eaters and tightrope walkers and... Lily poked her head around the door to add, 
and a puppet show and coconut shies and toffee apples and a menagerie and stalls selling. Cal held up his hands to stop the flow of enticements. Sorry, not tonight, girls. I have an engagement. Another time, perhaps. Their faces fell. Oh, but it's only on for one night. There will be other fairs. But... Girls, you've just been shopping with your aunt and purchased the first colours you've worn, legitimately worn, I mean, in a year. And you have a new niece to get to know. Isn't that enough to keep you happy for the evening? But we haven't been out for ages, Rose said. Not to anything, not even the pump room. All we've done for the last two weeks is knit and sew and talk and do puzzles and fold paper fire lighters. Aunt Dottie hasn't let us go anywhere, Lily added. He was not unmoved by their plight. Two weeks inside would make anyone restless. But he'd already made arrangements to go out. Galbraith clearly wanted a break from his courtship, and after weeks of girls and aunts and drama— Cal was in desperate need of some uncomplicated male companionship himself. Another time, he told them firmly. No, no arguments. Thank you for bringing me the sandwiches and coffee, Rose. Goodbye. York House had provided another fine dinner, living up to its reputation as the finest hotel in Bath. The wine served with dinner had been excellent and now, in the same private parlour as before, the two men were making inroads into a very fine bottle of cognac, Galbraith's inroads being rather heavier than Cal's. A fire crackled merrily in the grate. Cal had recounted the tale of the debacle of his nephew George, and now talk had turned to Galbraith's prospective bride. Quiet girl doesn't say much, doesn't smile much either, and when she does, she doesn't show her teeth. Odd that. Thought for a while, there she mightn't have teeth. Or that they were rotten or something, but no, she bit into a biscuit. And they're white and even enough. He sipped his cognac and added thoughtfully, Haven't actually heard her laugh yet. Very serious girl. You're really going to marry her? Cal asked, a little disturbed by the dispassionate description. Grandfather's coming to Bath. Head of family needs his signature on the settlements. Been making the journey in easy stages. Did I mention he's not been well? Cal nodded. He's not actually on his deathbed, then. So you don't have to marry this girl if you don't fancy her. No reason not to marry her, Galbraith said. She's pleasant enough and pretty enough, agrees with everything I say. Yes, but it doesn't sound as if you like her much, so I go ahead with it. Your grandfather dotes on you, so... Can't let the old man breathe his last, thinking I've let him down again? What do you mean? You distinguished yourself. Galbraith cut him off with a curt gesture. I just need to give him this one thing. Does it have to be this girl? Don't you know anyone else? I run with a pretty rackety crowd these days. Don't know any respectable females. This girl is the daughter of one of his oldest friends. He drained his glass and refilled it. She's very virtuous, practically a saint, itching to straighten me out and lead me down the path of righteousness, he said with a cynical grin. Good God! Galbraith gave a careless shrug. If it lets the old man die happy. But will she make you happy? All marriage is a gamble, Galbraith said indifferently and set down his glass. Now, real reason, I asked you here tonight. Want you to be my best man at the wedding. Cal shook his head. I'd be honored to, but I'll be back on the continent in a couple of weeks. What about next week? Still here then? Probably, but... Next week? You're not going to get married. No date set yet, but it'll be soon. Need to get the knot tied while the old man's still alive and kicking, 
do my best to get an air on the way before he gives up the ghost. He patted his pocket. Got a special license. Good God. Don't look so appalled. Marriage comes to us all in the end. Galbraith lifted his glass. So a toast, old friend, to my finally becoming a tenant for life. It was as dismal a wedding toast as Cal had ever heard. A tenant for life, he echoed. Cal left Galbraith staring into the fire. It was a cool, clear night, and he walked home from York House in a thoughtful state of mind. He didn't envy his friend one little bit. Marriage comes to us all in the end. True enough, Cal would have to marry and beget an heir too one day. But not yet, not for a long time yet, when he was at least thirty-five or more. He let himself into Aunt Dotty's house with the front door key and found a small candle lantern burning softly waiting for him to light his way upstairs. As he passed the girl's bedchamber, he heard a whine and a scratch at the door. The dog wanting to relieve itself, no doubt. Cal opened at the door, holding it wide to let the dog pass. He glanced inside and stiffened. The bed nearest the door was unoccupied. He leaned inside the room and held the lantern higher. Every bed empty, damn them. He took the dog outside for the call of nature, returned him to the bedchamber, then settled down in the kitchen to wait. He was angry and disappointed, with himself as much as anyone. He had imagined he had been making progress with the girls, but clearly they were determined to go their own way, no matter what. So they were disappointed with his refusal to escort them to the night fair. Life was full of disappointments. An hour later he heard the sound of soft laughter and the key turning in the kitchen door. The door opened and two young men swaggered in, complete to a shade, coat, hat, breeches, boots, and each carrying a cane. They were followed by Lily, wrapped warmly in a cloak. Cal rose from his seat at the table. Make sure you bolt the blasted door or I'll have a reason to sack that butler my aunt is so fond of. The two young men jumped then turned to face him with expressions of varying defiance. Georgiana looked wary. Rose was trying to appear unconcerned but looked a little shamefaced, and Lily looked frankly upset. It's not Logan's fault, she began, but Cal cut her off with a sharp gesture. I know damned well whose fault it is. He turned the lantern up, the better to see their faces. Well... What do you have to say for yourselves? He waited. Word of a Rutherford? You said when you promised me not to go out unescorted at night? Promises made under duress don't count, Rose said. Besides, you promised to take us somewhere exciting when you returned, and you didn't. In any case, we did have an escort. George escorted us, and we both dressed like men so nobody could tell. He smashed his fist on the table, making them all jump. George is not any kind of escort, and you know it, and if you think you look like a man, you're very much mistaken. He glanced at George. I should have burned those damned breeches. You can't, they belong to me, she flashed. I'm the head of your family and your legal guardian. I can do whatever the hell I want. There's no need to swear at us, Rose muttered. I don't know why you're making such a fuss. There were no consequences, nobody noticed us, and nothing happened. So don't say such things. You're frightening Lily. Rose put her arm around her sister's shoulders and squeezed, but Cal was wise to her tricks this time. Don't you dare try those crocodile tears on me again, he snapped. Lily stopped on a hiccup, her big grey eyes still swimming with unshed tears. He looked away. 
even though he knew she could produce them at will, her tears still had the power to stir him up inside. I'm sorry, Cal, she said, sounding truly penitent. She added in a hesitant tone. I brought you something from the fair. From her reticule, she pulled a toffee apple on a stick and held it out to him. Cal made no move to take it. Lily put it on the table in front of him. There was a long silence. I ought to beat you all, he said eventually. You wouldn't dare, George braced herself, pale but defiant. I've had men in the army flogged insensible, he informed her coldly. A good beating might wake you little hellions up to the consequences of your actions. You just try it and I, I'll run away, George said. You know I can. Don't worry, George, Lily said softly. Of course Cal won't beat us. How do you know I won't? Cal growled. Did she think a toffee apple could change his mind? Lily gave him a tremulous smile. Because you gave me piggyback rides when I was seven. What? The logic of that escaped him completely. Yes, and because the first time he caught us coming in at night, he was absolutely furious, but the minute Lily started crying, he fell completely apart, didn't he, Lil? Rose said. He went from being all cold and mean and nasty to being all worried and gruff. It was really rather sweet. Cal stared at her dumbfounded. Sweet? Rather sweet? Ye gods. Oh, just go. He shoved the lantern, still burning but not for much longer, across the table toward them. Get up to bed and don't wake your aunt. I'll speak to you tomorrow. Not another word, Rose, he said as she opened her mouth to argue. One word out of any of you and you'll all be on bread and water for a week. Stale bread and no butter. Now go. They went. But he heard Lily say, He doesn't mean that either, George. He does. He's threatened to starve me twice. George sounded aggrieved. Yes, but did he actually do it? Lily asked. No, of course not. Cal's our big brother, and even though he tries to hide it, he loves us and takes care of us. All of us. The girls took the lantern with them, leaving Cal in the kitchen in the dark in more ways than one. He loves us and takes care of us, all of us. Where would she get such an idea? He had never even mentioned the word love to any of the girls, so it didn't make sense. Nor did that nonsense about giving them piggyback rides when they were little. It was just a piggyback ride, not a declaration of love. A lot of piggyback rides now that he came to think of it. The girls had always demanded it on the few occasions he was home. It was just something he did. Was that why they disobeyed him so easily? Because they imagined he loved them and so would forgive them anything? Aunt Dotty too? Females, imagining everything revolved around love. It was his duty as a brother, an uncle, and now head of the family to look after the girls. If there was one thing Cal understood, it was responsibility. He had had it drummed into him all his life. But love. He was a stranger to that emotion. He couldn't even remember his mother. She had died when he was a toddler. As a young boy, he had spent hours staring at her portrait, trying to remember her, wondering what she'd thought of him, what she had been like, but all he had were servants' tales. He'd never talked about her to Henry or his father. It wasn't that his father had forbidden it. As such, it was just not done. As for his father, he'd felt a deep regard for him, but he'd been a distant, exacting, and cold-natured parent, 
more concerned with obedience than love. Had Cal loved him, he didn't know. He thought of his friend Galbraith, who openly admitted he loved his grandfather, enough to marry a woman he didn't particularly care for, just to ease the old man's passing from this world. Would Cal sacrifice himself for his father that way? He considered the possibility and decided he might, but it would be duty rather than love. Would he sacrifice himself for the girls and Aunt Dottie? He'd lay down his life for them, if they were in any kind of danger, of course. But then he was used to risking his life for others. It was a soldier's life, king and country, or his family. It wasn't much different. One did what one had to. But love? He'd had liaisons with women over the years, but the strongest he'd ever felt was fondness. There'd been practical arrangements from the start, and he'd always taken good care of them. None of them had loved him. If they had, they'd never mentioned it. He'd always been glad of that. He wouldn't know what to do with a lovelorn mistress. Several of his friends had been entangled in affairs of the heart, unrequited love on one side or the other. It was messy, undignified. Cal probably took after his father and Henry, naturally cold-hearted and not particularly lovable. The only person who had ever loved him was Aunt Dotty, and Aunt Dotty loved everyone. He was fond of the women of his family, though possibly not Aunt Agatha. Could one be fond of a dragon? But he had to do something about the girls. It was clear they would continue on their own merry way, flouting his rules whenever it suited them, secure in the illusion of his love and forgiveness. His father would have had them beaten for such disobedience, but Cal couldn't bring himself to do that. He needed someone who they would know didn't love them someone they respected who could control them. Someone like that long-legged, cool-voiced teacher. Chapter 10 Whether they give or refuse, it delights women just the same to have been asked. Ovid, Amours I'll triple your salary. One of Miss Emmeline Westwood's finely arched brows rose in a look of mild interest. Triple? She smoothed the lace gloves enclosing her long slender fingers, cool as new-made butter. Damn it, she should be more impressed than that. It was an extremely generous offer. He'd come first thing in the morning, hoping to have it all organized before he spoke to the girls. They hadn't come down to breakfast. No surprise there. But the teacher wasn't responding as he'd planned. She had appeared today without that ugly cap, her brown hair drawn back into a smooth coil at the back. Tiny curls escaped her discipline, clustering around her nape and ears. But did she fiddle with her hair like most women of his experience? Not a bit. She sat facing him, her countenance as bland as milk, receiving his offer as if barely interested. Of course, that could be a bargaining tactic. Yes, triple, because there are now three girls. My orphaned niece, who is roughly the same age as my sister's. Which made for three times the trouble, though he wasn't going to admit that. And for triple my current salary, whatever that is, you haven't even asked what I earn yet. You want me to take them to London. Along with my aunt, Lady Dorothea Rutherford. She inclined her head. Along with your elderly aunt, and you want me to chaperone the girls. Guide and control them. Help prepare them for their come-out, take them shopping, supervise their wardrobe, organize a ball at your London home, accompany them to various ton occasions. He made an impatient gesture. Yes, yes, all of that. The usual nonsense. 
She gave him a level, teacherly look that made him aware he was interrupting. Her gaze remained steady as she finished. So that you can leave them and return to your important government business. He frowned at the hint of skepticism in her voice. It is important government business. She gave a perfunctory half-smile. Of course it is, and you want to be able to leave the girls behind with a clear conscience. Yeah, no, I'm thinking of what is best for the girls. Her brow rose again, an arch linking skepticism and inquiry. To hire a stranger to look after them? You're not a stranger to them, only to Georgiana. I'm a stranger to you. You know nothing about me. That headmistress had indicated she had been educated here as a girl, which meant she must be well enough born, though obviously her family had fallen on hard times since then. Your position here vouches for your character. As for the rest, you seem well enough educated and quite ladylike. Merci du compliment. Irony frosted her voice, or maybe she was just demonstrating the range of her education. That luscious mouth had thinned to a firm line. She seemed to be waiting for him to explain further, so he obliged. I know you're good at handling girls of that age, that you've held a responsible position in this seminary for some years, and that my half-sisters respect you. That seems to me sufficient for such a position. As to the requirements of the job, naturally, as well as your wage, I'll pay all your additional expenses, clothes, shoes, shawls, fans. He gestured vaguely, whatever is required. I see. And there will be a bonus each time one of the girls marries. Damn it, he was starting to sound desperate. A faint pucker marred her smooth forehead. A bonus? To see them married? He nodded. And an extra bonus if you get them all fired off in one year. The fine green-gray eyes glittered. The lace-clad fingers curled into fists, and for a moment, Cal thought she was going to, what, hit him? Nonsense. She blinked, and the flash was gone as if he'd imagined it. But once this desirable outcome is achieved, I'd be unemployed. Yes, but in the meantime you'll have earned yourself a handsome sum. As well, you'll have made a lot of useful connections in the ton. I'm sure you'd have no trouble finding another position. As a chaperone or governess? He shrugged. Who knows what opportunities you'd find. She could even land herself a husband, once she was properly dressed with those eyes and that mouth. There was a short silence, then she folded her hands and said, Thank you for your offer, Lord Ashenden. However, Miss Mallard has informed me that she intends to retire at the end of term. She has offered me the position of headmistress in her place. It is not as well paid as your offer, but, he said incredulously, you're turning down the experience of a London season and all it has to offer in favour of a dreary job keeping schoolgirls in order? Isn't that what you want me to do with your sisters? She gave him a swift half-smile as if to take the sting out, but he wasn't fooled. She smoothed the lace gloves again. Your offer is very tempting, I admit. But that's part of the problem. After a year or two of living the high life in London, it would be very hard to adjust to this life again. She said the last word on a breath, so softly he almost didn't catch it. So you're choosing to hide away here in a drab little girl's school instead of taking a risk? She gave him a startled glance. Nonsense. There's no question of my hiding. She lifted her chin and said with crisp authority, I like teaching, Lord Ashenden. 
and I enjoy working with schoolgirls. Moreover, as headmistress, I will be able to make some innovations to the curriculum and operation of the school. I find the prospect quite stimulating and challenging. He snorted. If you say so. I don't believe I mentioned the size of the bonuses. He named a sum that made her blink. It is indeed substantial, she admitted. He frowned. But you're still refusing me. She nodded. A woman like me, he assumed she meant poor and single, must look to her future. The position of headmistress here is, more or less, a position for life, and I would be foolish to risk long-term security for short-term gain. So yes, my mind is made up. But thank you for considering me. Goodbye. He rose to his feet, severely put out, and made his goodbyes brusquely. He collected his hat, gloves, and coat from the dragon at the door, flung on his coat, jammed his hat on his head, and strode off down the street. Damn it. Where was he going to find another female so suitable? He thrust his hands into his leather gloves. How could she? How could anyone turn down the opportunity for a glamorous year or two in favor of, what did she call it? A position for life. Galbraith's words from the previous night echoed in his head. A tenant for life. He stopped, stock still in the street, staring at nothing. People stepped around him, giving him curious looks and muttering about the inconsideration of some people. He ignored them. His mind had seized on an idea. He turned and marched back toward Miss Mallard's seminary for the daughters of gentlemen. M made no move to leave the room. She had twenty minutes before her next lesson. He had closed the door behind him when he left, and she knew the moment she opened it and stepped outside, Teal would be waiting, wanting to know why Lord Ashenden had come to speak to her instead of Miss Mallard again. Teal was as inquisitive as she was mean-spirited. M wanted a few minutes to herself to consider what had just happened in peace. Solitude was a rare and precious thing at Miss Mallard's, as was privacy. So you're choosing to hide away here in a drab little girl's school instead of taking a risk. His careless accusation had shocked her. From a stranger who didn't know her at all, it had cut very close to the bone. Was she hiding? She had been hiding when she first came here, hiding from the world, the gossip and horrid speculation, but mostly from the pain of Papa's betrayal, his lack of faith in her, his belief in the words of others, false words, false accusations. His demand that because of malicious gossip she marry a man she did not love, his ultimatum, his last living words to her as it turned out. She had refused, fled like a wounded creature and, somehow, ended up at the school. She hadn't known where else to go. There were no relatives to turn to. Her friends in the district had either shunned her or been horridly awkward and distressed, not knowing what to believe. Such was the gossip her presence would taint them. One mistake, one heartfelt foolish girlish mistake that had come back to haunt her. Because at one time, years before, she had been foolish had acted recklessly and rashly placed her trust in a man. And after that, after the heartbreak, she had been grateful for the forgiveness of her father, a forgiveness that didn't even last five years. She hadn't ever travelled much outside the local area, except to go away to school, so in her blind distress she had fled to the only other place she knew, her old school. Miss Mallard had taken her in, heard her story tut-tutted a bit, and given M a job and a place to live.
Was she still hiding? No, Lord Ashenden was wrong. It was loyalty that kept M here, not cowardice. She owed Miss Mallard a debt of gratitude. She picked at a hole in her crocheted glove. She'd been here seven years. That was a lot of gratitude. Did she owe Miss Mallard a lifetime? A week ago, when the future of the school and her position was in doubt, she had felt quite desperately insecure, wondering what on earth she would do if the school closed. Now she had the promise of the headmistress-ship, and M's future and that of the school was assured, and the plans she had for it would make it the best young ladies' seminary in Bath. And yet his accusation that she was hiding away from the world had rattled her, because there was an element of truth in it, perhaps more than just an element. Or was it Lord Ashenden himself who rattled her? She appeared to be foolishly susceptible to his good looks, and the gentlemanly way he had escorted her home the other night, and that far from gentlemanly kiss. She had thought of it, and him, more than once. Oh, who was she fooling? She thought of him every night, alone in her small attic bedroom. As pathetic spinsters were rumoured to do, spinning unlikely fantasies about men they hardly knew. The moment Teal had told her he was waiting downstairs and had requested private conversation with her, M had felt the most ridiculous fluttering. She'd even removed her spinster's cap just to tidy her hair, she'd told herself but she hadn't put the cap back on. Teal had noticed and given her a scornful sniff and a knowing look. He had smiled when she arrived, and it had taken M a few seconds to gather her wits. He was tall and broad-shouldered, and so assured that somehow he seemed to fill the room. She had found a hole in her gloves and occupied herself in keeping it hidden, She really ought to make herself another pair. He had outlined his plan, and M had forced herself to look past the handsome face, those intriguing grey eyes and the knowing clever mouth, and concentrate on his words. His very damning words. Like many of the parents of the girls here, he was careless of the real needs of his half-sisters and niece, more interested in his own convenience than anything else. The other day she had thought, or imagined, that he seemed sincerely worried about them. Today she had seen him in his true colours. A bonus for firing them off, like cannons, pushed into marriage whether they were ready or not, and would he care whom they married? Would he even give them a choice? No, just a bonus to whoever got them off his hands within the year. But no girl should be pushed into marriage, and M would never be a party to such a scheme no matter how large or tempting the bribe. For call it what you like, that bonus was nothing more than a bribe. He might be selfish, superficial and self-centred, but he wasn't stupid. That accusation he had made about her hiding away was quite perceptive. Now with time to reflect, a little more calmly, and without his presence to distract and... and beflutter her, she could admit that there was some truth, a very small amount, in what he'd said. Nevertheless, she didn't regret her decision at all. Not one little bit. She would make a good and useful life for herself here in the school. It might not be glamorous or exciting, but it would be a worthwhile life. And if that thought didn't precisely cheer her up, well, she hadn't slept well last night, that was all. A good and useful life would be quite sufficient and very safe. The sound of voices in the hall caught her attention. It sounded like an argument, teal and a man. 
Before she could go to see what the problem was, the door flew open and Lord Ashenden stood there again, taking up all the space and the air. See, she is still here, he said. He turned to M. Tell this dra- female that you are willing to speak to me. She seems to imagine I'm going to attack you or something. He just pushed his way in, Teal began. It's quite all right, Miss Teal. I will speak to Lord Ashenden. M told her. She shut the door and waved him to a seat. Did you forget something? I have a class in five minutes. I won't take long. She waited. He was still carrying his hat. He fiddled with it a moment, smoothing the brim between his gloved thumb and fingers. He set the hat down on the small table at his elbow and crossed his legs. He cleared his throat. She waited. He uncrossed his legs and tugged off his fine leather gloves, setting them down beside his hat. My class starts in three minutes, Lord Ashenden, she prompted. Is there something else you wanted to say to me? Yes, damn it, I'm getting to it, he snapped. He swallowed, then fixed her with those hard grey eyes, like a butterfly on a pin. You want a position for life. Very well, I'll marry you. There was a short, stunned silence while M tried to gather her wits. Then, what did you say? You heard me. He seemed to realize his rudeness and said in a hard voice, I just ask you to marry me. Oh, it was a question, was it? She said dryly. She was pleased to hear her words come out quite calmly. It wasn't at all how she felt. Her insides were madly churning. He was talking marriage to a woman he barely knew, whom he'd met four times and kissed once. His jaw tightened. He straightened his shoulders as if about to face a firing squad. Would you do me the honor of marrying me, Miss Westwood? M swallowed. They were words she had never dreamed of hearing again, although the delivery left something to be desired. But the question itself made as much sense as some of her wilder fantasies. She forced herself to ask in a steady a voice as she could manage. Why? Why would you want to marry me? He frowned, as if the answer was obvious. You said security for a lifetime was what mattered most to you. Marriage will give you that and as my wife, you will be in a much better position to introduce the girls to the ton. You'll have the authority and influence a mere chaperone or governess would not. M couldn't believe her ears. He was still conducting the job interview. Only this time, the offer on the table was marriage. Like the job description he'd made earlier, she was to supervise and arrange the launch in society of his half-sisters and niece, accompany them, be responsible for them, and so on. But instead of a wage and bonuses, she would receive a generous annual allowance for as long as she lived, the use of any and all of his properties as she wished, a carriage and team, to sum up, she would perform all the usual duties of a wife. As M listened, doubts trickled coldly down her spine, dousing the flush of unwary warmth that had flowed through her. It was too good to be true. It was, it must be a joke at her expense. Rich, handsome, and wildly eligible earls did not make offers of marriage to women they barely knew especially not to women of no particular beauty, no fortune, and no standing in the world, who'd been on the shelf for years. If he truly wanted a wife to launch his sisters, he had only to lift his finger, and dozens of the pretty well-connected young ladies currently on the London marriage mart would flock to accept his hand. He'd find almost as many in Bath, She'd heard about the stir his appearance in the pump room had caused. 
No, he was angry with her for refusing his generous job offer, and now he was making this proposal as some kind of twisted revenge. He and his friends would probably laugh about it later in their horrid clubs, about the foolish, susceptible spinster. Ridiculous how it hurt, nevertheless. You cannot be serious, she said crisply, rising from her seat. I must go. I have a class to teach. He stood frowning. You don't believe me? He said it as if he couldn't quite believe it. She searched his face. He looked almost convincing, but she didn't, couldn't believe him. Mustering all the dignity she could, she said quietly, Goodbye, Lord Ashenden, and held out her hand. He took it in both hands. I make the offer in all sincerity. But I understand you might need some time to consider it. She said nothing. She couldn't. His hands were warm, cupping hers, so much smaller and icy cold by contrast. He scanned her face and gave a brisk nod. Think it over. I'll call on you tomorrow at nine to hear your response. Good day, Miss Westwood. I'll show myself out. He picked up his hat and gloves, bowed to her, and left. M stared at the closing door, distantly registering the click as it shut. And then her legs started trembling. She collapsed bonelessly onto her chair, her mind a whirl with possibilities and counter-possibilities. Marriage? To Lord Ashenden? A moment later, the door opened again. She tensed, but it was only Teal. You're going to be late for your lesson. Teal loved to catch people in the wrong. I know, I'm coming, M managed, and rose shakily to her feet. Teal's eyes gleamed with suspicion. You look rattled. What did he want? M shook her head. Nothing, nothing at all. M began her lesson in somewhat of a daze. Lord Ashenden's proposal kept buzzing around her brain like a swarm of contradictory bees, flinging out questions, impossible to answer questions. He had claimed the offer was sincere. It sounded as if he meant it. But he couldn't possibly be serious. Who would choose an obscure country teacher to launch his high-spirited, high-bred sisters into society? The cream of society at that. And why M, of all people, a woman he'd met on a bare handful of occasions? Because she was here, under his nose? Because she'd given him no encouragement? Because he didn't like to be crossed? Because he had to win? She had no answers. Luckily, a class of lively girls soon pulled her back to reality. She didn't stop for a minute all day, which helped put things at a distance. Finally, well after dinner, when the girls were all in bed, M finally got the chance to slip up to her room and think. She sat on her bed, pulling the thin, worn counterpane around her for warmth. Whether it made sense to her or not, he had asked her to marry him. The more she thought about it, the less he seemed like the kind of man who would joke about such a thing, marriage. She walked to her window and stared blindly out into the dark night. All the usual duties of a wife. She pressed cold, shaking hands to her cheeks. He was Lord Ashenden. Of course he would want an heir. She hardly knew him. She would be placing her life and body in the hands of a man she had met four times and didn't much like, but whose face and body haunted her dreams. His plan hadn't changed, just the payment. He would probably want to marry M in quick order, place the girls in her hands and return to whatever drew him on the continent. Presumably, he planned to impregnate her before he left. She wasn't even going to think about that. Oh, who was she fooling? She could think of very little else. But he didn't want M herself. How could he? 
he didn't even know her, had shown no interest in who she was, where she'd come from or how she'd come to be working in the school she had once attended as a pupil. He didn't care who she was. He just wanted someone on whom he could dump his problems and then leave. Someone who wouldn't have any choice in the matter. A wife. Oh, Lord. But, oh, she would have security for life and, God willing, a baby of her very own. Rose and Lily would be her sisters-in-law, and Georgiana, the girl she hadn't yet met, her niece by marriage. They'd have a London season together, a first for all four of them. She could ensure that the girls weren't forced into marriage. She'd let them choose for themselves, and M would make sure the men they picked were worthy of her girls. Her girls. Sisters, a niece, and a child of her own. After all this time, a family. She undressed swiftly and slipped into bed. The hot brick was waiting for her, thawing her frozen toes. Thank you, Millie. She lay in bed shivering with a combination of cold excitement and apprehension, and prayed that he meant it. Chapter 11 I chose my wife as she did her wedding gown, not for a fine glossy surface, but such qualities as would wear well. Oliver Goldsmith, the Vicar of Wakefield I've come for my answer. Lord Ashenden stood in front of the fireplace, booted feet apart, hands linked behind his back, dominating the room. Will you marry me? M's throat was dry. Yes, Lord Ashenden, I will marry you. Excellent. I've instructed my lawyer to draw up the marriage settlements. I will want the business conducted as soon as possible. M stood there, shaking. She had just agreed to marry Lord Ashenden. With one short sentence, she had changed her life wholly and dramatically. She felt hollow inside, strangely bereft. He kept talking, listing the things needing to be done. She wasn't quite sure what she had expected his response to her acceptance of his proposal to be, but it wasn't this, as if he'd ticked off an item on a list and was moving on to the next. He appeared quite unmoved, as if her agreement were a foregone conclusion which she supposed it was, and didn't that make her feel beggar-maid to King Copetua. Tall, ridiculously handsome, the very figure of a romantic hero, he delivered his plans for their marriage as if he were briefing a troop of soldiers. You are welcome, of course, to have a member of your family examine the settlements, document and negotiate any alterations before it is finalised. I have no family. M said. She wanted to hit him. An agreement to marry should not be taken so, so practically. Surely at least there should be a kiss. Which was ridiculous, she berated herself silently. Did she imagine Lord Ashenden had fallen in love with her after four brief meetings? Oh, he considered that a moment, then continued. I will go up to London tomorrow and obtain a special license. We shall be married in a week's time. A week's time? It came out almost as a squeak. Yes. He looked at her 
as if she'd made some irrelevant interruption. I cannot possibly marry you in a week, he frowned. Why not? Because it was too much of a rush, because she wasn't ready to be married to a virtual stranger at the end of a week, because her head was still in a whirl of tangled thoughts and emotions, because, because, because. She was feeling more than a little agitated, so she walked to the window and looked out for a moment. The view was nothing like the one from her little attic room, but somehow it calmed her. I will need a new dress. He looked at the dress she was wearing, grimaced slightly and nodded. Very well, buy one, buy a dozen, buy whatever you need. Have the bills sent to me at my aunt's address. It won't take a week, will it? Probably not, she conceded. If she was going to be his wife, Lady Ashenden, a countess, She'd need more than a one new dress, but she supposed she and the girls would have to buy all they needed in London. Bath had some good dressmakers, but they wouldn't match up to the finest London could offer. And he would expect the finest. But I must also give Miss Mallard more notice than a week. She will have to find a replacement for me. I will deal with Miss Mallard. That you will not, she said immediately and when he gave her that look she was starting to become accustomed to, the one that suggested she was stepping out of line, she added, Miss Mallard is entirely my business. You have no idea what I owe her, and I will not have you ordering her around and riding roughshod over her sensibilities. Ordering her around, he echoed. I do not order ladies around. He seemed so genuinely insulted that she had to stifle a laugh. No, of course you don't, she agreed. He had no idea of how he appeared to others. Nevertheless, I will be the one who speaks to Miss Mallard. He clearly didn't like it, but after a moment he gave a brusque nod. Very well, but whatever she says, the wedding will take place at the end of the week. And if she cuts up stiff about your leaving, you may refer her to me. It sounded like a threat. Why, what would you do? Make financial compensation for the loss of your services, of course. The grey eyes narrowed. What did you think I'd do? She shook her head. It doesn't matter. It wasn't so much how she feared he might treat Miss Mallard. It was that she didn't want him completely taking over her life. He was like the tide, sweeping everything and everyone before him. She needed to be a rock and hang on to the small piece of independence she had left. She glanced out of the window again and took several deep, calming breaths. Why must the wedding take place so quickly? You realize it will cause a great deal of talk. What does that matter? It's nobody else's business, he said impatiently. As to why it must be soon, I believe I informed you that I have urgent business to attend to. She sighed. Yes, your important government business. Precisely. So the sooner everything is arranged, the sooner I can leave. Now have we covered everything? Make whatever arrangements you want for the wedding. Order whatever you want and have the bills sent to me. I've booked the Abbey for next. You booked the Abbey? Already? You must have been very sure of my answer. And Bath Abbey instead of St. Swithin's, where the Mallard community normally attended. It would be very grand she supposed an earl would expect to be married in the grandest place possible. He looked a little self-conscious, but said gruffly, I like to be organized. And if I'd refused you? His brows rose at that, but he merely shrugged. I would have cancelled the booking. Or would he have gone off to find another hasty, convenient bride? No doubt Bath was full of them he'd only have to step into the pump room and lift his finger. 
but there was no point in pursuing that line of thought. She had agreed to marry this man, and in so many respects it was everything she had dreamed of as a girl. Almost. If only the man himself were a little more. Oh, he was as handsome a man as ever she had dreamed of. Handsome and strong and powerful. But he was so businesslike. There wasn't a romantic bone in the man's body. Though why she should dream of romance when she was six and twenty and should be beyond all that. They were schoolgirls' dreams, or spinsters, romantic and unrealistic, pure fantasy. He had made it plain, more than plain, that this was a purely practical marriage, a job no more, no less and she had accepted the job. She would no longer be a poor, unregarded schoolteacher wholly dependent on the goodwill of her employer. She was going to be a titled lady, a countess, with a home of her own and a family to care for. And since her husband would be somewhere on the continent, M would be her own mistress. It was foolish to long for romance, pointless to dream of love. Security and independence were far more important. She glanced up at him and caught him staring at her mouth, a dark, intense stare that was almost like a touch. Warmth flooded her. Nervously, she moistened her lips. He looked up and met her gaze. His eyes were hard and grey and unreadable. All the usual duties of a wife. She shivered. In barely a week, she would be married to this man. Her body would be his to do with as he pleased. Without a word, he held out his hand to her. Nervously, she offered hers. As he had the previous day, he enclosed her gloved hand in both of his, his grip sure and warm and firm. It will be all right, I promise. M had no idea why that reassurance should rattle her more than anything. But it did. You are what? Miss Mallard stared at M from over her pince-nez. She fumbled in her desk drawer, pulled out a vial of smelling salts and set it in front of her in an ominous warning. Is this some frightful jest, Emmeline? Married, you at your age? I'm afraid it's true, ma'am. Miss Mallard picked up the smelling salts and took a deep sniff. Her head jerked. She gasped, then blew violently into a lace-edged handkerchief. M, well-versed in this ritual, passed her a glass of water. The headmistress drank, then glared at her through streaming eyes. How could you, Emmeline? After all I've done for you— you were to become headmistress after me. Her head sank into her hands and she moaned brokenly. How sharper than a serpent's tooth. Oh, asp that pierces the bosom that has nurtured you all these years. I'm sorry, ma'am, M murmured. Miss Mallard always did get her quotations mixed. Miss Mallard took a deep breath, picked up her pince-nez, jammed them back on her nose and fixed M with a piercing glare. And who, might I ask, is the blackguard who thinks to steal you away from me? Don't tell me it's that dreadful old widower from church, the one who sent you flowers that time. I forget his name. Mr. Bell, you mean? No, it's not. No, no, the other one. Short, fat, and entirely bald. He has no fortune, you know, and a wandering eye. No, it's not Mr. Atkins either. Miss Mallard would hate the truth even more, M thought. Then who is it? M took a deep breath. Lord Ashenden. There was a sudden, shocked silence, broken only by the sound of a pair of silver-rimmed pince-nez hitting the desk. Miss Mallard's eyes almost popped from their sockets. She lifted the smelling salts, looked at them vaguely as if unsure what they were, and put them down again. 
Lord Ashenden? She repeated in a failing voice. Yes, ma'am. There was a long silence. Lord Ashenden, brother to the Rutherford girls? Yes, ma'am. The man who was here the other day, I spoke to him tall, handsome, rich, that Lord Ashenden? He's asked you to marry him? M nodded. Yes, ma'am. And he wants the wedding to be next Tuesday. I'm afraid it's very short notice, but Lord Ashenden is adamant. There was another long silence. Then, for next Tuesday, she gave M a sharp look. You're not in the family wi- No, of course not. There hasn't been time. I take it you knew him from before. No, ma'am. I never set eyes on him before last week. Miss Mallard blinked. Good heavens! She considered it for a moment, then said in a bracing voice, Well, whatever his lordship's reasons for such a rush, he shall not find us wanting. Short notice indeed, but we shall prevail. I am determined. We'll fire you off in style, my dear. I'll speak to the vicar about the ceremony. It's not to be at St. Swithin's. His lordship has booked the abbey. The abbey? Miss Mallard's eyes gleamed. Oh, excellent. She pulled out a pad of paper and started to make a list. New dresses for both of us, of course. Cancel your classes for today, for the rest of the week, in fact. Thwaites, Johnston, and Clegg can fill in for you. You and I will go at once to Madden Floria's and order new dresses for the occasion. You cannot possibly marry Lord Ashenden in that old rag. M blinked. She hadn't thought it was quite that shabby. Miss Mallard scribbled on her notepad, muttering furiously. Invitations must be sent out, heavens, Tuesday next. We shall never get everything done. And flowers, at this time of year, they will have to be heavy on the greenery. She made another note. The menu for the wedding breakfast, something elegant and delicious. Is it the right season for quails? I must consult Cook. Bemused, M said, Mom, are you perhaps thinking of organizing the wedding? Because there's really no need. Miss Mallard glanced up. No need? What a foolish question, child. Of course there is. But it's to be a small, quiet wedding only. Nonsense. You don't think I'm going to let an opportunity like this pass, do you? Not only do the pupils of the Mallard Seminary marry well, we have three duchesses, two marchionesses, five countesses, six viscountesses, and the rest. She dismissed the lower titles with a wave. Even our teachers can marry earls. The days that followed disappeared in a whirl of activity. First came the visit to Madame Floria, the dressmaker, who, once she heard whom M was to marry, and at the Abbey, where, no doubt, the bishop would wed them, gladly and ruthlessly set aside her current orders and vowed she would have a most beautiful dress ready in time. M then proceeded to disgust both Miss Mallard and Madame Floria by preferring a simple dress in sage green wool to their choice of silver tissue and lace. I don't want anything fussy. It's to be a quiet, practical wedding, she told them. Besides, I would rather be warm. Nonsense, Emmeline. You're to be a countess. His lordship might be impetuous in his haste to marry you, but you have a position to think of. You would not wish his lordship to be embarrassed by a drab bride now, would you? Of course not, so begin as you mean to go on. Miss Mallard was determined M would make a splash, the dressmaker too. In the end, they settled on a dress of cream silk, trimmed with lace and pearls, simply cut with puffed sleeves and topped, in a sop to what Miss Mallard called M's ridiculous insistence on warmth. Brides, who were to become countesses, apparently didn't need to be warm, 
with a long-sleeved spencer in cream silk velvet, delicately ruched with a high collar and a button down the front with pearl buttons. And when Madame Floria produced a lovely cream shawl of silk and cashmere, it was pronounced to be perfect. It was the most expensive clothing M had ever owned, and the most beautiful, and since all her other clothes were extremely plain, not to mention rather worn in places, M decided to take Lord Ashenden at his word and ordered a dress in the sage green wool as well, and a warm pelisse in claret velvet. She had no idea where they were going after the wedding, to London or to his family seat, wherever that was, or somewhere else. But green wool was far more practical for travelling than cream velvet. And there was some wisdom in beginning as she meant to go on. She might feel like the beggar maid to his king, Copetua, but she'd be damned if she would dress like it. On that thought, she ordered another two dresses and a pelisse in dark green with silver braiding, a la Hazar. To the order she added chemises, petticoats, and various other undergarments, as well as stockings and four nightgowns, two in cotton lawn and two in thick flannel. Her own nightgowns were well worn, mended and patched in places, and not something she wished anyone to see, not even a maid, let alone her husband. These she insisted on paying for herself. It was bad enough expecting Lord Ashenden to pay for her wedding dress, but just the thought of him perusing a bill for her undergarments caused her cheeks to heat. Then there were shoes to purchase, and here M fell for a pair of cream kid slippers, not in the slightest bit practical, but so sweet and pretty, and a dashing pair of red leather ankle boots. After years of hoarding every penny, it was frighteningly easy to fall into a frenzy of shopping, but M did her best to control herself. When you were marrying a man for reasons unrelated to love, you didn't want to begin the marriage by going on a spending spree with his money. The days flew past. There were invitations to write, fittings at Madame Floria's, consultations with Cook and local suppliers over the wedding breakfast menu, and most nerve-wracking of all, a visit to Lady Dorothea and the girls, who would become her sisters-in-law and niece by marriage. She assumed Lord Ashenden would be there to introduce her as his affianced bride, but he hadn't yet returned from London. M had had some idea that they might resent her marrying him. She knew perfectly well the world would judge it a most unequal match, and while she'd always gotten on well with Lady Dorothea and the girls, having a pleasant acquaintanceship with the schoolteacher was one thing, welcoming that same schoolteacher into your family was quite another. And having a nobody suddenly outranking you, well, she couldn't blame them for resenting her. But as it happened, the Rutherford ladies welcomed M warmly, only the girl called George hanging back, which was not surprising, since they'd never met. It didn't take long for M to realize that a good part of Rose and Lily's delight was rooted in their determination to be bridesmaids, and she immediately invited all three girls to attend her at her wedding. Rose and Lily accepted with joy. George demurred, but her youthful aunts insisted that she would soon get used to dresses, and of course she would be a bridesmaid. M blinked at the references to not being used to dresses, but supposed it would become clearer as she became better acquainted with the girl. The girls immediately fell to discussing what they would wear and in what colours. Apparently their late brother had forbidden the wearing of mourning black the best thing he had ever done for them, according to Lily. The only thing he had ever done for them, Rose said. Lady Dorothea smiled benignly on the girls and helped M compose a list of people on the groom's side who needed to be invited. There weren't many relatives, she assured M, and the short notice as well as the distance would ensure that few guests would attend. 
But don't worry, Ashenden will give a ball to introduce you to everyone when you go to London, she assured M. M had her doubts. It seemed Lord Ashenden hadn't informed his aunt of his plans to marry M and head off to the continent post-haste, but if he hadn't told Lady Dorothea, she wasn't going to do it for him. Back at Miss Mallard's, the news had spread through the school like wildfire, and the girls' excitement became almost a frenzy when Miss Mallard announced that the entire school would attend the wedding. Everywhere M went, she saw clusters of girls whispering and giggling with, as often as not, Lavinia Fortescue Brown at the centre of each group. On further inquiry, she learned that Lavinia was claiming she had introduced the happy couple. Heaven knew what other tales she was telling. The girl had a very fertile imagination. But when she summoned Lavinia and demanded to know what she had been telling the others, Lavinia's answer floored her. Your advice about not encouraging men that they want what they can't have and being cool to them will only make them more eager. Well, I didn't really believe you at the time, but it was so right, wasn't it, Miss Westwood? And you're the proof. M blinked. I am? Lavinia nodded vigorously. You were so cold that day toward Lord Ashenden, almost rude, really, and now you're going to marry him. When Cal told Galbraith, his friend let out a harsh crack of laughter. Both of us donning the shackles of respectability. How the mighty have fallen. And of course, I'll be your best man. Cal had returned to Bath the previous day. It was a little late to be asking someone to play best man, but he knew Galbraith would be here and available. So it's all going ahead. Galbraith nodded. Grandfather is in high gig. He and the girl's father have been wrangling happily over the settlements all week. Soon as they're settled, the deed will be done. And at Bath Abbey, no less, he grimaced. You inspired that idea, you swine. I was hoping for something small and private, but no. They're thrilled at the idea of a wedding conducted by a bishop. Sorry, the bishop was a friend of my aunt's. As Aunt Agatha had pointed out in a scathing response to his letter informing her of his intended marriage, if you must marry a nobody in a hasty skimble-scamble wedding, doing the deed in the abbey might, and I say only might, limit the gossip. Can't you tell them you'd prefer a small, quiet wedding? Galbraith shrugged. In truth, I don't much care. Weddings are women's business. True enough, Cal thought. Between them, Miss Westwood, Aunt Dotty, Miss Mallard, and the girls had managed the whole thing. Cal was very grateful to be spared the bother. All he had to do was turn up. The morning of M's wedding day dawned clear with the promise of sunshine. All morning, all week really, the school had been a hive of excitement, with the entire school preparing to attend. The girls, all dressed in their best white dresses, had just left walking down the hill to the abbey in an orderly but excited crocodile, escorted by Miss Johnston, Miss Thwaites, Miss Clegg, and Miss Teal. Miss Mallard was having a last-minute consultation with Cook and the servants, putting the finishing touches to the wedding breakfast. M waited in the hall. She had assumed that she would walk to the abbey with the rest of the school, but Lord Ashenden had sent a note the previous day to say his carriage would collect her. The ceremony was set for eleven. It was quarter to eleven, so any minute now. M paced back and forth. She would rather have walked with the girls. At least it was something to do. Her footsteps echoed. The school had never been so quiet. For the hundredth time, she glanced at her reflection in the looking glass. She didn't look like herself at all. She looked younger, prettier. Her skin framed in cream silk velvet seemed to glow, and her hair... 
Who'd have thought hair could make such a difference? Earlier in the week, Miss Mallard had arranged for the most fashionable hairstylist in Bath to attend M. All things were possible for a future countess, it seemed. Monsieur Philippe was an elegantly dressed flamboyant Frenchman, whose accent came and went, revealing a hint of Liverpool between their Gallic exclamations. He had spent some time draping M's hair in various ways, examining her from all angles, all the time muttering to himself. Then he had seized his scissors and shocked M by snipping off several locks at the front. He exclaimed when she objected. You have all this beautiful air, and you scrape all of it back in one ugly knot. It does nothing for you. And he snipped on regardless. Only when he had finished did he allow M to look in the mirror. M had examined her reflection, turning her head this way and that. Her hair was naturally curly. Papa had called it perpetually untidy, and she'd always kept it long so she could keep it in a neat bun. Monsieur Philippe had left it long at the back, but all around her face tiny soft curls clustered. Papa would have hated it, but M was almost breathless. Who knew she could look so... She was almost pretty. Seeing her reaction, the hairdresser clucked with satisfaction. See, Monsieur Philippe always knows what will suit a lady better than the lady, n'est-ce pas? I soften the face and emphasize as a very fine cheekbones for you, mademoiselle, and with no need of the curling irons. Thank you, monsieur, M murmured. Now I suggest you have your maid gather it up, like so, perhaps with two little braids, like so, and then... I don't have a maid, M told him. I will be doing my hair myself. Monsieur Philippe staggered back in theatrical Gallic shock. Oh, no, no, no. It cannot be. I do not expend my artistry on a lady only to have her do it herself. But I'm perfectly capable. I've been doing my own hair all my life. He dismissed that argument with a tsst and a scornful wave. He sent for Miss Mallard, and after she had been directed to admire his genius, he declared, but the lady has no maid of her own, and it will not do. Good heavens, you are quite right, monsieur. I should have thought of it earlier. I will contact the employment agency at once. They will send up some ladies' maids for interview. That's not necessary, M said. But you must have your own personal maid, Miss Mallard insisted. You have a position to maintain, Monsieur Philippe nodded vigorously. If you enter Lord Ashenden's home without your own maid, Miss Mallard continued, all the servants will look down on you. M lifted her chin. I don't care. She wouldn't allow anyone to look down on her, servants or not. Perhaps not, but Lord Ashenden will. It was Miss Mallard's second favourite saying, a clincher to every argument. Lord Ashenden will expect. And the devil of it was, M had no basis to argue back. She barely knew Lord Ashenden, let alone what he expected or wanted. As far as she knew, no trouble, best summed up what she knew of his wants. Would arriving without a maid be classed as trouble or not? What did she know of what earls expected? Very well. If I must have a maid, I will take Millie with me. Miss Mallard snorted. Millie, my housemaid? Nonsense, that girl isn't trained to be a lady's maid. Very true, Monsieur Philippe nodded wisely. You must have a girl who knows how to care for the hair and clothes. Then she will learn. Will you be so kind as to show her how to do my hair, monsieur? M asked. Because I will take Millie or no one. 
Millie was kind and clever, and at Miss Mallard's she scrubbed and cleaned from dawn to midnight and still fought to put a hot brick, unasked, into M's bed. The counter-arguments flew around the room, but M stayed firm. It would be Millie or no one, as long as Millie agreed. M thought she'd jump at the chance. Millie, summoned, had arrived at the door pale and worried, looking and smoothing her dress with nervous hands. It took her a moment to comprehend what M was saying, and when she did, her whole face lit up. Oh, miss, you mean I'm to come with you and be your lady's maid? In London, truly? Smiling, M nodded. If you'd like to. Would I like to? I'll say I would. Millie glanced at Miss Mallard's pinched expression and added tactfully, Of course, I'll be sad to leave Miss Mallard's, but if you think I could be of help, Miss Westwood, I'd be glad to work for you. Her eyes were shining. Then that's settled, M said. She was spending more of Lord Ashenden's money. But if a maid was something he'd expect her to have, she had no option. Monsieur Philippe pursed his lips and then snapped his fingers. Come here then, girl, and let me see what you can do. Under his critical supervision, Millie arranged M's hair. Eventually he sniffed and said, It will do. Now remember what I said. Start simple and practice at every opportunity. I will, of course, style Miss Westwood's heir for the wedding, but after that you'll be on your own. There are schoolgirls here. Practice on them. He arched a brow at Miss Mallard, who gave a grudging nod. Come to my parlour and I will provide you with all the implements you will need for the lady's hair. I will also give you some cream for your hands. Your skin is rough, like a scrubbing girl's. A lady's maid must have hands like silk, understand me, girl? Yes, sir, Millie curtsied. Send the bill to Lord Ashenden, Miss Mallard said crisply, which was M. New, Miss Mallard's new favourite saying. And now the wedding day had arrived, cold but bright with sunshine. Millie, after helping M to dress, had gone ahead to the church with the girls. Miss Mallard had wanted her to help cook, but since she had already engaged extra staff for the event, M had insisted. Millie worked for her now, and she wanted her at the wedding. Oh, where was that carriage? The waiting was unbearable. She wanted this wedding over and done with. The ancient medieval abbey was chilly. The interior smelled of beeswax, incense, ancient stone and Christmas, Cal thought as he entered, though Christmas was long past. He soon saw the reason. Clusters of pine and other evergreens bound with long white ribbons were attached to the end of every pew with some kind of white and pink flower at the centre of each cluster. On closer examination, he saw that the flowers were made of wax and varied greatly in form and elegance. Odd, but he supposed flowers were hard to come by at this season. Though someone had managed. Huge sprays of larkspur and lilies and Queen Anne's lace-graced carved oak pedestals on either side of the nave. Cal ran a finger around his collar. It felt unaccountably tight. Ned Galbraith eyed him. Uniform don't fit any more. It fits. He might be on temporary leave, but he was still a soldier on His Majesty's service, and dress uniform was the appropriate garb for his wedding. Nerves, then? Not particularly. Cal lied. He was, in fact, ridiculously nervous. Galbraith, on the other hand, seemed unaccountably hearty. What's put the smile back on your face? He asked his friend. Dutch courage? Haven't touched a drop, no need, Galbraith said. The wedding's off. Off? Cal's blood froze for a minute. Oh, you mean your wedding? What happened? 
grandfather and the girl's father had a falling out. No, what am I saying? It was the falling out of the century. Couldn't agree over the settlements. Then they started to shred each other's characters, dredging up incidents from the dim dark ages. Did I mention they'd known each other practically their whole lives? So there was plenty to dredge. And then the girl clinched the matter by saying she thought I'd make a terrible husband, that I was a rake and a libertine, cold-hearted, irreligious, unprincipled, and irredeemable. Cal frowned. That's a bit strong. Lord, no, it's all perfectly true. I don't give a damn what she thinks of me. I was only doing it for the old man. And how has he taken it? Galbraith gave a wry grin. The canny old bastard's gone home in high dudgeon. No sign of him being at death's door anymore. In fact, he left here wonderfully refreshed. By the fight, in my opinion though he claims it's those disgusting bath waters. At any rate, whatever the cause, for the moment at least, I'm free as a bird. People started filing into the church. Here they come, it's starting. Last chance to cut and run, Rutherford. No chance of that. Cal straightened his shoulders. His stomach hollowed a little more. It was a straightforward practical arrangement, he reminded himself, a marriage of convenience. A susurration of excited murmurs drew his attention, and he turned to see an apparently endless line of young girls all dressed in white filing into the church. Under the supervision of a couple of elderly ladies, they seated themselves on the bride's side, whispering and giggling. One of the young girls caught Cal's eye and waved enthusiastically. Lavinia Thingamy what's it of the Shropshire thingamy Watsits. He lifted a hand in acknowledgement, which caused a surge in the giggles and excited exchanges, followed by a flurry of teacherly shushes. It looked as though the whole school had come to see Miss Westwood married. Good. He was glad she had someone. The organ started playing and his pulse leapt. Was the ceremony about to start? But it was only some... Bland peace, no doubt intended to reinforce an atmosphere of holy contemplation and drown the schoolgirls' steadily rising chatter and their teachers' hushing. The pews continued filling, and it was soon seen that the bride's side was very respectably occupied, while the groom's was lamentably sparse. It seemed Miss Westwood had a great many friends and acquaintances come to wish her well on her wedding day. On Cal's side, it seemed mostly made up of the curious, Aunt Dottie's friends and acquaintances, and those who'd tried to snare him for their granddaughters. He spotted the poodle and his grandmother, looking quite poodly. The organ stopped. Silence hung for a moment in the ancient abbey, then the music swelled. Purcell. Cal straightened. This was it, then he turned to face his convenient bride. And his mouth dried. She paused a moment at the head of the aisle, straight and slender and exquisite in cream silk and lace, dark hair clustering in tiny curls around her face, a lace veil pinned over her hair, spilling down over her shoulders, framing her alabaster countenance in mystery without quite covering it. You didn't tell me she was a beauty, Galbraith murmured in Cal's ear. Cal didn't reply, he didn't know, he hadn't realized. Her face was pale and set, as if prepared for an ordeal. She glanced at him and her gaze passed on, as if she were looking for someone else. Then she frowned slightly, her gaze returned to him and her eyes widened. For a long moment, she didn't move. They stood there, staring at each other while the music surged and swelled all around them and the congregation watched. He wondered for a second if she was about to turn and run, but then, with a little jerk, she moved forward and began to walk toward him.